conference. Uh, it's a two-day conference, and uh, I'm your host, Amos Golan. So if you have any questions, issues, problems, let me know. Uh, it is a true pleasure to uh, invite our university president, Professor Neil Kerwin, to welcome us all to this two days full of information. President Kerwin is a professor of public administration. He's an expert in public policy and the regulatory process. He founded the Center for the Study of Rulemaking and authored many books in these areas. He is also a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. Since becoming president in 2007, his vision and guidance helped transform this university on all fronts and put AU uh, on the map. President Kerwin supports the fundamental idea of what we're doing here of interdisciplinary research and collaboration among research from different departments and different universities. This explains his enthusiastic support toward our institute and our activities. On a more personal note, Neil, thank you. Uh, uh, I appreciate this and really uh, it helps us a lot. Please welcome Professor Kerwin. Thank you, Amos. Um, let me start by congratulating Amos on what is now the fifth anniversary of the Infometrics uh, Institute, and uh, thank colleagues from around the university and from around the United States and around the world that have contributed to the mission of the institute. Um, this, at least from where I sit, uh, is a very, very easy initiative to support. Uh, I. Uh, I don't have to remind the people in this room about the fundamental importance of the work you're doing to just about every element of the human condition. Uh, that sounds somewhat hyperbolic, I suppose, but in fact, it's true. Uh, I was sharing with our colleague from UC Riverside that uh, even places as medieval as universities are using information in ways uh, that were you know, unimaginable even five years ago. The um, the mission of the Institute is uh, nothing short of you know, the wise and efficient use of information. Uh, both elements have you know, tremendous uh, implications for the development of this society and societies around the world. Uh, it has uh, all the technical issues that you'll be reviewing over the next two days. Uh, it is uh, elementally interdisciplinary in its approach. Uh, not just from the colleagues here at American that have contributed to the work that Amos has led, uh, but the people that are participating in the conference over these next two days. Uh, it, uh, with the possible exception of the humanities, but I'm sure they're not very far behind, uh, just about every discipline that you would imagine touched by uh, the use uh, of information is represented on the program or in the audience. Uh, the, uh, the issues go beyond technical, of course. They go to appropriate use. Uh, ethical issues that are, are going to be represented also on this program, uh, thanks to the field of philosophy being represented. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, the work that's done here in the Institute, uh, I believe, is uh, a critical element in this university's and most universities' future. The, um, uh, the work of the conference itself uh, brings together over these next several days economics, macro and micro, econometrics, management science, finance, chemistry, physics, uh, the biological sciences will be contributing, and of course philosophy and the related social sciences. Uh, it's not a group really that needs to be reminded uh, of the uh, urgency of the work. Every day we see uh, examples, uh, even in the popular press, of extraordinarily beneficial uses of the disciplines uh, that are coming together around infometrics, uh, but regrettably also uh, occasional misuses uh, and concerns that we all carry around about the integrity of the person and personal privacy. Uh, infometrics Institute and gatherings of scholars like yourselves uh, are sure to advance the work, I think, and uh, add to everyone's understanding of of how this field can progress over, uh, over the coming years. Uh, I want to thank the conference's co-sponsors, uh, especially the Office of the Control of the Currency, 
National Science Foundation, of course, the Center for Science of Information at Purdue, uh, our own College of Arts and Sciences and its Department of Economics uh, that helped bring this session together. Uh, I'm very, very proud uh, to be hosting this conference. I'm very, very proud of the work that Amos and uh, all of his colleagues are engaged in. And I want to wish you the best for a productive two days. So, have you ever seen data confess? <clears throat> what if we waterboard the data or torture the data? Will it ever confess? Well, the answer is very simple. Of course, we all know that it doesn't. <clears throat> uh, and this, I think, distinguish what we do from what, say, uh, Sherlock Holmes and his colleagues at the different detective agencies are doing. Uh, so let me take a few minutes just to discuss the ideas of informatics, the way I think about it, and, and the basic objective of, of this conference, just very, very brief, without going into the uh, uh, details. So if I look around this room, I see people from all around uh, different disciplines and different sciences. And a common thing that I'm sure uh, 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 certain that each one is doing is each one of us basically try to understand the world around us in a better way by processing the information that she or he has. So the question is, what is this information? Uh, how can we process it in an efficient and decent way? And we need to fit to, of course, define the notion of efficiency. And how can we validate? Uh, the validation issue is hard, but usually we know how to do it. The processing issue is quite complicated, and it depends on the information. But I think the most, uh, uh, the toughest issue is how to identify the information. What is the information that we have? Once we know what is the information, and what parts of this information we can quantify, because we cannot quantify all the information, uh, then we can think about the next step, which is uh, processing. So the search for this uh, answer, or to, uh, the answers for this question, what is information, how to process it, how to validate it, is basically what informatics is all about, and what everyone in this room, but actually I think all scientists and all decision makers are doing constantly. Uh, so basically, we, we uh, uh, process information, and, and, and the question that we, we ask, uh, what is this information? There are different types of information. We often talk about data, but data is just part of it. The information includes our intuition, our knowledge, our assumptions, our primitive assumption, the concept, the, the models that we use based on, or theories. How do we validate them? Well, this is all. Uh, uh, part of information, the question how to combine all of those issues. And it's not a simple task, and it's not that we all know how to do it. Obviously, we don't, and it's hard. Some, some of this is impossible, but at least we want to be able to recognize it and, and to realize that there are different types of, of information. And of course, the information is noisy, it's incomplete, it's imperfect. But even if you think of supposedly perfect information when we read a text, well, the text can be read different for me and different for someone else. This is what they're doing in the Supreme Court. This is what uh, our own court of laws and, and many other people are doing. We give different interpretations to the same world. So even when the evidence is supposedly hard and seemingly noiseless, there is a lot of noise in the interpretation. And all of this is part of basic information. And of course, it brought, uh, another main issue is the meaning. All the, the, the uh, different entropies and different measures of information are measures of quantity. They are completely independent of the meaning, and we hear a lot of talks here uh, about it. And this is important, because when we deal with information, the question is not just the quantity uh, from computer science point of view, but also the meaning, because this is what we try to, to do. And then, of course, how to process it. Another issue is, what is the information that we observe? We, we observe information, but we try to explain something unobservable. How do we connect the real entity of interest, say our preference, to something that we observe, information that we observe, say the action that we take? If I want to analyze a game or strategy, all I observe is the outcome, the 
option that individuals or fields or whatever do. And I want to understand uh, uh, the, the uh, say the characterizes. If you deal with uh, ecological systems, if you deal with uh, biological systems, system biology problems in physics, uh, all what we observe is something supposedly observable, and then you try to understand the system. But those systems never confess, this is how we started it, they never confess. It's not that we can torture it and torture and finally they say, oh yes, 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 this is the right model. No, we have to validate it up to a certain probability. Uh, and then, of course, the reason we're all sitting here together and the reasons that I like the idea of, of, of this interdisciplinary science is that those similarities and those basic ideas go across all the different disciplines and all the different sciences. Uh, and we see a lot of similarities. Now, the similarities are often because the problems are similar. Uh, and often we use similar mathematics. So if you see often, we see often and we talk about analogy in different sciences or different models. What is it because there is really analogy between economics and thermodynamics or statistical physics or statistical mechanics? Or is it because often we use the same optimization, the same mathematics, and therefore we see seemingly uh, uh, things like analogies? And I know that would be uh, people that uh, can talk about those things better than I can. Uh, the evidence that we see is circumstantial. Because what is the the, uh, sorry, the, the uh, information we use, or the, the evidence that we often, often see, is circumstantial evidence. And from this, this is what I call the observable. We have to infer something supposedly to go backward. Uh, so, so those are just some of the issues and the idea of, of sitting here all together because we all can learn from one another about the different uh, problems in different sciences and how to apply, if somebody solved it in biology, I want to know in economics how to handle the same, uh, uh, at least the same uh, problem. Uh, so just take a few, few more uh, uh, minutes here. So the, the way uh, informatic is, is defined is uh, a science and practice of inference and quantitatively processing information. And the nice thing that actually it crosses all boundaries or, or, or the boundaries of all different uh, uh, sciences. I, I see it as an intersection of information theory, statistical method of inference, applied mathematics, statistics, econometrics, complexity, decision analysis, modeling, and, and the philosophy of, of science. Uh, we all have to deal with how to understand better something that we don't know from something that we observe, this, this information. Uh, and this study helped us actually to resolve a lot of challenges in, in how to develop theories, how to understand systems, how to solve problems, policy problems, and of course, uh, how to make better decisions. Uh, and in general, I would say that all problems we have to, regardless of the information that we had, even with the so-called big data, uh, we're dealing with basically underdetermined problems because unless we impose structure that we don't really know and we take into consideration, consideration the noise in the information that we have, all problems are basically underdetermined, so we have to have a certain function to choose one of the, uh, the uh, possible solutions. And uh, this is part of, of, of what we're doing here. Uh, and I, I would say that this actually goes, again, as we said before, across all, all uh, different disciplines. So the problem, uh, just to summarize the basic problem, that all inferential problems I, say, I think about is, are, are basically based on imperfect, or imperfect information, and, and usually extremely noisy, uh, incomplete, and of course finite. Regardless how big the data set is or the information that we supposedly have, it's going to be finite, and we need to do it in finite time. Uh, therefore, I think that the problems are usually, uh, in most cases, if not all, are underdetermined. There are more solutions uh, given the observable data than uh, one. And we have to choose one. And, and uh, using the, the idea of constraint optimization, where the, the constraints represent the information that we have, noisy or pure, however you wish, uh, and the objective function always will be some kind of informational criteria. 
be it uh, Shannon Boltzmann entropy or being uh, Tsaris entropy or the Renier entropy or what have you. But there will be, we have to choose some criterion um, for the crash rate. Uh, we have to use one criterion that allow us to pick one of those infinite and solutions. And, and now just a few words about the uh, uh, institute. Uh, it's inherently interdisciplinary. Uh, activities uh, uh, include conferences, workshops, tutorials, seminars, graduate mentoring fellowships, visiting fellowships, and so on. Uh, and the composition, basically, it's very, uh, 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 it's basically our affiliates, uh, and of course, participants in, in our activities. Uh, I want to remember our two, uh, just uh, in, in briefly, our two, uh, uh, members that are affiliates that uh, passed away in the last four years, Arnold. Uh, we had a conference in Arnold and Hal White, which we established the uh, Informatic Prize uh, in his memory. And finally, to the objective of the conference, basically to continue the exploration of uh, information processing and the meaning of information across uh, all sciences. Uh, this is our 50th year anniversary, so we celebrate it by basically looking at all different topics and <coughs> sub-disciplines within informatics. So far, we usually had our conferences, or most of our conferences were a one-day conference, uh, except here and there when we had two days, that each one deal with a specific topic, say, uh, uh, information theoretic method of estimation, uh, networks, <coughs> natural sciences, sometimes social sciences, uh, and a philosophy, value of, of information, value of information, and so on. This time we decided to bring everything together and to have many more sessions, more individuals, and of course, uh, shorter talks. Uh, so this is basically our, our uh, objective and what we want to try and establish in those two days. Uh, I want to thank our sponsor, the main spo sponsor, our main external sponsor that covers actually most of our uh, activities is the Office of the Controller of the Currency. And of course, we thank them. And uh, uh, some other sponsors that also the president mentioned before. And now to Amos. First of all, I would like to welcome all of you for this conference. Uh, and uh, uh, Amos has already talked about uh, everything about the, the information, so I don't have to add anything on this. But I would like to uh, thank uh, Amos. Without him, you know, this conference would have been uh, feasible, and all the credit goes to uh, him. He worked very hard and uh, really, you know, powerfully uh, supported him. Uh, so everything goes. Uh, not only this uh, conference here is organized uh, extremely well, but uh, because it is the fifth uh, anniversary of uh, all the conferences which he has done in the last five years. So I will basically uh, talk a little bit about uh, all the contributions uh, uh, MOS has done in establishing uh, this institute, Informatics Institute, but all the uh, conferences in the last uh, uh, five years uh, he had organized very uh, successfully. Uh, so if you look at uh, the number of uh, uh, conferences, so of course each uh, year he has two conferences, fall and spring, except in 2009 when it was only in fall. So the total number of uh, conferences he has organized is uh, uh, 11. And uh, of course, at three of the conferences are two days, but the rest of them are uh, one day. Then particularly this one is going to be, you know, the very dense conference because it's the fifth year anniversary celebration. And uh, if you look at this uh, major focus of the conference has been information, 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 information. So you can see information theory estimation, you know, is, is used in, in, in data analysis, uh, information theory and application in the social sciences, 
information theory applied to the econometrics and economics and finance, in networks, engineering, and uh, other natural, uh, natural sciences, particularly physics, uh, computer science, and uh, uh, chemistry, and, and biological sciences, ecology, uh, in different areas, so like information theory, estimation with non-parametrics. Uh, so it, essentially the aim is uh, to have the uh, information you know, applied to different areas and different disciplines, uh, how it has evolved and how it is linked, and that, that has been the thrust of the most of these uh, uh, conferences. And when you look at, in all these uh, conferences, you know, there are different uh, sessions, and I was trying to look at the data, how these are distributed. So, informatics uh, uh, sessions, the, the kind of sessions we have with economics and finance, and I say 27% of the, all the sessions we had in all the five conferences, econometric, 33%, physics, philosophy of science, medicine, and biology, science and engineering, networks, value of information, uh, social model, ecology, complexity. So, and when I looked at all these uh, uh, sessions, 60 percent of the uh, sessions were more focused on econometrics and economics and finance, and 40 percent were distributed in the, uh, in the other uh, sessions. And this is all on the basis of data I've Extracted from the web, the informatics uh, uh, web. So, if there's any problem with the data, they're totally buried over here. But I assume that that is the correct uh, data. Uh, so, that's the. Uh, and you can see his contributions. Uh, so, he has been the chair and co chair, even if he's not the chair, for example, for this one, he's still basically the effective chair. Uh, of this uh, conference, uh, and you can see from 2009, that's why it's in italics compared to the other people, 2009 to 2013, and I will add the 2014 too, uh, consistently uh, contributing to, to do this uh, conference <coughs> and to develop all the science of the information and apply to different disciplines. And, and the other person I noted who has been a great contributor of, uh, uh, of these conferences is Robin. Where is Robin? Robin is sitting over there. Right. Uh, she has been the moderator of almost each and every conferences, you know, the panel discussion, which has been the, the really the core of all these conferences. Uh, and you will see, see her again maybe on, on Saturday or Sunday? Yeah. Yeah, Saturday. Right. So, so that's... Uh, and apart from the, you know, the other people who have contributed in this uh, conferences. And then, uh, uh, I want to show you this, uh, one, one more thing, it's not there. Information related paper. Then also looking at, you know, uh, the kinds of uh, papers which have been uh, presented in this, uh, all these uh, five years conferences, and I noticed that uh, about 85% of the conference uh, paper, paper were related to uh, information in some sense, a little or, or more, but then uh, only 15% of the papers were either have very little or no connections with the information, but in general, of course, everything has information, <laughs> but uh, in the strict uh, sense of the entropy and information theory, uh, the use of that was the 15% uh, of the paper. Particularly, there is one uh, conference which had on shrinkage estimation. I noticed the, the really minimum number of papers which had the uh, relation with the uh, information. Okay, this is just, uh, this is the first uh, uh, conference which uh, took place in uh, 2009. Uh, and and uh, the focus there was, you know, this information theoretic uh, uh, 
application or use in estimation and data analysis. And it has only basically, uh, I think, six uh, uh, sessions and uh, one on the unified theme of the informatics, economics, and finance, two, econometrics, one, physics, and philosophy of science. This is the basically the, the sessions over uh, there. And of course, uh, in this one, 12 of the 13 papers were all exclusively on, on the information theory related. And then if you compare that with the, so this is all uh, the data on each uh, uh, conference, but I don't want to go in, into them. But this is the last one, which is going to happen now. And then uh, you can see, so there the focus was very uh, narrow because they're starting at the uh, ethnometric, uh, this is uh, informatics uh, conferences. But now it's a recent innovations in informatics in general. So it, this is a very dense, which contains about 30, uh, uh, not uh, 36, but uh, I think 15 sessions. And these 15 sessions compared to the six uh, sessions in 2009, so it has expanded. And, and you can see the, in here the the sessions, the diversity. Uh, you have computer science and physics, social models, econometrics, value of information and visualization, uh, biological section systems and quality complexity. So this is, again, if you look at the economics and finance and econometrics, they about seven out of this thing. So that's always a the dominant force. When, but yet, there is a diversity in across the disciplines uh, of uh, in natural science and engineering and biological sciences. And uh, related to paper information in 30 out of 36, uh, I got it, or basically you know, the information of the six, compared uh, to 12 by 13 in, in 2009. Okay, I will start, uh, stop over here, and again, thank you, Amos, doing all this great work and uh, uh, let's give him a quick applause. Session one. Congrats to Amos and American University. Uh, it takes monumental effort to do all of this, uh, to do it every year. Uh, some of us do this once every 10 years and always remember the pain that he has it all the time. So congrats as well. Incredibly successful. Thanks to Armand for summarizing uh, the past activities and, and, and accomplishments. Um, I'm usually put as the last speaker in many conferences in anticipation that I'll go over time and some people could leave. This is very courageous. So <laughs> uh, but I know I, this, this, the latest version of this paper, the revision, response to four referees from the JP, uh, it, it stands at about 160 pages. So I'm, and I have no hope of uh, uh, giving you the details of this paper. So I will, I will basically summarize and focus on the parts that are uh, very much motivated by information theory and the uh, metrics we have and the way we go about doing things. So Lei Wong, uh, my distinguished co-author, came to me, so he was interested in uh, <clears throat> uh, looking at the gender gap, um, equally uh, well studied as the racial gap and other gaps. And he said, well, I know, <clears throat> well, I asked him, surely we now know what the gap is and uh, how much is it is and why and where it's going. Uh, he said, well, that's why I'm here, because you have a tendency to always ask, what is it? not how much is it, but what, what is the gap? And indeed, that's the main purpose of this paper. What is, what is the gap? Um, we have uh, two distributed outcomes for two groups, uh, males and females. Uh, and in the end, somewhat more interestingly, between females and counterfactual distribution of uh, wage outcomes for females, were they to have human characteristics, uh, human ca capital characteristics of males, or 
were they to have the same market returns to those skills, to those two counterfactuals. And so once you have these two distributions, the question becomes what is the gap between those two distributed outcomes? By far the most dominant measure of gap in the literature is the mean. Um, log wages dominates and then the, the mean difference between uh, males and females. Um, and of course uh, median is another very popular one and sometimes focuses on certain quantiles is there is there a, uh, is there a uh, glass ceiling in, in certain professions so uh, and I, then I realized why he's he's in my office talking about the gap and I immediately said well it, what does it mean to report the average think of the simple average uh, earnings between two groups the average means um, a, a, a linear aggregator of all the gaps across the distribution with equal weights. You get a little bit more sophisticated than that, take the weighted mean, weighted average. That's a still a linear aggregator, and, but yet you immediately ask the question, whose weights? Uh, how do I weigh the wage difference between our friends who keep this room clean uh, and between, <coughs> say, billionaires? How do we find the weights? Um, and more importantly, why linear? The really very dirty little secret of all linear aggregators that dominate science is that they assume infinite comparability, infinite substitution between elements that you're aggregating. That's the linear utility function. So um, a dollar um, up or down for someone who spends all of their income, wages, on basic necessities is effectively infinitely comparable with the dollar to Bill Gates. I mean, if you think of one, per, going with percentage, a simple solution, right? One percent of someone's income that is always spent on necessities and one percent of Bill Gates. So if you ask the question, what percentage of Bill Gates' income would be equivalent to one percent of someone who's all spending on necessities. Is it 20 percent? Is it 80 percent? Is it is it 99 percent? Because it has to at some point affect his ability to consume or his opportunities uh, and so on. So very difficult. Everyone will have. And the arrow told us what the impossibility issues are in terms of trying to aggregate. So the idea is not to necessarily find an aggregator that commands. Uh, everyone's uh, um, agreement, but something that is more reasonable, majority types. So it turns out that this crowd is in a really good position to look at the distance divergence between distributions. We do that all the time. Some of our most uh, fundamental concepts uh, are about entropic distances, divergences between distributions. And what is less known to the information theory uh, uh, group, but rather well known to welfare theorists, and one of the younger ones is here in this session, is that to every entropy, there corresponds a monotonically increasing, but unique otherwise, welfare function. So when I talk about the entropy of a distribution, I am indeed talking about very well known welfare theory. Uh, uh, functions that are attributing weights to different parts of the distribution. Shannon's is a very simple weighting scheme. Professor Solis is here. I'm delighted to see his entropies uh, give different weights. Generalized entropy is a very flexible uh, set of entropies with very general sets of welfare functions that achieve uh, um, very reasonable, very respectable welfare theoretic foundation for entropic uh, measures of distance and, and um, divergence. For measuring, diver uh, measuring gap, we want distances. And again, somewhat of a dirty little secret among our own uh, group is that Shannon's entropy, cooled by Cleveland, is not a metric. It's just a measure of divergence. It uh, does not satisfy the triangularity rule. 
So whereas it's perfectly fine for testing hypotheses, equality of distributions, lots of hypotheses can be translated as some relationship between distributions, it does fail as a metric. So um, Lei Wang and I um, adapted and adopted a measure, uh, um, a member of the generalized entropy class of divergence functions that Jeff, Jeff Racine and I have uh, promoted for a number of years. It's the one metric member of generalized entropy family. So if, I, if I'm fortunate to be able to find it here, I'll go to it right away so that I can save time. This is familiar to the K-class uh, me uh, measure of entropic distances. You symmetrize it and for uh, various values of K, you get different entropies. For value of K one half, you get a metric. And uh, you've heard this story before. Clive Granger and I thought we discovered this. We wrote down a bunch of axioms that justify it. And until, uh, embarrassingly, some years later, someone said this is really a normalized Hellinger measure. So it's been there in mathematics. But there, too, they didn't rec recognize it was an entropy. And certainly, there was no recognition outside the welfare theory that these were related to some very important welfare functions. So uh, in, within welfare theory and within the con to topic of today, the idea is that you are interested in the distance between distribu a distributed outcome for anything you're interested compared to the uniform, total equal. That's what most of our welfare function measures are about. And when you're measuring the gap, you're really measuring the distance between those two distances, each distribution relative to the uniform and now the distance between them. So the uniform pops out, gets out, and what's left is merely a measure of the distance between two, your two earnings distributions. And so that's, that's the guy, and Jeff and I uh, have developed this. We do non-parametric estimators of this. Uh, recently, for some applications, we put in copulas in there because they are, in fact, written up as functions of copulas, and if you have a parametric copula, you have maximum likelihood estimators of these, co these, these, uh, these objects. Uh, not done yet, not, certainly not in this paper, which is all non-parametric. Um, the rest of the paper is to show whether it makes a difference to use our metric versus the mean, median, or any particular function of a quantile. And the, 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 the answer is uh, yes and no, and sometimes if if two distributions have a dominance relationship between them, you're not going to find different metrics say different things, qualitatively speaking. The, the true qualitative difference comes when you want to aggregate. And so our measure definitely says different things. And more importantly, in the literature on the uh, gender gap, is what's happening to it over the business cycle? How do different groups fare in, in recessions? Or is this gap declining or increasing, or where does it when does it increase or decrease? There, the stories are very different. You can pick your quantile and tell a different story for economic cycles. And the arbiter, if you like, the one that is a measure of the entire distributions, could be something like this entro entropic measure. You're not picking arbitrarily some mean, some quantile. You're saying something about the entire distribution and how the gap is moving over time. So that's the other part of the paper based on this S-Rho measure. At the end of the day, though, uh, there will never be a universal agreement on, on, on any welfare function. There isn't an inequality measure implicit in all of this that everyone would agree to. There are more agreeable ones, but there isn't a universal one. So you ask the question, can I, can I rank these two distributions irrespective of class of welfare function, class of entropies, and the answer is yes, you go to do stochastic dominance testing. So the second part of uh, results in this paper is about looking for first order and second order dominance rankings between uh, distributions of earnings between men and women, but again, um, more importantly, between a female wage distribution and the counterfactuals. The uh, obtaining of counterfactuals are very very quickly, I know I don't have time left. 
um, is um, is obtained uh, by leveraging, piggybacking on what Furpro and Limio and others have done in recent times. Basically, um, you use propensity scores to to to, to, to try to derive counterfactual distributions. It's, it's very practical. It's, it's, it's quite powerful. Um, so we do that, and we find that, just to very quickly summarize, that it's the human capital component of that decomposition that matters more rather than the market structure, rather than returns to skills. Uh, so once you, in a way, correct for human capital differences, the gap is declining, but it's not um, the way uh, some parts of the distribution would tell the story, and the decline has slowed down quite a bit since since uh, since '94, and there is a fair amount of uh, stochastic dominance relations between men and females, but not between female and counterfactual female distributions, which tells your story. Once this made it through <coughs> the first round with the, with the JPE, um, predictably, the question of selection arose. Um, uh, uh, women select positively and negatively into the labor force, and we reluctantly got into it. It's challenging because it's, it's easy enough to correct, easy enough and controversial enough to correct for selection when you're talking about conditional mean, typical regression. Correcting for it at the distribution level really doesn't have a current good solution. There is one unpublished by Arolano and uh, uh, Bonhomme, which did work and we used it, and it is true uh, casually observed by some economists that indeed once you account for selection, positive and negative selection at different parts of the economic cycle, that's where the story is in terms of what is happening to the gender gap. And the paper uh, as it stands now has those results as well. Thank you very much. way to represent asset pricing models. And so I had a dead paper, it's about 20 years ago, and we started this thing, Entropy and Finance. And this is John Campbell, it's something he wrote this year in an essay on the three guys who won the Nobel Prize in economics last year. And John Campbell's a real big shot. I mean, he's a big shot finance professor. He's a sci the brains behind a big hedge fund called Aero Street Capital. So John says, in a paper by me here in 95, and then some other guys that came later uh, in the top, uh, either in Econometrica or in the top finance journal called the Journal of Finance, shows how asset returns place lower bounds on the entropy of something called the SDF. And entropy and alternative variance as a measure of randomness plays an increasingly important role in asset pricing theory. So uh, this is pretty good news for me, and I'm sure these other guys here. And so what I thought I'd do, I re-looked at this subject, which I thought was completely dead, this work I did 20 years ago in the Journal of Econometrics, um, and I uh, re-looked at it, and I'll report some both old and some new results today that I have to report on this. Uh, so we'll see this in a minute. All right, so uh, the question is, what the hell is an SDF that he's talking about? So we start with Lars Hansen, who was one of these guys that won the Nobel Prize last year, representation of asset pricing model predictions as an expectation condition, the expected gross return on each asset times this thing called an SDF, or stochastic discount factor, has to be equal to one for all assets in the world. Uh, so the question is M would play a very large role then, and asset pricing theory sort of devises what they think the M is. And then the test of the asset pricing theory is to find parameters of a particular M that try and make those conditions true for all assets, I equals one to N, where R is the gross return you would earn per period, say per month in typical data. So one example is Lucas's model. We have this thing called the intertemporal marginal rate of substitution. That's what M is in that model of a uh, infinite uh, discounted sum of expected, ut uh, expected discounted sum of utility, where utility is constant relative risk aversion. There's two parameters, delta and alpha in that. And then more standard uh, finance models use a linear function of, of factors Fj uh, in the well-known capital asset pricing model. One of those Fs would be the, ex, the expected uh, return of a market portfolio of all assets uh, minus the risk-free rate. So th this is a very standard setup. Uh, Lars found a way to estimate these parameters subject to these moment conditions called generalized method of moments, and that was in no small measure what he won the Nobel Prize for last year. All right, so we're going to do something a little different with these moment conditions. 
Uh, it turns out the expected value of this thing M, or SDF, has to be the expected value of one over a risk-free interest rate, something like a treasury bill rate would be a good proxy in the US, short-term interest rate. And then you can divide M by this E of M. If you do that, you change the measure. So we have a measure DQ, which is M over E of M, DP, and the, with uh, radon nicotine density M over EM. And you can rewrite those moment conditions from the previous page that the expected uh, uh, RI times M equals one can be rewritten this way here as the expected value with respect to this so-called risk neutral change of measure Q of each asset's return minus this risk-free rate, sometimes called an ex, uh, excess return, those have to equal zero. So it's an equivalent way to rewrite this, and then Amos and others in the room here certainly would recognize this, because N, the number of assets is very large here, but still finite. Q might be a continuous, uh, absolutely continuous measure uh, with respect to LeBague or whatever. You wind up having an undetermined, underdetermined system of linear equations that would determine this risk neutral measure Q. So this is a linear inverse problem, uh, well known from, uh, from the entropy research. And the entropic solution of a linear inverse problem is also very well known. We define the kullback liebler relative entropy. Uh, uh, you guys all give it different names. I think this is the, the term SE used, the relative entropy. Uh, DQP equal this expectation with respect to the measure Q of the log DQDP. That's this M over EM thing I had in the previous page. If it's discrete, it has this uh, well-known sum that you're used to seeing. And the key thing for some of the findings I report today is that that's asymmetric. So if we switch the role of P and Q there, of course, we get a different number, as you all know, and that's going to wind up playing a large role in understanding the recent literature compared to my original work here. So what I defined was what I call the entropic risk-neutral measure by finding the Q measure, the transformation, which minimizes the relative entropy of it with respect to this measure P, and the measure P is the one that's used to define our... Uh, our original moment conditions here on the top line. So that's like the data generating mechanism measure. So what we're gonna do is find the, the benchmark measure which is closest to the actual uh, probability measure generating these returns data. Uh, and we're gonna compare a candidate measure like uh, one that was on the first page with, uh, from finance or from uh, Bob Lucas's work to that measure as a, as a diagnostic. So the solution, uh, which is, as, as you know, is quite well known here, is to, uh, the, the solution is, is, well, let's see, where are we? All right, so that's what we're gonna do. Uh, this DQM measure is going to be for a specific candidate measure that comes from economic or financial theory, like the two I had on the first page. And because my measure, my benchmark measure, minimizes the relative entropy, the entropy of that candidate measure that comes from the theory, m over uh, m theta here, where theta is a parameter vector in it, uh, that entropy has to be greater than or equal to this minimized relative entropy. So that's a diagnostic test, that not typically tested, but that is implied by the fact that it has to be a risk neutral measure, the, the candidate measure from theory, and its entropy can't be bigger than the one found by minimizing, by, by minimization. So it places a lower bound and that's a parametric restriction because you can see that the M depends on a parameter vector. All right, so here's an application uh, for the physicists in the crowd to estimate these expectations where you replace the phase average, which is what that is, by an infinite time average and then a pr due to ergodicity under that hypothesis. And then we approximate an infinite time average with the finite time average from past history. So a well-known procedure. And so the data, I use the Lucas M here, the parameters are delta and alpha, I substitute time averages for expectations as I measure. Uh, that's implied by ergodicity that you can do that. And uh, I wind up getting a numerical minimization problem uh, in, in an attempt to do the, the usual solution for the entropy minimizing measure, the Gibbs measure that winds up uh, uh, minimizing relative entropy. I find values for it, and uh, because the uh, top line here shows that uh, this is a parametric restriction on theta, which are the two parameters, delta and alpha, when I go ahead and look at that in sample, I get at the bottom here of the slide that the delta has to be bigger than one. That's called a risk-free rate puzzle, because in the theory, delta is supposed to be less than one. And I find that the value of alpha, the so-called coefficient of risk aversion, has to be uh, uh, close to 16 or higher, and that's thought of as also a puzzle called the, uh, related to what's called the equity premium puzzle. 
As most uh, people in labor economics and others that work on models believe the coefficient of risk aversion has to be small, something like two, three, or four, a number like that, not a number as high as 16. So basically, this little diagnostic immediately shows you some, uh, uh, immediately shows there's going to be problems for this theory. Without doing any formal testing and confidence intervals and testing of the exact moment conditions uh, and everything else, you immediately see by a couple of computations that the parameters have to be in a range where nobody thinks they should be. And so it's kind of a, a, a pr problematic for the theory, and it's very quick to do these computations. So that's one use of this as a diagnostic measure here. Now, subsequently, others reverse the measure. So these other papers that uh, John Campbell on the first slide lauded that came later than mine, um, and in, 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 uh, definitely in top journals, uh, what they did was, was switch the role of the two measures effectively. So if, you, if you're going to change the role of the Q and the P here, put the P first and the Q second, you wind up getting the log of the expected value of this SDF minus its expected log, uh, which will be positive due to Jensen's inequality. And uh, if you actually do a little uh, Jensen's inequality type argument there, you actually derive a different bound, which I've showed here in, uh, with the uh, bordered uh, equation here, where the entropy written the other way by interchanging the roles of P and Q winds up having to be greater than the expected log gross return of, of each asset minus the log gross return of the risk-free asset. That's sometimes called a risk premium. So basically it says that the entropy has to exceed the risk premium for each and every asset. And these are, you know, we're well cited, big papers in the, uh, in the top uh, journals that did it this way. Now, it turns out, so this is my new results here, this was and is a very bad idea, what these other guys did. Uh, so if you apply this reasoning there and compute what are the parameter restrictions on the alpha and the delta in the Lucas model, uh, implied by that inequality compared to mine, you get uh, much looser restrictions. So their delta uh, has to be only greater than or equal to 1.01 with the same data set, and the alpha only has to be greater than about 3.4. So from their perspective, there's nothing all that problematic about that asset pricing model confronting the data uh, based on this one restriction. But from my perspective, using my earlier entropy bound, which they were either unaware of for some reason did not cite or use at all, uh, you wind up getting much more restrictive things. So I see basically it's not very useful for this one purpose. Now you can also do, in Econometrica there's an article by a couple of Chicago guys, or uh, Fernando Alvarez, may have been a student of John's, I'm not sure. When, did you? I don't know, could be. But anyway, he uh, bounded what's called the permanent component decomposition of this M into two parts, one's called a permanent, one's called a transient component, econometrically. And then they made a very big deal in that econometrica paper about when you use this concept of entropy by switching the two uh, roles and the measures. When you use that concept of entropy, thank you, Sarah. Uh, you, when you do that, the permanent component always is uh, entropy, is always uh, uh, very close to the total entropy, which they argued said that you really should focus in your modeling on permanent sort of long-range components, shocks that keep propagating like they do in a... In, in a random walk model, for instance, um, and not worry so much about transient components. So that's what they get with their model. But that's really sort of a, it turns out that's a theoretical result, and when you use my concept of entropy, you don't get that at all. And in, in the data set I used here, it's only about 60% of the total. So they are wrong. You cannot conclude based on an entropy calculation that the permanent component is really the key to understanding asset pricing models and not these transient component shocks, uh, it's wrong because it, just by flipping the two measures, you get a radically different result. So it has nothing to do with the size of the component in some way, just, just flat out wrong. All right. Now, we had a better idea. Yuichi Kitamura is on the program tomorrow, and I had a better idea where instead of using the empirical, the data generating mechanism P as the reference measure for the model, uh, we take what the theory pre uh, wants to do, this thing I call QM here, like the Lucas uh, representation, and you look at a risk-neutral measure closest to that, okay? So when you do that, you repeat the usual computations to solve that linear inverse problem. You get a bunch of stuff here that's in the middle. And uh, you get two things that can be useful in diagnostics. One is the benchmark measure itself that is closest to uh, the theorist proposed measure and that is risk neutral. And the second thing is the 
is the, the, density, uh, the, the density of the benchmark measure relative to what the theory predicts, which is down at the bottom of the page. And these two diagnostics are quite useful. Right? So this is something Yuichi and I did in 2002, uh, which is not cited by anybody. Uh, what you see here is that the benchmark measure, which is in the bars here, uh, the blue, winds up being much more sharply peaked, or the, excuse me, the, the model measure winds up being much more sharply peaked than the benchmark measure. And basically, it doesn't have enough entropy to satisfy the moment condition. So right away, and I can interpret that later, but we don't have much time here. A second diagnostic is to plot the time series of this relative density of a benchmark that actually works with the data to what the, uh, proposed, the theory's proposed measure is that you're testing. And when you plot that, that thing should be basically centered around one if the model works. And in this case, it isn't. And the reason is that uh, one of my test assets here was uh, what are called value stocks. And uh, what this shows is an anomaly involving value stocks that uh, even if you have a model that is calibrated to fit the S&P 500 returns, it will not also explain the returns to value stocks. And it's the extreme, the most months where you have the most extreme deviations from unity here that are causing the econometric problem in fitting the moment condition. So you immediately see a diagnostic of which months in your time series sample were most problematic in getting the theory to uh, be consistent with the returns to value stocks, even if it is consistent with the return to, even if it is consistent with the return to the overall market. All right, so I end with this slide. This is from uh, the uh, late, great Arnold Zellner, who I was very fond of. He wrote a supporting letter for my tenure, even though he didn't know me very well. It was nice of him to do that. Uh, and he wrote in a paper in 91, much more empirical and theoretical work needs to be done to get a maximum entropy thermodynamic type physical model that performs well in explaining and predicting the behavior of economic systems. So a lot of people like this word entropy in finance and economics because they think it's going to serve a similar role to thermostatics, thermodynamics, and physics and be a very good for making macro predictions from limited micro data about a complex system. All right, and that's what gets a lot of interest in it. But the truth is none of the stuff I showed you here today does anything remotely like that. So I'm in the unique position of not just critiquing people who followed my work, but my own work. So I, I don't think this particular application is very valuable. It does not really do this job at all. But I'm hoping that the work we're doing and continuing here at conferences like this, that we will eventually make some progress on Arnold's goal here. And uh, if uh, this presentation made a, a, a motivated people to try and pick up that challenge more, then I, I feel vindicated in my 15 minutes, which are now up. case like the James uh, Dice data where you need, we don't have enough constraints. You're well, maximizing yeah. entropy, but without enough constraints. Yeah. Moment constraints in economics, there's too many constraints. You see, each and every asset, any stock you could buy, any bond you could buy, your own home that you live in for investment purposes, there's supposed to be one in that list of many assets I started with. And so it's very hard to find a theory where you look for a single object called M, which is a measurable function, okay, a single unitary function. When you plug it into those moment conditions, it's supposed to fit all of those simultaneously. So that's the challenge of asset pricing theory. And here we see it's even harder to get this to work if you use only two assets. One, a general stock market index, and two, an index bond index. It's hard enough to get that to work. So there's a real challenge here. It's only was right. She's not there. I noticed also that the, 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 the power function is there. And uh, when I, at some point I looked at Mero and Prescott's, puzzling over the equity premium puzzle, it's really an artifact of the power function. And so one could use what you're doing here also as a means of saying saying something about the underlying utility function. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, yeah. Saying, yeah, yeah. it's saying that alpha, the risk aversion coefficient alpha has to be larger than they thought was plausible. Right. So this is a different way to illustrate what their exactly. argument was. I just want to add that a comment from, uh, from James that the maximum entropy method works the best 
when it doesn't predict very well. The reason is because that the argument that he makes is that because that brings to the analyst, now being their financial analyst or physicist, that there are, there are underlying constraints that have not been yet explored. Yeah. So there could be other financial constraints that- We already have two more. So the problem here is, is, there, is that there's a, there's a- Maybe they're not correct ones. Yeah, maybe they're not correct ones. That would be good. So then you, you, you have to pose those. You're coming into the next speaker's time, but I will take this off during the coffee break for one reason. So the next speaker has been confirmed from uh, on Fed, which is Tina talking about uh, long-term charge in US Treasury. Okay. Uh, before starting, let me thank the organizers for uh, this uh, very kind invitation. I mean, I'm very excited to be here uh, these two days. So uh, I come from, uh, let's say, a, a welfare side. So uh, I'm looking at distributions uh, uh, from that perspective. And today I'm going to talk about uh, ongoing work with Andreas Peichel from Mannheim in Germany and Philipp van Kerm from uh, Luxembourg. And myself, I'm in, uh, in Antwerp. So we come from that little corner of, uh, of Europe. And we're going to talk about US uh, earnings inequality. Let me start with a graph that probably you're all somehow familiar with. This is the earnings inequality in the United States. And it increases and it increases sharply. And what I'm showing you on the axis is a Gini coefficient, which in fact, we could have used the generalized entropy uh, measure of inequality that would probably have brought me from the 15% into the 85% of the, of the papers. But here is a uh, standard measure of inequality. It goes up. Another fact, another fact is that's probably something that not many of you know, is that the correlation between the earnings of husbands and wives, of males and females, also increases sharply in that period. Okay? This is a story about doctors marrying doctors rather than marrying nurses. Okay? In the past they were marrying nurses and now they're more often marrying doctors. So the research question is, to what extent is this increase in assortativeness a driving factor for the increase in, uh, in earnings inequality. And let me be sharp on what I'm, I'm talking about. Earnings inequality is the, is the inequality in earnings, and earnings is what you make on the labor market. It's your hourly wage times the hours that you work. Okay, so this is before the government intervenes with redistribution, before capitals are added or, or anything like that. In fact, in this paper, we want to go a little bit further even, and we want to disentangle which is the underlying story that could be driving this, uh, this link. It could be a story about assortative mating, about uh, people like to marry people that are uh, more similar to them. So there is a, an increase in, in, in couples with the same education uh, quite sharply in that same period. Another story could be a story about joint labor market participation. It could be that this, this is driven by the rise of the dual earners, uh, the women entering the labor force. Or this could be a story about, well, conditional on working, this is in fact a fact, this is a story about earnings correlation that increases, okay? People that are more productive that like to live with people that are more productive. What we want to disentangle in this paper is which of the channels is now more uh, is, is more important in explaining the link between increase in assortativeness and increase in inequality. What we do um, is we want to, we're going to estimate a, a statistical model, um, not of the, of the earnings distribution, but of the underlying joint distribution of male and female uh, earnings. And this will allow us to model in an explicit way this correlation or assortativeness. And then what we're going to do is we're going to construct a long series of counterfactuals by swapping parameters. And that will give us an idea about how important that assortativeness is. So in a certain sense, this paper comes before what SE was presenting you. We are mainly looking at the counterfactuals. SE would rather be interested in, well, how are we comparing these two distributions? Okay. Let me, uh, let me start saying a couple of words on, uh, on our statistical model. Uh, so. Very simple, total earnings is the earnings of the wife plus the earnings of the husband. And uh, what we're interested in is this uh, G PDF, so that's the, the, dens the, the density function, the probability density function of the total earnings. What we're going to model is F, okay? And you can easily move from one to the other, either you, you look at the integral or very simply what we do is if you have like a scatter plot like that, earnings of the wife on the horizontal axis, earnings of the husband on the vertical axis, we just integrate along this, uh, this orange lines. Okay, these are lines with the same total earnings. Uh, 
So we're going to construct that uh, a model for that joint PDF. How are, are we going to do that? Because remember what our aim is to disentangle these different channels. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically write that as a long chain of various conditional probabilities. So when I use a bold, and I hope you can see that at the end, so there's some bold uh, symbols. A bold symbol is in fact is a, paired, a pair of two variables. It's a variable for the husband and a variable for the wife. So on the, on the left hand side there is the joint distribution of husband and wives. And this we're going to write as a joint conditional distribution, conditional on L, E, R, and Z. L is the joint labor market decision, so this is a zero one variable, whether either of the partners is active on the labor market, there is race, uh, there is education, and there is a bunch of other control variables. Then of course we have a, a series of conditioning variables, and again we're going to do this, the same trick if you want, again conditioning each variable on the, the, the rest of the variables. And this will allow us to have like, you can imagine that as some kind of a tower with various conditional probabilities. And that allow, will allow us to take out one of these conditional probabilities and plug a another one in place and, and get to a counterfactual. Remember that what we are interested in is disentangling this change, but mainly in the assortativeness. So what we want to do is we want to dissect this joint probability so that we have like a, a real contribution of the assortativeness that can be identified from the changes in the marginal distributions. So what are we going to do for the continuous variables, so the, the earnings, we're going to use copulas, okay? So basically, if you're not aware uh, of, of, of copulas, that's a very, a very easy trick to write a joint distribution as a function of what happens in the margins, and then something which is separate from that, that is how the margins are glued together, how they are coupled. So that's uh, that what gave the animal its name. And that copula, that's that little c function in red there. Okay, so we go each of the each of the joint distributions can be written as a product of these uh, three terms, and what we're going to do then is just swap this c. Okay, that will give us a counterfactual, fixing the margins but changing the correlation structure. I mean, I can discuss that later if you want, but for the discrete variables, we have a series of zero one variables. This is more complex, okay, because. Uh, Copulas, in fact, only work neatly for continuous variables, but luckily, uh, Mo Steller in a JASA paper has, uh, has proposed a method to, to basically <coughs> construct uh, contingency tables, uh, which is very similar to us. So in fact, what we're going to do is, we're going, I mean, Mo Steller has shown that there is like, any contingency table can be written as a function of the margins and the cross product ratio, and then that cross product ratio can be, can be transposed in a similar way. Okay, so basically that gives us a tower of different blocks and each of the blocks can be cut into, into three pieces and what we are interested in is swapping this piece that, that captures the correlation structure. We're going to estimate that in a parametric way, let me not go into too much details. The earnings distributions, we assume that they follow a sigma dollar, which is a quite, uh, I think, reasonable assumption. And then we model each, so this is a three parameter distribution, uh, capturing the shape of the, of the distribution. Each of these parameters is modeled as a function of this covariance on which it is conditioned. Similar for the correlation structure, the, the copula is assumed to be a Plaquet copula. Again, similar story, the parameter, which is again also a cross product ratio, this parameter is modeled as a, uh, a function of the covariance. And for the bivariate uh, variables, what we're using is basically assuming that they follow a bivariate probit. Okay? Then we bring that to the data, which is the data that is uh, here in the US the, the, the best data available, the CPS, the March uh, supplement of that. In this presentation, I'm going to compare 67 with 2007. Okay, in the paper we do much more, but uh, let's, let me focus here on that comparison for the presentation. And we uh, look only at couples, okay? These are couples of opposite sex sharing living quarters, the so-called puzzle cues uh, for demographers. And we only focus on working age people between 20 and 55. And as I said, we focus on pre-tax pre income. Let me show you one slide trying to convince you that our model fits reasonably well. So look at the 76 and the 2007, that's what we're going to use. I'm showing you here uh, quantile functions, the inverse of the CDFs. And as you can see, the, the observed and the predicted are very close. In fact, they are suspiciously close in, in 67, I mean, where the Gini is very, very, very closely uh, approximated. So we have this model, and what we're going to do now is we're going to construct counterfactuals, and we're going to look at what is the difference between this counterfactual and what we observe in reality. 
I'm going to show you a couple of figures like this. The thought experiment behind this figure is the following. We are in 2007, assume. Now, let's, let's assume in a counterfactual world that we can import the distribution of the 60s. Okay? Who would gain and who would lose? Well, the people who are rich, the people at the right, the upper two deciles, they would lose. Okay? Because in the 60s, they would be poorer than now. That is the, the very well-documented uh, story that, in fact, income growth in the US is mainly, uh, is exclusively uh, uh, at, the, at the upper end of the distribution. In fact, uh, in our sample, this is only the upper two deciles who grow compared to the mean. Okay, all the other people would gain from that counterfactual, the middle class, let's say, okay, which is a quite strong result. Now what we're going to do is, to what extent can we uh, explain this figure by means of our different parameters? So what we're going to do, we allow all parameters to move through time, but we fix, we fix this correlation parameters. So this is the question, this is the answer to our, our question. And then basically what we get is the new resulting change in, in quantile functions, that's the orange blue line. This was a quite depressing result when it came out of our computer. We built an entire model basically to explain virtually nothing. Okay, this is uh, what you don't want to do. So uh, the total change in the Gini, I forgot to say that's at the bottom, it's seven points. And all this correlation, these three correlation channels together, they explain 0 0.3 Gini points, less than 5% of the change in inequality. So let's try to disentangle that. So let's try to disentangle the different uh, underlying possible stories. So now if we allow everything to move except the cross product ratio for education that we fix in the, in the 60s, what is the result? Nothing, okay? This is by the way a result that, that some sociologists have uh, recently found as well. And there's also a recent NBR paper making a, making a very similar point. So no effect from mating on education. The joint employment probabilities, what is the effect of that? Nothing again. Okay, so the only, the little effect that we find is driven by this, by this copula parameter. This is the parameter of the, uh, of the, the, the correlation structure in among the, the, the two earner couples. Now you're wondering, I mean, they have built this entire model. Is there something that explains what we see? Well, yes, there is. This is what, what we fix is the male earnings distribution. Okay, the marginal male earnings distribution. And that drives, as you can see, almost all of the story. If we add the female earnings distribution on top of that, you get very, very close, okay? So last question that you might be wondering now, is there only bad news? No, there is a little bit of good news. If we make a counterfactual where we allow the, the women employment probabilities to be stick, so let's assume that women did not enter the labor market, what do we see? This is a positive story. So the entering of women on the labor market was dampening inequality, okay? Was counteracting these other effects that we found. Wrapping up, so what we have, I, I think what we have presented um, is an, uh, I think more generally applicable parametric method to decompose joint distributions. Uh, in this setting it works. I hope it, some of you get inspired to maybe also apply this, this copula-based decomposition technique in, in other fields. We can discuss about that if you're interested. I want to stress something for the economists in the room. Uh, this is not a general equilibrium exercise. This is purely accounting. This is statistics, okay? We, I'm not taking into account that if women enter the labor market, wages may change, okay? That is not something that is taken into account, purely accounting. However, I think that the, the main findings are quite interesting. So. The, the bottom line of the story is that inequality in couple earnings has increased. Increase in assortativeness is, the, sorry, the increase of assortativeness has a very little impact on this increase in inequality, less than 5% of the Gini. If there is a story, it is this correlation parameter, the correlation conditional on of, of both partners being active on the labor market, but where is the action? The action is in the margins of the males and the females. Okay, so all the effects are, are dwarfed by that. Okay, that's what I wanted to tell you.
strand correlation parameter the problem. So this is the copy last or copy last run, the plaquette parameter, the cross product. Another question? Yes. Look, did you try These are conditional joint distributions, mm -hmm. so we don't have data, data points now. I mean, that would, we would gain that we don't have to make parametric assumptions. We tried, uh, but we abandoned that track quite soon, because this is all conditional on very, very many variables. So that's the what kind of copula do you use? The plaquette copula. Okay. The, the beauty, there is a, a little bit of an elegant argument to do that, because for the, the discrete variables, we use the cross product ratio. And the plaquette parameter is quite neat, because that is also a cross product ratio. <coughs> of course, I mean, in the sensitivity checks, we, we are experimenting now I mean, we are with, with different copulas. Of course, I mean, we could improve the fit probably by taking a, a copula with more parameters mm -hmm. or a mixture of copulas. Okay, I think. Quickly, I think you would get more bang uh, for, for the, for the uh, excellent methodology you have if you, in fact, use the generalized entropy. Uh, as, as, your, uh, as your vehicle for, for measuring impact. Genie, as you know, uh, uh, gives almost zero weight to the tails. And you, as you mentioned, a lot of the action is in the tails. And so this, you're not, you're using, in a way, a, a bad vehicle to see how good your method is. I, I, uh, I totally agree with you that, uh, but the, we I tried. But the problem is it's very hard because it's zeros. And then the generalized entropy gets in, into trouble. So we have to either find an elegant way of dealing with the zeros, or what I would suggest people do is to use from the Gini family also more, uh, more bottom sensitive methods. All of them. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm Amel Almos. Um, this is a joint work with uh, Barbara Rossi from Pompeo Fabra. So the, the issue here is, um, assume you want to forecast or predict a, a variable, typically a macro variable, like a GDP, and you have many potential predictors. How do you uh, handle these many predictors? So we consider various uh, dimension reduction techniques, including principal component, uh, ridge regression, partial least square, and uh, we'll uh, propose a, a way for selecting the tuning parameter uh, via, via uh, cross-validation. So, uh, so, so the model is a very simple model where uh, you have uh, N uh, regressors, and N may be very large. So the standard OLS estimate uh, involve an inversion of x prime x, which may be uh, nearly singular if, if the regressors are collinear. And it is well known that in this case, uh, the OLS estimator has large variance. Uh, and if n is greater than t, then OLS estimator is not even feasible. So you can think of x, inverting x prime x as, a, as an inverse problem, and you can use various regularization techniques from the inverse problem literature. So um, we'll uh, um, look at, at a, uh, in particular ridge regression. So uh, here we assume that the data are standardized before applying any of these regularization techniques because uh, these data reduction methods are not scale invariant. So it would not make sense to apply them on raw data. So in the ridge regression, you just as, uh, add uh, identity matrix times a small tuning parameter alpha to the matrix x prime x. And um, this method has a Bayesian uh, interpretation. So it's sometimes called Bayesian uh, shrinkage. And there's a, a very informative, informative paper by uh, Demol, Janoni, and Raishin on this method comparing with, with um, principal components. And it is also uh, a penalized least square estimation with L2 uh, penalty. So 
So we see that here there is a tuning parameter which is alpha. The second method I'm going to consider is principal components. Here you calculate the eigenvectors of a matrix X, uh, X, X prime or X prime X and uh, uh, to, f to predict why you, pr you pr project on the principal component associated with the largest eigenvalues. This is the same method which is used in factor models. Uh, the way factors are estimated is by uh, uh, computing uh, eigenvectors of, of the matrix XX prime. And uh, this is used uh, in papers by Stock and Watson by an Eng. The difference is here we don't assume a factor structure. So we use principal components as a dimension reduction device and we, we don't assume uh, a factor model. So this uh, method involves a tuning parameter which is now the number of principal components to retain in the method. The third method is partial width square, which exists uh, since the early 80s, but hasn't been used uh, very much in econometrics yet. Uh, it is considered uh, in econometrics by Gren and Capitanios and Kelly and Pritt. There, the, the, the nice feature is the, the projection is done on, on uh, what we call PLS factors, which are linear combination of X, which are highly correlated with Y. So, so, so now, um, instead of uh, projecting on factors that explain X only, the variation in X only, you project on factors that are uh, highly correlated with the object of, of interest, which is Y. And as a result, the, the PLS factors are actually function of Y itself. And when you project on this object, you get an estimator which is nonlinear uh, in Y because uh, the matrix M is, is a function of Y itself. So it's a nonlinear uh, uh, estimator which is more complex to, to analyze, but has uh, this nice feature to, to, uh, to project on components which are uh, highly correlated with the object of interest. And here again, the question is how to choose the number of, principal, uh, of, of components. So uh, the first step uh, here is an analysis of, of a mean square uh, prediction error from a theoretical point of view. And to do this, we have some assumptions. We assume that the eigenvalues of x prime x over nt are summable, which will be true for factor models and for, of, uh, I mean for many different cases, including autonomous uh, regressors. We have uh, a source condition uh, which tells us, tell us how well you can approximate X delta from principal component. And here the larger beta is, the faster the rate of convergence will be. And this is a condition you find in uh, functional estimation. And here I, uh, I quote the handbook uh, chapter with Eric Renaud and uh, Jean-Pierre Florent. And then we can uh, basically uh, uh, um, characterize the mean square prediction error as the sum of two terms, a variance term and a bias term, for which we can characterize the rate of convergence. So, um, which depends on a, on a tuning parameter alpha and a beta, the, the parameter I introduced earlier. So I was able to derive a rate for principal component and reach. So we can compare the two methods and we see that if beta is small, so if the model is difficult basically, then uh, the two methods have the same rate of convergence of the mean square error. So there is no, no preference. If the model is easy in the sense that uh, X delta can be explained from a few principal components. So if typically you have a factor models with a few factors, their principal uh, components is better and we'll have a faster rate of convergence uh, because of this term here, alpha beta will be faster than uh, alpha to the power of two. So it's, it's quite intuitive. If a model is a factor model, principal component will be beta. If not, uh, um, if a model is, is basically, doesn't follow factor model, then there is no preference between the two methods. I, I don't have a rate for PLS yet, but it would be interesting, of course, to have a rate for PLS and compare. So uh, all these methods involve a tuning parameter. And here we just uh, propose to use generalized cross validation, which is a method uh, uh, which is well known. And as a, 
various advantages. It's easy to implement. It doesn't require uh, estimating the variance of the error. And uh, as a result, it is robust to heteroscedasticity. So the same expression apply whether the error has a heteroscedastic er uh, variance or not. And it has some optimality results uh, that were proved in the homoscedastic case by Lee and in the heteroscedastic case by, uh, by Andrews. So this is a, a data-driven method for selecting the tuning parameter. Comparing with Bayer and Eng, Bayer and Eng assume a factor model. So they select the factors that are the most relevant for explaining the variance in X. Irrelevant, I mean, without uh, considering um, Y at all. So, so their method will be actually uh, very good if, um, if X indeed follows a factor model and will, in some case, for some criterion, will deliver a, a consistent estimator of a number of factors, but it's not going to be as good if, for instance, the number of factors relevant for X is much larger than the number of factors relevant for Y because uh, by an angle will retain too many factors and it will be detrimental for forecasting, for instance. While, uh, on the contrary, we propose a method that involves Y here. So it's, it's different. The, the criterion involves Y for us. So now about uh, uh, simulations. We uh, generate a factor model for Y and X, where both uh, uh, depends on, on factors and we'll uh, consider various uh, settings. We'll uh, compare the method in, of, in terms of mean square error in sample and out of sample. Of course, the important thing is how this methods perform out of sample. We use a rolling estimation. And in all the methods, we use generalized cost validation for selecting the number of uh, the tuning parameter. So we'll consider various settings um, so a few factors for many factors, 50, uh, three factors, but only one is relevant for Y, a spurious regression where actually uh, YT is just a white noise and uh, a case where there are 200 factors, as many as regressors, as, as if you don't have factors. So if you compare here, the mean square error in, are, in, are relative to by and egg. So any values which, which is smaller than one means we, we are doing better than by and egg. And the difference between principal components and, by, and this column by and egg here is only in the way we select the number of, of, of factors. So we see that actually principal component is very comparable to by and egg. We get values close to one, except for the last one where very, as I said, we have 200 factors and basically no factors because uh, all of, of these variables are, are independent uh, from each other. So, so our method is more parsimonious and we get a much smaller mean square forecast error because we are more parsimonious in the way we select uh, the number of factors. Now, the interesting thing is, is reach. Here in terms of out of sample forecasting, uh, reach is doing much better uh, than by and egg and it's doing better e whether the model is a factor model or not. So it seems that which is actually very robust, um, is a very reliable method here, and uh, it works well in, in, in both cases. So now uh, a, a small empirical application, we apply our methods for forecasting GDP growth and inflation using uh, 32 um, uh, variables uh, taken from Stock and Watson. And the data set is uh, contain about 200 uh, quarters. So our benchmark is the autoregressive model where the number of lags is selected by uh, BIC. And we compare uh, various methods, so factor model, principal component, which uh, PLS and Bayesian model averaging of point. So for inflation, we see that it's very difficult to beat the autoregressive model, actually, because uh, our, uh, our uh, mean square forecast error are all here worse than AR, so for the Bayesian moving up, uh, model average of, of white, here it's better. Now 
for, for GDP growth, we see that um, both REACH and uh, PLS are doing better uh, than the autoregressive model, and, the, and PLS is doing very well here. So partially square is a, is a very uh, much smaller uh, mean square forecast error. So, so this is a promising uh, venue for PLS here. So in conclusion, we, we considered uh, various uh, dimension reduction uh, devices. We compare them both from a theoretical point of view and from Monte Carlo point of view. We find uh, that um, reach is very robust um, uh, to settings where there, is, there are factors, there are no factors in both cases it's doing very well. And in application, both reach and PLS uh, did well for, for um, uh, GDP growth. That in sample or out of sample? This is out of sample. Forecast okay. error. Yeah, and what's the scheme? What is that? I mean, what's the scheme? Is there a holdout sample? Do you update the data set one observation at a time? It's a, it's a rolling estimation. It's what? Ro rolling, rolling estimation. Yes. Okay, okay. Thank you. that we standardized the data, like it is done in factor models, the data are standardized before applying anything, so, so mm -hmm. that's why I use regular reach. And about the conditioning on X, well, the rate of convergence are the same, whether yeah, it's, it's, it's the same rate of convergence. But you don't derive the expression Yes, if I understand what you're doing, you're doing model selection in your first four columns and model averaging in your right, so I don't understand the lower right result where your model averaging is doing worse than a model selection. I mean, isn't there a general result that says model averaging has to do better than any specific model you've selected by even cross-validation? I have to say, I, I didn't program the model uh, averaging. I'm not sure which models are average, but I suspect it's not, we don't average over our methods. We average over something else. So if we average over our method, it's true. Necessary model average should be better. But if you average over uh, something else, like different AR models, then it's not true anymore. <coughs> Welcome to the second part of the morning. Uh, my name is Luciano Floridi, and I have the pleasure to chair and introduce uh, our next speaker, which is Constantino Salas, for those of you too far away to be able to read. I will not take any uh, time from him. We have uh, 40 minutes uh, available uh, until 12.05. Uh, the hope is that he will be speaking for about half an hour or so uh, to leave plenty of time for uh, Q&A. Whatever the problem says. Uh, um, the uh, inflexible laws of bureaucracy. And the, the, but I mean, we're very welcome to take all the 40 minutes, and questions could be asked during lunchtime. Um, I won't say anything about uh, Constantino because you can read. Uh, uh, and you wish to know about him, uh, either Googling or on the screen. All I want to say is that uh, he calls home many countries, I learned recently. Uh, France, uh, Greece, first of all, France on that side of the Atlantic, and uh, uh, Brazil uh, recently, but Argentina before uh, on the other side. Um, he is uh, a uh, Carioca uh, by election uh, in uh, Rio de Janeiro, and with uh, any no more time uh, wasted from uh, his already short, I understand, uh, allocation of time. Let's see if the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. But I would like, first of all, to thank uh, Amos Golan and uh, the other organizers for uh, uh, bringing us together in this opportunity. Too. So <coughs> I'd like to speak a little bit about entropies and their consequences in physics and uh, elsewhere. And let me start with this. The Foundations of Statistical Mechanics. So this was written by a physicist, Ter Haar, in 1955. And he says the first man to use a truly statistical approach was Boltzmann. And it took more odd 20 years so that Gibbs would use the expression statistical mechanics. Because mechanics was Newton. New Newton is like a clock. Tuck, 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 no statistics there. But uh, then uh, there is the entropy and there is all that stuff. So finally, Gibbs introduced the expression statistical mechanics. And uh, since it is full of philosophical and epistemological contents, there are a um, uh, lot of discussions. But uh, I like this sentence that he says, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So you eat it. If it is good, <laughs> that's okay. If it's not good, <laughs> it's not okay. It doesn't matter the explanations of the cook. What matters, what matters is if the pudding is good to eat or not. So this is the philosophy I will adopt. Let me start with these lines from Enrico Fermi, his books in thermodynamics, 1936. He says, the entropy of a system composed of several parts is very often equal to the sum of the entropies of all the parts. So an intelligent man like Fermi does not write very often just like that. It's because he has something in his mind. He has a counterexample. He has something. And uh, he says, in fact, that these conditions are not quite obvious. In some cases, they may not be fulfilled. If it is so, they can play a considerable role. So this is the viewpoint I'm going to comment for you. So let me start with uh, this little table of entropy. This line is Boltzmann, Gibbs, Shannon, von Neumann. It's all essentially the same thing. It's a logarithmic measure of uncertainty. So there you have a relatively generic expression. And if all the probabilities are the same, then you have the famous formula for the entropy, which is on the grave in the central cemetery in Vienna the grave of Boltzmann. But I'm going to talk a lot about that one, where you immediately see there is an extra index, Q. So if in this line, if you take Q equal 1, you recover this line. So I am not talking about an alternative to Boltzmann Gibbs, where it is where it works. I'm talking about a generalization. Boltzmann Gibbs is a particular case of this, when you take Q equal to 1, or go into 1. Now, it's so easy to generalize any mathematical function, like p log p. So in 10 minutes, uh, we could produce uh, a dozen of different generalization of the function. So why that particular generalization here? Well, that's a long story <coughs> that I don't have time to enter into the details. But uh, let me tell you that this is a kind of minimalistic uh, generalization of that one a kind of uh, Zen generalization of uh, Boltzmann. These two expressions, they share a lot of important things, like concavity, extensivity, I will come back, a lot of things. But of course, I have to violate something. The only expression that does not violate anything is P log P, and then you are not generalizing. So if you want to generalize, you want to violate something. We're going to violate only one thing, additivity. This expression is additive. This expression is non-additive. And I will come back onto that. First of all, this table can be rewritten this way if we introduce these functions, Q logarithm of x, which is defined like this. And when Q goes to 1, this becomes the normal logarithm. And the inverse function is the Q exponential of x, 
And if you go through one, this becomes the normal explanation. Uh, we'll be referring a lot to these two functions. And to start with, the table can be written here in a more elegant way. You see, log, log, q log, q log, by using this. And so a mathematician said, well represented, half solved. So it's good to have it represented in a convenient and compact manner. It will help a lot because it will always guide you what is the result that you want. You want the same result that you already knew, slightly generalized in this way. Galileo said it's very convenient to know the answer before proving it. Let me make a quick uh, differentiation between simple systems and complex systems. So here you have some of their properties. Typically they have a short range space-time correlations. They have a short memory or no memory at all. They have additive noise. They have strong chaos, which means that the maximal Lyapunov exponent is positive. They have a lot of, they have a soft geometry, and they have an important word here, ergodic. So simple systems, typically they are ergodic. This means that the ensemble average coincides with the time average. And if you open any good textbook of statistical mechanics, of Boltzmann Gibbs statistical mechanics, it will tell you in the first pages that uh, the systems that are going to be focused are ergodic, like the air in this room. And uh, if the system is not ergodic, like Amos Golan, who is not ergodic, and I wish you 100 of years of non-ergodicity, <laughs> then virtually you can close the book. So <clears throat> these systems are plenty of linearity, are plenty of Gaussians, and Boltzmann Gibbs entropy is absolutely adequate for that. Complex systems, they are quite different. Typically, they have long-range space-time correlations. They might have long memory. They have weak chaos, which means that the Lyapunov exponent maximal is zero. They are non-ergodic. They have hierarchical geometries, like fractals, multifractals, and things like this. There are plenty of non-linearity. They have a lot of Q Gaussians. And entropy SQ seems to be adapted to a good class of them. But the heart of all this difference is in these two boxes. Here, suppose you have coins, two to the power n, and a new coin enters into the system and says to the others, multiply your possibilities by the two possibilities that I like, which is head and tail. And the others say, no problem, this is a free country. So we multiply two power n, by two, and that gives you two power n plus one. And they are all happy, they are very independent, and they are very lonely, because the price of independence is loneliness. So that's simple systems. Complex systems is here, our coin arrives here, and they have not exponential with n, but a power law with n, like n to the square, say, and the coin arrives and say, multiply your possibilities by the two possibilities that I like, which is head and tail. And the other say, not at all. This is not uh, just like that. It is not a mess. We have a constitution. We have a grammar. We have music. We have poetry. We have Wall Street. We have languages. We have a lot of big correlations. But for you not to be completely unhappy, we are going to put one million one square instead of one million square. The one is you. So that's the big difference. So here, the dynamics of the system is like a fly in phase space. It goes everywhere. You wait long, it will be ergodic. And this is like a spider. It goes like airplanes on the airport. It's an hierarchical structure, completely different. This is the big difference. Let me <coughs> define these two words, additivity and extensivity. First of all, additivity, I will adopt 
the definition of Oliver Penrose, the brother of Roger Penrose, Foundations of Statistical Mechanics in 1970. So an entropy is additive if for any two probabilistically independent systems, the entropy of the sum is equal to the sum of the entropies. Remember the words of Enrico Fermi. If not, we will say it is non additive. You will prove in three lines that SQ satisfies this if A and B are independent. Therefore, SQ is non additive, except in Q equal 1, where it becomes the previous one, and there it is additive. So, additivity is a very simple property, and you can check any entropy that you invent, you can check if it is additive or not in 15 minutes. You will know. Extensivity is a much more complex system, much more complex concept. Extensivity basically means that the entropy of many particles is proportional to the number of particles. So extensivity comes from thermodynamics. Extensivity is the reason why if you eat an ice cream of 200 grams, you get inside the double of calories than if you eat an ice cream of 100 grams. Exactly the double. Not square root of two, not three times, the double. That's extensivity, that's thermodynamics. If you have some entropy and you want to answer whether the entropy, that entropy of that system is extensive or not, it might take you 15 years, not 15 minutes. This is a very hard question, whereas that one is a trivial question. This is very hard because it involves the correlations of the elements of the system, which might be a, a mess. Now, <coughs> let me illustrate what I was saying. There you have the class that I was mentioning. The number of possibilities increases linear, uh, exponentially with n, and that's the example of the cones. If you have such a class, like the air in this room, you want to use Boltzmann Gibbs entropy. Boltzmann Gibbs, Shunt, von Neumann, as I said, it's the same thing. So you want to use this because the logarithm of this is proportional to n, and then you are happy because this is okay for thermal. But if you have this class, if you have this class, you don't want to use Boltzmann because the logarithm of this is proportional to the logarithm of n. And you don't want logarithm of n. You want n. And n, a logarithm of n, can be uh, terrifically different, especially if n is the Avogadro number. But you want to use this Q. With this value of Q, 1 minus 1 divided by rho, the rho that you see here, because that one is extensive. So that's OK. Another example, neither of this or this, this is a different class, which, which happens to be the class of apparently black holes. So it increases like a stretch exponential of n. In that case, neither Boltzmann or SQ does the job, but this new entropy, S delta, does the job. And when you take delta equal 1 divided by gamma, the gamma that you see here, it is proportional to n. And then you are happy because you are satisfying thermodynamics. A remark. This number is much larger than this, which is much larger than this. That makes a huge difference. This is the case of the independent coins or the air in this room. So it has a finite. Lebesgue measure. It occupies virtually everywhere in phase space, and uh, it does it randomly. And this is why Boltzmann, his genius intuition, he called that the uh, molecular chaos hypothesis everywhere, like the flood. These and these have zero Lebesgue measure. So it does not go everywhere. It goes into very special places in phase space like the airplanes, they go to the airport. That's the instruction number one to the pilot. You bring this airplane to the airport. But the pilot knew a lot about mathematics, and he said, oh, but sir, uh, the ensemble of airports is virtually a zero Lebesgue measure set. Oh, yeah, you're right. It's virtually a zero Lebesgue measure set. 
And if you don't use that set, you are fired or you will be dead. So you don't go to the ocean, you don't go in the middle of the fields, you go to the airport. That's the big difference. So let me show to you these indices, Q for example. They do not come down from heaven. You calculate them. You calculate them from first principles. What is first principles in physics? Mechanics. Newtonian mechanics, quantum mechanics, relativistic mechanics, electromagnetism. That's first principles. The rest is theory of probabilities. Q has nothing to do with theory of probabilities. Q comes from mechanics. So let me show an example for you. This is a work that was done with Filippo Caruso, um, an Italian young man at the time, and uh, we calculated for a system with quantum entanglement, you know, that strong entanglement that exists in the so-called quantum computers. But nowadays they are very preliminary, but uh, cars also were very preliminary 100 years ago. So we calculated in a subsystem of the quantum entanglement system, the entropy is Q, as a function of the size of the subsystem. So you have a system which all of it is strongly quantum entangled, in fact at zero temperature. But uh, your detector does not seize the whole system. The detector sees a part of the system. But that part fills the entire system. The detector is a business, but what fills that is a different business. So, by, com by doing computer calculations, Filippo established that SQ as a function of L, if you change Q, it's always non-extensive excepting for Q equals 0 0.08, this. And therefore, the entropy is proportional to the size. And that's okay for thermodynamics. So for this system, we like Q equals 0 0.08, not A few months later, we could obtain the analytical expression here. And there you have Q as a function of the so-called, of the inverse of the central charge. And the model that I just showed to you, which was the, the Ising model, central charge is one half. So if you put one half here and here, you obtain 0 0.08, because now it's analytical. And we have a lot of models here, the Ising, X, Y, etc. So when the central charge goes to infinity, Q goes to 1. So this is a very beautiful illustration of what I told you. We are not replacing Boltzmann where it works. We are generalizing. Boltzmann is inside in this red spot. Let me show to you another model in which it has been possible to handle all this analytically. And this has been done by people from Brazil, three from Fortaleza, and two <coughs> from Rio de Janeiro. From where is from what I understood the wife of the chair. So uh, they calculated from first principles the distribution of positions and also the distribution of velocity. And they found a Q Gaussian with Q equal zero, not with Q equal one. With Q equal one, it would be a Gaussian, and that's a normal system. But that one, analytically and numerically, it's Q equal zero. So it satisfies a lot of things of thermodynamics. It's amazing how you can satisfy so well all the principles of thermodynamics, whereas this system is at zero. It satisfies thermodynamics. You cannot, you have not even dreamed about such things. Satisfying the thermodynamics at zero temperature. Here, another piece of elements. I'm trying to make a flash of some important results for you. Uh, this was done by an Italian here, Giulio Tempesta from Madrid, Complutense. And he established uh, using uh, uh, group theory, huge 
classes of entropies, and each class of entropy corresponds to a Dirichlet sum. And the simplest Dirichlet sum is the sum of the series in which all coefficients are equal to one. And that Dirichlet series has a famous name, zeta rima function. Well, the corresponding to zeta rima function is precisely this <coughs> cube. So there is a mathematical connection there that I'm pretty sure must be very rich in consequences, that this is a new result and we don't know what are the consequences. But whatever is related to Riemann zeta function, we can bet it has to be something important. So I'm waiting for somebody to explore this connection. Another point, a paper of Einstein in 1910. As you see, Einstein did not stop in 1905. He continued. In fact, he published like 140 papers. So in 1910, he said why he likes uh, Boltzmann entropy. And why he likes it? Because he used what we call here with Hans Albert from Vienna, the Einstein likelihood principle, <coughs> which said that if you have two independent systems, the likelihood function of this must factorize into the likelihood functions of A and B. Why this is important? Because science exists of that. Cardiology exists because a doctor can study the heart and something more independently of the position of the moon. Physics exists because Aristoteles and uh, Galileo could do experiments without looking at the positions of the stars. So science exists because you can decide to study a certain amount of degrees of freedom independently of all the other degrees of freedom. We heard in the, in the previous talk by her, she was presenting a lot of data. She was not telling us what was the condition, the position of the tides in Britannia. Well, she admitted that she could discuss what she did without entering into the degrees of freedom of the tides, tides in Britannia. Science exists. So, if you take the entropy of Boltzmann and you use this, the so-called reversal principle of Einstein, then W is the exponential of the entropy of A plus B, but the, this is the sum, and factor, finally it factorizes, and that's okay. So this is one of the reasons for which Einstein liked the expression of Boltzmann, because it satisfies this. But I want to show you here, too. you can check this in two minutes. If you use SQ, then W is the Q exponential of SQ. Just revert to this function. And the Q exponential, you put it here. SQ is SQ of A plus SQ of B plus the cross term. And you do this little calculation. And it also satisfies this principle for all the values of Q. Not only Q equal 1. So you can do science. You can do science with Q equal 1.23. No problem. Let me show you another piece of element which is important. Uh, these two theorems were done at the time I was spending a couple of years in the Santa Fe Institute, at the time that Kenrich Nelson here present, we were working together. So here you have a generalization of the sample limit theorem, and here you have the generalization of the Levy-Legien limit theorem. Uh, this was done with two mathematicians, Sabir, Sabir Umanov and Stanley Steinberg from the United States, and here with the same two plus the mythic Murray Gilman, who invented the word quarks and one of the many classes. So let me summarize these two theorems are. Here, if q equals 1, that means that you have n random variables that are independent, and you are summing them. If the variance is finite, the attractor is a Gaussian. 
and this is why there are so many Gaussians in nature. If the variance diverges plus a couple of mathematical delicacies, the attractor are then distributed. So these two theorems are in any good textbook of period probabilities. The new theorems are these two, when two is different from one. So that's a global correlation, a very specific global correlation. However, a very simple one in nature. So in this case, the attractors are Q Gaussians. In this case, the attractors are Q alpha stable distribution, distributions. So for this theorem, we also expect that in nature there will be many Q Gaussians. In the same way, there are many Gaussians. So let me illustrate this for you. And before going to a couple of illustrations, in fact, uh, I have chosen no illustration within economics because I was not there, I found yesterday and today there are so many economists in the room. If I had knew that, that perhaps I would have presented a couple of applications in economics. But it doesn't matter, somebody told me this morning, oh, if it is out of economics, it's, it's as welcome. It's perhaps even more welcome. So. But uh, before going to examples of Q Gaussians, let me tell you that Gibbs, in his book 1902, wrote that in treating the canonical distribution, equation 92 must be fine. And if you check equation 92, is what we call today the partition function. So the partition function must be fine. If not, the law of distribution becomes illusory. What law of distribution? His law of distribution. <laughs> Boltzmann Gibbs' law of distribution becomes illusory. <coughs> diverging partition function. And he gives an example of that. And uh, his example is gravitation. Right. Before question. Yes. Well, here you have a key Gaussian. Let me skip it. Let me show to you here. Uh, long range uh, interactions characterized by alpha. So alpha versus this dimension. You have from here, alpha equal b. Whatever is above extensive system, and here you must use Boltzmann entropy. And, but I'm talking about this region, which is the hard region where partition functions diverge. And there you have in particular Newtonian gravitation, d equal 3, alpha equal 1. For this system, we published uh, a few months ago a system like that, and everything is the same except in alpha, in these two numerical calculations from first principles. We only use here Newton's law, nothing else. Force equal mass dimension. Here you have long range interactions, here you have short range interactions. And this is the distribution of velocities. Here you have a beautiful Maxwellian distribution, called by Maxwell, doing a, a test for getting a job. A Maxwellian distribution, a Gaussian. But when you maintain everything except range of the forces, then you don't have a Gaussian. This is a Gaussian. You have a key Gaussian. Or very close to it. So this is the big difference. I have another example, but I will skip it. Let me show to you this one, which is a prediction that uh, Eric Lutz from Germany did in 2003. He said that cold atoms in dissipative optical lattices will not have Maxwellian distribution. They will have Q Gaussian distributions, and they predicted the value of Q. And three years later, it was indeed proved that in London by this group, and uh, there they proved it by Monte Carlo quantum calculations, but even better in the laboratory. So let me show to you in the laboratory. Here you have the distributions. Here you have the experimental data for cesium but you have also the analytical expression of two Gaussians. You don't see the difference because they coincide very well. And then check here, and Q is 1.4. They took again this discussion back a couple of, uh, one year ago, in 2013. Um, I will also skip to this, which is, uh, I like it very much, it relates to black holes. Your disposal for any discussion outside this moment. Uh, 
And let me jump to this. So here, you have this text that summarizes part of what, of what I was telling you. Here you have Boltzmann entropy, which is additive. Here you have SQ, which is non-additive. Here you have this delta, which is non-additive. If you have this class, you must use Boltzmann, because it is extensive. If you have this class, you must use SQ, because it is extensive. If you have this class, you must use S delta. So if you marry it to Boltzmann, Gibbs, and Shannon, you stay here until the death separates you. But uh, there is a better marriage. Marry thermodynamics, and then you stay here until the death separates you. So this is the two of the antithetic. Gibbs, choose this. So that's an And I will write to my last approximation, to my last application, which is high energy physics. So here you have the famous LHC in uh, CERN in Geneva. And uh, this particular group has about uh, uh, 2,500 scientists and engineering. So it's not surprising because if you want to make work 27 kilometers of electronics and the vacuum, you better have a whole army of people working on that, otherwise it's not going to work. So I want to show you some of their results. They have uh, dozens of interesting results, but these two appeared one year ago, and they are particularly impressive, done in, by this guy in the United States and Gregor Gibbs in Poland. And uh, here you have in log log the distribution of mo transverse momenta for different uh, detectors, CMS, Atlas, ALICE, etc. So you see here, they have from 10 to the power 1 to 10 to the power minus 14 or 15. You have 14 decades of data. 14 decades of experimental data. That's amazing. Uh, and uh, we took again very recently with the same people. And uh, <coughs> there you have the data, and there you have a single Q exponential with Q equal 1.15. This is Boltzmann. This is Q exponential. So here, there are two remarkable things. More, but not least, two. First of all, they are very talented, those experimentalists, that they can produce 14 precise data. It's very impressive. And there is another thing. The Q exponential follows the data along 14 decades. So 14 decades is so much that I said to myself, with what could I compare? Because I know what is 0 0.1, 0 0.001, but really I cannot have a feeling. 0 0.0000. So I decided to compare with Einstein expression of the energy. So log log, here you have momenta. This is Newton, pi squared divided by pi squared. And this is Einstein. And uh, I took the uppermost energy that is detectable on the planet Earth, which is the extreme energy cosmic ray, which is 10 to the power 8 teraelectrovolt. This is where Einstein expression of the energy is checked checked along 11 decades, which is enormous. But then you have the feeling, how much is it? 14 decades. It's more than that. And with that, if you want to know more, there are a lot of books. That one is particularly interesting because you can learn physics and Japanese. In <laughs> Got plenty of uh, uh, philosophical insights, not just uh, scientific analysis. Question time uh, for about five minutes. Who goes first? Uh, <coughs> thank you very much for the talk. It's extremely interesting. The, uh, there is the economic uh, 
uh, data that might be quite relevant to this. For example, if you plot <coughs> firm profit rates or firm growth rates um, in uh, cross-section data, uh, you, you don't see Gaussian. Case. You see yes, you see Kent or uh, Laplace, what are sometimes called Laplace distribution. So, tent? like a tent. It, in other words, the the oh. errors lie along uh, straight lines yes. from the uh, yes. mode. Um, because you went through things very rapidly, I was just wondering: is that a Q Gaussian for some Q? Um, these subotene distributions, or what does the Q Gaussian yeah. exactly look like? I would have to see the corner of the thing here, yeah. because Q Gaussians are analytical in x equals zero, they are round. If it is non analytical, it's not a Q Gaussian, it's something else. However, the tail. Non-analytic cannot be a Gaussian. Because that's hard to know statistically. Oh, yeah. Well, sometimes they can measure that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is really mind-boggling for a naive person like me because we just work in addition and entropy. Uh, I was thinking about uh, throughout your talk that we use entropy. Uh, in the statistics for a particular reason, not necessarily to describe a system or a data, but as uh, for, for a couple of purposes, that how, how far we are from uniformity, for example. And also, is, are there uh, some constraints in the data that we can maximize that? Yes. Now, uh, when we go to the further system, are these things become meaningful and operative or, or not? In fact, uh, I have a remark about that, that I was almost putting the question to previous speakers in the morning, because some of them dedicated some attention to the constraints. Somebody asked, how many constraints do you have? I said, yeah, I have 200 constraints, etc. I didn't even mention that you have it, because you have the functional the constraints. The constraints are just a, a simple factor of theory of information with some robust information. The, constra the constraints would be the average value of something and the width of something, something you could talk about by phone. A friend calls you, listen, they are offering me spectrometers and they have from ultraviolet to hard uh, gamma which one I must buy. So by phone, you can listen to me. The scale is this. So buy that one. Constraints are of this kind. And whether they are very precise or not precise is a width. The most important thing is not so much the constraints, but the principle that you are using to optimize whatever you want. So in this example, the entropy, the functional, and the functional, Sorry, yeah. Very fascinating talk. Thank you very much. I was I was wondering, um, you've been publishing with Murray Gelman. Murray Gelman also works a lot with Omogoro complexity. I'm a computer scientist, so we have Shannon information, we have Omogoro complexity. Yeah. They tie in very well uh, at some theoretical level, and there's a lot we don't understand about the interplay. So um, Omogoro complexity is another kind of theory about a certain form of entropy, and it's different from Shannon. Now your theory is also, it goes about global interaction between systems, uh, but in, in a different way. Kolmogorov complexity is more about computational interaction exactly. within systems. Yes. Have you any idea about the, the relation between your theory about entropy, Shannon entropy, and the relation between Kolmogorov complexity? Is there any, any perspective of having a, a better entropy model yes. for computational systems? Uh, well, yes. you can think we of We can talk lengthily about that, yeah? but uh, shortly. Kolmogorov complexity is not really what it is. 
the Kolmogorov complexity does not really take into account the deep correlations within the system. So if I tell you uh, in the Spanish, pared, which means wall, no, let, it, let us do it in English, children and child. Yeah. So child and children. So if I tell you two, you already know is children. Mm -hmm. If I tell you one, I know, you know it's child. How do you know that it is one child, but it is two, three, four children? How do you know that? Because you know English, and English is plenty of correlations, like all languages, so you know English grammar, and you know that it is one child and uh, two, three children. So if I'm uh, transmitting information to you in, on an email or something, I really do not need to say two children. I could just say two child. Because I know that you know English and you will complete. Mm -hmm. You know that it is two children. So you are using correlations there, the correlations of the English languages. Mm -hmm. These kind of effects are essential to what I told you. They are less essential to Kolmogorov complexity. Mm -hmm. okay. I think we need to talk I think about that's with the advice of the family. <laughs> okay. Children, uh, we can call it for lunch because it's 12 or 5. I thank the organizers for inviting me and uh, it's a long paper so I have to be really careful from the morning I've been thinking uh, how to present in 15 minutes and so let's move on. Um, this work, joint work with my colleague Roman Payne at Albany and uh, Simon Sheng, who is sitting here, who teaches uh, here. And uh, we have been working on this topic for some time now. Now, let me uh, basically give out the basic uh, message of the paper in case I run out of time. Uh, there are five points I have to make. One is that uh, suppose uh, there's a policymaker, and the policymaker has a whole bunch of experts who give that person forecast. And uh, this is a federal uh, Fed chair. And typically, a uh, number of forecasts, uh, the, the policymaker would make an uh, average or get a consensus forecast out of it. And there's a huge literature uh, following Bates and Granger forecast combination. So, uh, and, and so that literature, huge, more than 1,000 papers have come out of that literature. And what we are doing, we are asking, what should be the uncertainty of the combined forecast? That's a basic question. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and that's where disagreement comes in. Uh, that's one of the points uh, that we make in the paper uh, forcefully. Uh, now, in Granger Betts uh, framework, uh, typically you have forecast and you combine following uh, uh, performance weights by looking at the forecast. Makes sense. But the interesting thing there, which has not been noted that well, is that the implied uncertainty of the forecast there is the variance of the average. And what it means is that the forecast discord or the disagreement has no role there. So, for example, you think that that's funny because there are so many papers and how come nobody thought about it? The interesting part is that uh, Ed Limers say specific and such people look at the book, he had disagreement as part of Bayesian model way back in 1978. But so the literature moved, uh, say Bayesian model in one way, the Granger based forecasting community has gone one way, nobody really looked at each other actually, the implication of this. That, that's the amazing part. And there's some other literature accounting and so on. Uh, what happens is that in Granger Bates uh, framework will show that the variance of the average uh, variance of the average is basically determined by the variance of the aggregate shock. So there's no role for idiosyncratic errors in that uncertainty. And that creates a problem. For example, let me give you a very simple example, and that's where our work started. Is that suppose a policymaker has 10 experts. In one year, they get 10 forecasts. Another year, they get another 10 forecasts. Some of the mean of the two forecasts are same, right? And suppose that variances of the individual answer are same. 
But in one year, suppose they disagreed a lot. Their point forecast varied a lot, all right? Now the question is, should the policymaker take that average value, which is same between the two, two years, having the same uncertainty? Now, obviously, intuitively say no, and there have been statements there. People like David Lindley and, and uh, others have said that this is kind of all part of it, and, and, but uh, it just went on with that uh, literature. Now, what happens here is that, uh, and this has been elaborated lately, See, the superiority of average forecast comes from the Jensen's equality. And that is that what the results say is that under certain assumptions, that the loss of the mean is always less than the mean of the losses. Okay? Very simple result. Now, what is less appreciated is you add. Now, this is used all over the places in bagging and boosting. That fundamental result is used to sort of, uh, you know, sort of accelerate the convergence and so on. But the difference is that now we ask, one is less than the other. What's the difference? What's the wage? Wage is the disagreement in the point forecast. Okay? So if you argue that disagreement should be part of forecast uncertainty, then this advantage of pooling and a forecast for improvement, a lot of people say, if you look at the machine learning literature, they also pool forecast. And what they do is they talk a concept of forecast for adaptation, that you have a whole bunch of forecasts that you're doing online, and you try to adapt to the best in real time. You don't try to improve everybody. In forecast combination, a la Granger Bates, you try to improve on everybody's forecast. I'll give you some, uh, some it's magical, sounds magical, and our point is that, uh, that it is just that, uh, that, that the uncertainty should be a lot bigger than actually what it is. So this is the basic message of the paper, then we do some asymptotic theory here, and also some examples, I mean, uh, illustrations. Uh, so, you know, Bank of England has been giving uh, forecast uncertainty these bands, and they sometimes look at the outruns, you know, how, how do they look in terms of the forecast band. If you see that, you're beginning to see this lot of outruns are hitting on the, on, the, on the ceiling, and you see there's something wrong. There could be the band maybe smaller or shorter than uh, uh, it should be. And you know, I like this David, David Draper, who it, it has a Bayesian a model averaging paper. And that paper it was really first time they, he brought in the role of disagreement in the forecast answer, very explicitly. Even though implicitly it has been there almost in every uh, paper since 1978 in Weimar's paper. Now, what I was telling you is that there are a couple of strands of literature, it's, it's funny, it happens. Um, in, in, in the sciences and economics and so on. Uh, in economics literature, starting with Zanroitz and Lambrose paper, uh, you know, JP paper, disagreement, and since then that literature has a whole bunch of papers uh, that deal with uncertainty of forecast, all right? Uh, again, a panel of forecast in S. Then you have, in accounting and finance literature, it's a huge literature there, starting from 1992 and so on, because you know in accounting, disagreement is very important because that's where the traders trade. If they do not disagree, nobody will sell to buy somebody. So that's a huge literature. This literature also has been talking similar things, but they never saw each other. You never see Benny Jennings or Baron Kim Lehman Stevens paper, it has been referred possibly 2,000 times, maybe not cited. But never you'll see that they're referring to Zanowitz's paper. It's as simple as that. Even though they're talking very similar things, all right? Uh, then you have the forecast combination letters to uh, Bates and Granger, and a whole bunch of papers uh, following that, a whole bunch of survey articles there. Again, uh, if you look at the, 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 uh, the model averaging literature, really has not represented this literature at all. It's kind of interesting. And of course, here there's a whole bunch of paper, and, and with the latest uh, paper by, you know, Emisano and Giewicki, uh, and there are one or two more papers in econometric reviews and so on, and where this is the new generation of, uh, you know, Bayesian model averaging. Uh, this thing. and I'll show you that what we are saying is consistent with their basic uh, uh, derivations there also. Now we start off with a very simple model where you have I individuals, uh, T is the target here, and H horizons, okay? And you have this error, A is the actual, F T is the forecast, and the error you decompose into a factor model, 
So you have, uh, these are the individual errors, you know, biases, this is the aggregate shock. So the idea is that when you're making forecasts for a long period of time, uh, the, the errors actually decumulate as you go towards the target, right? It gets less and less because over the whole period there's a total aggregate shock, unforeseen shock, and that only gets less and less as you go near to the target. And that is being represented by that, that uh, moving average error there. And epsilon ith is a simple uh, idiosyncratic error. Mm, uh, it could be uh, Lucas's island story, it could be models, it could be individuals, okay? Very general. So, uh, so those are idiosyncratic errors having their own variances. And now, we make some assumptions here, I'm not going through this in the paper, we basically follow the latest uh, panel data econometrics uh, where uh, this is an assumption of MED. Uh, uh, it's, it's a large T, large N asymptotic, simultaneous asymptotic C in the paper. And now, if you try to look at, uh, say, in X post sense, uh, the total forecast uncertainty uh, when you have uh, errors, you can decompose total errors, total source errors, into those two components. Huh? And you see the first component is really the average error squared. Okay? That's a common error to everybody. Here you have to deal with this because a lot of when they, there are 30 forecasters, they have common information, so a lot of the forecasts will have a common uh, component in it. So you factor that out, and the last component, uh, it's a tautological thing, is the, uh, is the variance uh, among uh, on the point forecast. And for all individuals, you, you can decompose the total error system. And, um, and, and so what happens in this uh, Granger and Bates is that they set up the loss function, and this has been explained uh, in a number of papers by Graham Elliott and, uh, and the survey article by Timmerman and so on, is that the loss function in Granger Bates is that you minimize by choosing weights, and, uh, and then you can decompose this way. And what happens is that the way that simply works is that one way is squared, and for large n, just it vanishes. And then the, the, the whole error is a function of the various the aggregate shock, and there's nothing else there, right? It washes away. Uh, uh, now, in the model averaging literature, uh, you can rewrite it, and we have this in the paper also. So the first component there, you see lambda square, uh, sigma square lambda is the variance of the aggregate shock. And some error, uh, the variance due to uh, systematic error can be part of it. Second term is the variance coming from idiosyncratic shocks. And the last one is if individuals have systematic biases, this will be variance that, that's part of it. All right? and, and this is what, uh, and Isano gave it these three terms called as intrinsic within model extensing and between model extensive variances. It's the same thing, all right? Now, uh, in our context, because we are looking at survey data and so on, and we basically, you can call it as a uncertainty audit. Okay, you have the total sum squares. You see, you attribute to different components. And what you see in our context, this is SPF survey data that a lot of people economists use. And there are eight quarter head forecast, uh, fixed target forecast. And, um, and what you see is that the, the aggregate shock you see the relative component, the relative part falls over horizon, but the idiosyncratic errors actually keep on increasing. And that's a big component of the total small squares. Okay? So you have to uh, deal with it, but as I told you in our context, the systematic individual biases are really negligible. Because these are professional forecasters, they just don't keep on making forecasts, otherwise they'd be out of business. Right? So, uh, so that's the way uh, it goes. Now, so, if, uh, we show asymptotically that the limit of the average for Granger base is uh, is a variance of shock. And now, in this context, let me just say an interesting part. Granger Geo had a paper where they uh, they had this uh, Taylor rule. If some people may be interested, this is called a Taylor rule, where inflation rate and GDP potential GDP growth conditions what the Fed would do in terms of target interest rate. And there's a paper by Kozyaki. Uh, who showed uh, that it, he had, she had a whole bunch of models. It's a classic case of model averaging. 
And she estimated this model with different values, very similar values of inflation and GDP, and finds this variable is the loading load factor on the inflation rate. It shows it varies a lot uh, between the set. And Ranger Jew picks up this example and says, look, if I do my averaging, according to their formula, what you have is that, the, and they do baggy bootstrap aggregating. Uh, you know how they did it. But what happens is this, that, that the standard error you see here, even the individual models, that the parameters have finishes at a point, in point, point, and so on, if the bagging, you get 0 0.04. So rather than having the average variance as around 0.2, somehow it gives, and this is what the Granger Bates formula gives. So dramatically, this variance looks very small, looks very impressive, actually. And if you look at it, is that this plus minus uh, uh, interval includes only three of those estimates, okay? So obviously this is highly un underestimated. And when I look carefully, I realize the way the bagging was conducted creates the problem in the sense that this uh, over repeated uh, alpha sampling, because they're done independently, are as in, are zero actually. So what happens is the main term, which leaves us at sigma squared lambda is not there, okay? Zero by design. And this, of course, at n sense unity would go to zero in fact, all right? As a dot case. But for that sample, they get a value of 0 0.04. Okay? And that gives you exactly the value that the Granger based formula is. So the point is that if these are underestimated, highly underestimated. And uh, another little example is that recently, there is a in Federal Reserve, FOMC, they have been mandated to supply standard error or uncertainty of forecast. <coughs> Members. And there's a paper by Rob Schneider and Thunder who actually have given this benchmark uncertainty for use by individual uh, banks. And interestingly, that their estimate is this. And what we are suggesting is this. And there's a subtle difference between the two. All right? The difference is if you look at as if it limits, the Rob Schneider's true difference estimate goes here, and we get this. And interestingly, that if the individual variances are homogeneous, that is, the variances are not heteroscedastic across individuals, they are equivalent. Right? But if they're different, then by the same genesis equality, this estimate will always be less than this estimate. So it is a built-in underestimation in Ralph Schneider and Tulip's paper also. But this paper is important because this is cited in FOMC meeting all the time. So this is another example that we give you the paper. I stop, uh, and uh, if any questions, I'll be happy to answer. And I have a full paper also I can send you to. Thank you. I have a comment that I'm going to talk about in my own presentation, that uh, starting with the arithmetic mean as a way to combine forecasts is very problematic because probabilities are multiplicative, not additive. And the starting point has to be the geometric mean for any of this analysis. And that's where the fundamental problems come in with overestimating forecasts. And so um, I think that, and, and it comes from the fact that, you know, we translate to the log of the probabilities in a little form. Remember, there's no probability here. It's a point for that's a, you're, that it's a percentage, right? No, it's a point forecast. Yeah, it, percentage, yeah. Okay. Percent, percent. Or it could be anything. Well, yes, but if it's a forecast in which you're saying forecasting percentage of something, and then that... Not, it could be just a absolute value also. It could be GDP. Okay. But most okay, well, so the, that point, fair enough. But I... I, I, I see a point, though. Yeah. yeah. It is, it is, if it's probabilities, then you have to be careful be about using this the thing I had the impression that at a certain moment you did the hypothesis of IID. In many realistic cases, that hypothesis is not satisfied. So what do you do? 
The cumulative shocks are, of course, moving average processes, the built-in huge correlation <coughs> in, in, the, in the areas due to the commonality of the individual shocks. <coughs> but for identification purposes, the indi individual shocks have to be assumed to be independent. I'll explain identify. So, uh, you know, the individual shocks. They are independent? Yeah. Indi oh, no, you are assuming they are. Yeah. Are they? Yeah, but you cannot identify otherwise. Sorry? You cannot identify this thing, what you call You cannot separately identify it. But it could be. So our second speaker is Hassan Sufi. Shall I continue this part? <laughs> Well, in the meantime, thank you very much. Oh, oh. oh. and thank you a lot for organizing this nice conference. Uh, <coughs> okay. So, uh, <coughs> what I'm presenting here is part of a thesis of uh, Mehdi Shreja there in the economics department and business school. Uh, working together on this. Uh, it's a long talk. You can stop me anyone, any time you want. Okay, so at least I will tell you what are included here. Motivation, now the motivation here, specific motivation is the survey of professional forecasters, run by, which I'll talk about that a little bit. I'll talk about some current practice on, on this problem. Uh, I will present information to for, for a change on the information theory framework that you can do, and that framework goes beyond this motivation. For example, it also applies to model averaging, and so on. And if there's time, I talk about the application to SF, uh, SDH, and the dynamic models of uncertain process. Okay. Now, uh, for some of us that are not in economics. I learned that, that each quarter the Federal Reserve Banks and various banks just correct, you know, send a survey and ask uh, forecasters not only for the point forecast, but also the distribution of the uh, of the economic variable like GDP or GDP deflator on a grid. Okay? Uh, the respondent provide for point forecast as well as a distribution. Okay, uh, then uh, what we found out was a completely a lack of general framework of how to deal with this problem. Um, often uh, it is only based on variance and the variance of the forecast, sometimes the variance of the uh, of those distributions, averaging, and so on. All right, uh, and of course, all those assumes that because it is forecast, by definition, nobody knows what is the distribution of the variable actually being forecasted. So there is an additional source of uncertainty there which has not been taken into account. Okay? Now, uh, this, this just describes a little bit that, uh, you know, ASA started that and then MBR, and then MBR, and then Basically, bank, Federal Bank of Philadelphia has taken over. All right, we will, you know, if we have time, we talk about the GD, GDP deflation. This is a sort of distribution that they survey for. So it just gives them some grid, and then they will answer, give them some probability. The idea is that how to use all those probabilities are used to measure a certain. All right, uh, uh, as previous speakers though, a great deal of uh, ideas are based on variance as a measure of uncertainty, okay? Uh, and that is measured variously. One sum is that, okay, now take the individual variances and, and then average them out, and then, of course, how to measure the individual variances based on the grid, there are a variety of 
can sum and then aggregate them. Sum aggregate the distribution first and then calculate the variance of that. And again, the same type of problem. Uh, tremendous amount of attention has been given to this de decomposition, which is the relationship between the variance of the individuals, the forecast point, and the variance of the aggregate uh, distribution, and all kinds of things, including Lahiri has done a very good analysis of variance terminology put up there, basically. And the most, as I said, I'm, I think I'm the only statistician here that's by training and degree, at least, and everybody is a statistician. I couldn't believe this when I saw that, okay, now, somebody is taking the variance of the forecast, point forecast, which has nothing to do with those distributions, subtracting from the variance of the aggregate distribution, and then using the remainder to be the variance of some of the variances. And when that didn't work, which is because mathematically that is not the condition there, and then basically, so I'll be true out the data that does not satisfy that. Okay. Uh, Shannon entropy has been used in, in this uh, context, and also they have recognized that the Shannon entropy, you know, you can get between the aggregate and disaggregate, you can decompose it. The second term, but they said very specifically, they said it doesn't measure the disagreement, which in fact, that's one of the best measure of disagreement. On the other hand, a growing line of literature developed by Sims, or initiated by Sims, on the theory of the rational inattention, that how much we can remember, you know, he just says, I read this, what I, as an economic agent, you know, I can remember, and then put us the information constraint. Now, somebody in a discussion of a paper said, maybe this disagreement can be related to that, and we do that. <coughs> Okay, now the general framework. The general framework is we have an economic forecast. It could be a person, an economist, like Amos, or it can be an econometric model, like something develops an econometric model, a regression model, or something. So when I, at least in the general theory, when I say the forecaster, the forecast, I'm not talking about the person. Okay? Now, a forecaster learn about why the variable that to be forecasted in an environment. Now, environment could be, for example, environment could be uh, uh, just a survey, get the news, and they answer that. Federal, you know, hints and that, and the president say something. Or environment could be the model space, either Bayesian model space you do with the model averaging, or the satellite regression with random regression. And this framework will work into the utility of the forecast distributions that give us that, and also along the lines of the same theory of rational inattention. I will talk about that. Okay, so in the picture, so we have an environment X, which produces economic forecasters which are conditional distribution on X. Each one will have an uncertainty measure, whatever uncertainty measure you want to pick up. So you have an individual uncertainty measures there. And then you can aggregate those uncertainty measure to be the measure of uncertainty about that distribution. On the other hand, you can aggregate first and then compute the uncertainty measure there. These two, there's an information provides. The difference between these two provides some sort of information. And again, that's mainly by Jensen and Nicole, but I'm not going to the technical. On the other hand, you can look, measure the disagreement through the disagreement of the distribution between individual forecasters 
and the consensus. So we have a disc discrepancy measure there, become any divergence measure. And then, if these measures are compatible, which will show that some of the measures are perfectly compatible, compatible, and some are compatible. And which measures are compatible and which information measures are not compatible, that's a mathematical question that we are studying now. Okay. So this agreement generates information. This is the idea. All right? Um, uncertainty function, we have summarized that as a two. Has to be concave, so just an inequality would work. And the reference distribution should be uniform because that's where prediction or constructing intervals or whatever is the widest. Prediction is most difficult. Information is an expected uncertainty <coughs> reduction. So Amos was giving all kinds of information, type of thing. What does it mean? In my mind, information is uncertainty, expected uncertainty reduction. Right? So uncertainty without using the conditional, without using the environment, without using the model, and expected uncertainty when you use the model. All right? Divergence, five minutes. Okay. Divergence, on the other hand, is just basically a measure of discrepancy between the two. And this agreement is defined as an expected divergence. All right? Both measures, in a sense, that if the divergence or discrepancy between the conditional and a marginal distribution, so compatibility of the uncertainty function and divergence is that they are in some sense move the same direction. All right, I'm not going to go through this, but when you go to the Shannon entropy and from back Leibler, they are perfectly divergent because the two are perfectly equal. And where does Sims theory comes Sims theory comes from that the fact that the mutual information between X and Y can be written also as a mutual information between Y and X. The expected uncertainty about the environment and how much it is captured by, say, a given forecast. Well, this is this shows this on a very simple picture that this is, they say, uncertainty. Now we have two. This prediction is higher or lower. Just make it very, very simple. And then it will come here that what is the information generated there? So as you go to the zeros or ones, they disagree further because one saying it is going with a probability of very high probability, it's going to go down. The other one going high probability is going up. But then information. Now, what type of information? Information is that exactly is that you need to look at the individual forecasts rather than looking at an aggregate level. Since I have my five minutes sign there, this shows that the picture. Uh, I'm going to escape and just go something that Izzy and Jeff like very much, and that is Renai information and Renai divergence. Now, if you look at that for with the Gaussian case, you see that they are compatible, but not perfectly compatible. That means it doesn't give you the exact utility, but as, as the disagreement increases, the information also increases in that sense. Uh, I have two more minutes. That's good that I have more than I want to show. Uh, OK, uh, going back. About the moment condition, you know, also in the literature comes that okay, now the moments of those forecast distributions are more, in some sense, more reliable than the forecast distribution themselves. That's why they use the mean and the variance and so on. Now, the maximum entropy allows you to go through that and get the higher moments as well. Only interesting, I think this is just a basic results here that you will see that if we look at it from this perspective, we see that really the uncertainty, that means the variance of the forecast between the point forecast 
is really a component of the disagreement, information disagreement. Not the all. That's exactly what the what Professor Lahiri was speaking in the, the last slide. So they can have perfectly, for example, this term can be perfectly zero. That means everybody agrees, but there is still disagreement. Because, and then, in such a cases, what should the decision maker do? In that cases, we are, haven't worked on that, but that goes into the clustering. Right? Is that can you find a representative, a, a, mo a model average which really the models are clustering along? Is there a majority, in a sense, in a majority of economic forecasters would agree the disagreement between the, them and low? You can use the average distribution or average forecast as a representative of the whole. And there are examples that I have a copy of papers I can send. Thank you. and this is for something different. Um, blame Amos for this invitation. There are no equations here. It's a philosophy talk. Why Amos decided to have a philosophy talk at this time of the day, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> now, so, but I thank him anyway for uh, allowing me to make a fool of myself. Uh, so this, this is basically a Monty Python moment. Um, what I want to sell to you in this uh, 15 minutes is two ideas in a book will be at the end, so it will be obvious. Uh, the two ideas are the following. One, what is sitting tight, uncertainty can be a good thing. Well, not after previous two talks, but 
so I'll try to uh, show you what I mean by that. Uh, and therefore, uh, that uh, it follows from that that sometimes information is a bad thing. Uh, second, uh, that the morphology or the format uh, that the flow of uncertainty can take in a society is where the real battle, political, economic, and social, is going to be fought uh, in any advanced information society, this one included. So not so much about the flow of information, but the flow of uncertainty is where uh, entities like Google are, are really uh, trying to make uh, a difference. So, first of all, a little bit of vocabulary. As usual, I'll tell you uh, what I mean by information and uncertainty. I said that will be very quick because we do have only 14 minutes now. Uh, and then what I mean by the design of information flows, again, very quickly. And since I had to have something that could look even vaguely scientific, I decided to call the third point lambda model. You will see that that is a joke. Uh, it's a philosophy joke, so it's not that funny. Uh, but you will see that it is a joke. Uh, conclusion, the politics go uncertainty. So this is uh, what I mean by information, and it can't, can't be any more trivial than this. It takes a philosopher to find uh, problems with this. Information is a question plus an answer. Uh, I mean a particular kind of information, semantic, factual kind of information that we have been talking about in this conference. Not, for example, the rings uh, concentric of a, a tree. That is a different kind of information which is not in question. Not a file like a music file, which is information, but it's not the kind of information I'm talking about here. I'm talking about what you had for breakfast this morning. Now, if that is the case, uh, then Alice is informed if she has the Q and the A. That's what I mean by Alice being informed. Alice as in philosophy of physics, Alice, that kind of Alice, the Bob, etc. Alice is uncertain if she has only the quest. She doesn't have the answer. That's what I mean by uncertain. That's why I disagree with the previous speaker. I cannot define in my own model uh, information as expected degrees uh, of uncertainty because I define uncertainty in terms of information. And uh, philosophers try to avoid uh, circular reasonings like that. So if you define information as uncertainty, some kind, then you define uncertainty as some kind of lack of information, you haven't made any step forward. So I shall not try that. She's ignorant if she doesn't even have the question. And we are in the country where a politician at some point used that, uh, you know, the, the unknown, unknown, etc. So I don't have to explain this. But it was a good point, actually. So uh, here is Alice. That's a, a very dangerous Alice. But Alice has to be there, not only for the philosophy of physics, but also because I come from Oxford. Um, so there are things that she knows, uh, there's a monster hiding. That's why she's afraid. She knows that there's a monster hiding there. There are things that she knows that she does not know. Where the monster is, for goodness sake. And, but that's why she's looking for it. Uh, this Alice actually kills monsters. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very weird Alice. It's a strange popular game. So she's uncertain about the location of the monster, but she knows that it's there and it has to be found. Uh, third, uh, there are things that she does not even know that she does not know. For example, there's a magic sword that can kill the monster. Uh, in fact, she doesn't even know that that is available. Now, there's a whole little thing that one can do in terms of comparing two individuals, Alice and Bob, and the differences in what they know, what they don't know, what they are uncertain about, and what their ignorance is. But we will not go there. What we go uh, to is a uh, oversimplified little analysis of what that all this means. So suppose that all available information is the Q plus the A, uh, but within that particular space, all the information available, imagine the computer game, uh, Alice has access to questions and answers. That's uh, information. I'm just repeating what I said before. Alice is uncertain, and that's when she has access to the questions, but not to the answers. We're still within the same space. And uh, then all that is the kind of information available to her, not the sort of uh, stuff that uh, is within her reach. Then uh, she does not have access either to the questions or to the answers, and that is a ignorance. Back to point number one that I made. Uh, you don't have to agree with me, we just have to share the vocabulary. If you don't like it, uh, that's not a matter of disagreement, it's a matter of uh, uh, semantics. So, end of the introduction uh, of the taxonomy and the vocabulary. There are simple context in which Alice is just answered. She has this binary thing. She has the question, she doesn't have the answer, end of the story. But there are many more complex uh, contexts where she is uncertain because the system has been designed in such a way as to keep her uncertain. The system has been designed in such a way so that she has only the question. She cannot have the answers. So the logic of information design is also a logic of the design 
of information flows that regulate uh, uncertainty. This seems to be a bit too philosophical, especially at this time of the day, but I have plenty of examples now to illustrate what I mean. And that's where the joke starts, uh, you know, the Lambda model. It's not a model of any kind. It's just that I realized that I had to have three people, Alice, uh, Bob, and Christy, uh, and uh, it happens that all the little information flows of uncertainty that I'm going to illustrate with you now uh, actually had that particular schema, uh, that sort of uh, tripartite uh, space, which, of course, looks pretty much like a lambda. So that's all the lambda you're going to get. <laughs> so model number one, uh, Turing test. Everybody knows about the Turing test, but just in case you forgot, uh, that's when Alice is on uh, in a single room. Uh, and she has to interrogate uh, these two elements here, say Bob and a computer, and she can't tell the difference between the two. Now, why uh, the lambda? Well, because there is no communication as far as the relevant question is concerned. Who is who? She doesn't know that it's Bob, and she doesn't know that it's, it's a computer. <laughs> and they're not talking to each other either. So the lines here, which mean she is uncertain, she does not, she had the question. Who is the computer and who is uh, Bob? Doesn't get the answer. She does not have answer to the particular uh, answer question. So that's why she has to uh, ask a lot of questions to try to guess who is who. So the black line means I have the question, but I don't have the answer. And that's what we design. That's exactly what Turing, the genius, designed in order to make sure that this particular kind of uncertainty would be fruitful. Interestingly, uh, you can do exactly the same. In fact, if you look only at the picture, you wouldn't know whether we were talking about uh, Turing test or Rolls' veil of ignorance. Why? Well, because that, uh, in this case, uh, look at the pair. That's important. Um, this is Alice, but Alice now and Alice in the future. Uh, Alice now does not know whether she's going to be blonde Alice or red hair Alice. Or in other words, she does not know what is going to happen to her position, if she decides one way or another with respect to a policy now, which will be implemented by the society in which she lives. This is what Rawls declared, not to call a veil of ignorance, and according to him and many others, partly myself too, that helps to be a little bit more careful when you take decisions. If the decision is, well, let me decide about who's going to get the biggest slice of that cake, and you don't know whether you're going to be the one who actually does get the uh, biggest or not, you're probably going to go 50-50. So that's trivializing the very basic idea. But what is important here is that, again, question, who am I going to be on the receiving side, good or bad? Well, total uncertainty, but a good point, a good kind of uncertainty. You want to make a society such that that uncertainty is kept so that Alice or your uh, ordinary uh, guy voting would be kept on her toes when voting for one policy or another. Well, the Byzantine generals, impossible coordination. If you had done some epistemic logic, uh, now you know that actually there is some communication between the generals up the hill. If they combine their forces, they will defeat Alice, who is in the valley. Uh, unfortunately, no matter how much communication they have, uh, the theory proves that they cannot coordinate uh, it with each other 100% all the time, necessarily, etc. Why is this interesting? Well, again, uh, same, uh, same idea. Uh, there is the same kind of uh, uncertainty down here, and uh, the communication is only between the top two. Collusion, you got the picture. The successful coordination of the two nasty guys on top and the uncertainty of poor Alice. Informational bias. Uh, this is another case of, uh, in which you have the same design of information and uncertainty, but in this case, uh, Alice has only access to this particular side of the information uh, space, not to this other side that is where she's going to go. And we could have pretty much the same picture, but confirmation bias, uh, it doesn't matter what it's meant for, right, of course, uh, would be working in the same way. The observer effect, and I think I'm in the right place here, for uncertainty principle, this is stretching it. Uh, I just thought it was nice to put it there. Uh, and I'm happy to be told that I'm um, stretching it a little bit too far away. Uh, but if you observe A, measures the electron, etc., and the spin, and the two are, uh, of course, uh, mutually uh, influencing each other, then uh, that level of uncertainty uh, declares that if you have basically access to one side 
other creature, this type of creature will influence the other side of the permission space. Now, a classic for the economists among us. The prisoner's dilemma, again, same lambda. In this case, uh, Alice has access to both guys, but the good guys don't talk to each other. So, another case in which we design this particular space so that some kind of uncertainty is left. In this case, the uncertainty between one and two unable to answer each other's question, are you or are you not going to the train? And a public announcement. Uh, you may have noticed that I tried to uh, remove every bit of the lambda one at a time. In this case, public announcement for the logic, uh, logician among us, is a case in which everybody knows that everybody knows that everybody knows they are P. So, conclusion. I'm doing decently well. Yes. Two minutes. The politics of uncertainty. Um, I just tried to convince you of a couple of things. One, that uncertainty can be a good thing. Think about uh, uh, the secrecy of your vote. You want to keep that uh, uh, to yourself. Now, in a liberal society, you have this distinction. And as simple to uh, use as a criterion to ident identify all over the world whether society is liberal or not. Every question is allowed. That is a liberal society. However, not every question allowed needs to be answered. And that is the criteria. So you find pla places in which every question is allowed uh, and you know, as also all answers need to be provided. That total transparency, some sort of a prison kind of idea, well, we don't want to get down that way. We want to give some privacy, etc. There are societies in which uh, some questions are not even allowed. So uh, normally we think that liberal society like this one and the one back home uh, in the UK are societies where there is no constraint on questioning, so uncertainty is free for all. I can ask any question, but your business is my uncertainty. In other words, your business, privacy, means that my question is allowed and it also has to remain unanswered. So the politics of uncertainty and give societies a wash with information. Power is exercised not about which question can be asked, I said, no, any question should be able uh, to be asked, but about what answers can be received. Transparency, privacy, right to be forgotten, freedom of speech, ownership rights, these are all issues that have got to do with answers, not with questions. I should be able to search for illegally uh, illegal material online. I should be able to uh, look for uh, child pornography as long as I don't get it. Uh, that's fine. The morphology of the flows of information, therefore, is the morphology of uncertainty. Uh, that's where the real uh, uh, stake uh, is. Uh, just ask Google. And those who control uncertainty control reality. And that's the last point I need to make. Um, good old days, the territory matter much more than a map. The information we had was more important than the very fuzzy, patchy maps that we had. So you want to, to control the territory, the library, the books, uh, etc. Now, uh, we have reached a stage where, in fact, there's so much uh, information that what really matters is the map. Without the map, all the stuff is almost irrelevant. In fact, if you erase bits from the map, the stuff is non-existent. Uh, and that's what Google is concerned about when you have the right to be forgotten. Now, in those contexts, when you are emphasizing the map, as opposed to the territory, the map may actually come with holes, places where you have questions, but you don't have the answers. Now, whoever controls which questions can be answered by whom is controlling not just the map, but also the territory. So in three steps, no longer the territory of the map, and not just the map, but who actually shapes the morphology of the map, is the guy in power tomorrow. And that is the message that I wanted to uh, leave you with. I promise a third point, a seventh point, and that's the book where you find some of the stuff. Thank you. Fascinating. But uh, if, if I, uh, I, I think that everything boils down to your primitive concept of basic definition. You can come with, uh, with a completely opposite conclusion. So, normally, I disagree, but normally, when you ask people what's the value of information, they will tell you the value of information is 
decreasing uncertainty. Whatever you want to describe as uncertainty, I think that sometimes that, that is not a value, it's a disvalue. In other words, the decrease of, inf of uncertainty can be harmful. We need to be careful. Not every time that you accumulate information and you decrease uh, uncertainty, you're doing a good thing. So I don't think it's a semantic, I don't, it's not an Oxford English dictionary, it's not a matter of definition. It's roughly dealing with the concept that we have around and thinking that, now we come from 25 centuries of starvation for information, so we think, oh, it's good, it's good, the more the better. No, we have to be on diet. <laughs> Sometimes we have to be careful about how much information we throw out and how much uncertainty we decrease because there are thresholds below which it's like a, a little bit like uh, um, inflation. There's a little bit of inflation which is a good thing. There's a, a little bit of uh, unemployment that has to be in the system. There's a little bit of uncertainty that has to be left within the epistemic game. So that's what I was trying to argue. Yeah. Okay. I agree with what you said now, but I think it wasn't an answer to my question. The question was that I think the basic way to discussion off to over the coffee and thank all our speakers again. Yep. Speaker, but it's fortunate that we have more time for Nate and Ariel. So, Nate uh, looks pretty uh, formidable. Hi, uh, That's so right. I, I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to I, I just heard a comment that in a 15 minute talk you could only make jokes. So, maybe, maybe we should also put this in that context too. Uh, so, let, uh, again, uh, this is something different. This is quantum information theory. Um, and so I think the essential difference uh, here that I want to stress in this talk is that the, the question is, is, is there an underlying reality that we are trying to get information about or not? Okay, so that is taken for granted in almost every talk I hear about information. But of course, with quantum information, that question itself is a difficult question. So. Uh, let me start by just sort of uh, introducing you to or reminding you of a cartoon version of the basic quantum probability structure. This is a cartoon, but it's a cartoon that was drawn by Richard Feynman, so at least it has good provenance. Uh, there's a preparation apparatus, and it defines a state which I will think of as some sort of normalized vector in a Hilbert space, some sort of linear topological vector space. It's a vector. I have a registration apparatus. So I'll give you some examples in a second. Let me first do it very formally. The registration apparatus defines an observable, which is also a normalized vector in the same Hilbert space. And since they're in the same space, I can take their inner product, their scalar product. I can still be a complex number. I'll square it, and I can get a probability. Okay, so that's the basic probability structure. This is not uh, going to cover everything that can happen in quantum mechanics. But these are representing pure states, pure states that in the formalism are the states for which I have complete information. I have all the information about the state that is possible, in some sense, uh, that I'll try to define maybe more clearly. Let me give a couple, again, more cartoons. So I actually come from a particle physics background, uh, and so let me give you one of the standard paradigms of quantum, of quantum physics and of physics in general. Again, sort of a cartoon. So I have my preparation apparatus. It is some sort of beam. It is some sort of accelerator that is going to shoot a beam at a target. And I'm going to think about the target 
and the, the, the accelerator as the preparation apparatus. And that creates what I mean, that prepares what I mean by my state. So that combination of events is what prepares my state phi. Then I have some detector. And my detector defines what I mean by the observable psi. I take them together. And again, this is one of these uh, computer compatibility I downloaded on here. That is supposed to be a proportional to symbol here. Mathematically, I should be able to take their inner product, and that should represent the probability that whatever I have prepared is registered by my detector. And of course, if I'm doing this in a real experimental setup, well, I have some sort of, I, I would be able to compare that predicted probability to the ratio of detected events, clicks in my detector, with the number of incident <coughs> particles on my target. The, the number, you know, so in practicality there's proportionality factors and this might be fluxes and times and things like this, but generally, right, this is what I mean and how I would compare my prediction to my experiment. Now one question that this raises right here is, is what about the single event? Because, right, this sort of notion, this is a frequentist notion of probability, right? This only really makes sense if I have large numbers and I'm making this kind of comparison. Now when I was in graduate school, and this is in the mid-90s, my advisor said, don't worry about this question, Nate. We will never be able to measure a single quantum system and interrogate a single quantum system like one by one. Well, he was wrong then. They were doing that that year. And now this is the business of quantum physics, is we can put a single atom in a single well. Or we, have a, we know that there's a single photon going through a, a beam of our interferometer. So we can interrogate the single quantum system. And as best as we can understand is that the single event is uh, the, the prediction of the single event limit. Well, the best, our best experiments say is non-deterministic. That that really is not a matter of ignorance, right? That is a matter of fundamental uncertainty. Now, I go to conferences on the foundations of quantum mechanics every once in a while, and there is still a hard core of physicists who reject that quantum mechanics is fundamentally not deterministic. And they are always coming up with new ways to come up with a model that explains that it's, it really is truly deterministic and it is a matter of ignorance at the single particle level, not a fundamental uncertainty. Okay, so that's one sort of paradigm to sort of think about. Another famous paradigm is the, is the interferometer paradigm or the double slit paradigm. And many of you have probably seen this numerous times. And this is, again, sort of Feynman's version, but it's worth seeing again. So in this case, I can think about this experiment in two ways. I can think about my, my preparation apparatus as not just the thing that's going to create the wave, but the, the, the screen with the slits itself. So in other words, I will think about the yellow and the blue thing as my total thing, as my preparation apparatus that creates my state phi. That screen, I will get an interference pattern. That's what that's supposed to represent, the famous double slit interference pattern. I have a detector, which I can maybe slide up and down. I would register this interference pattern. Uh, and so I would have, right, my, my detect, my, my psi, really depends on where I put my detector, to make sure you sort of understand what I'm doing here. So I would have a probability that varied depending on where I put my detector, and, and that's one way I could think about this experiment. But of course, the, the contradictory information, so to speak, that comes out of here is now, what if I put, so what if I think about it the other way, and I have my, my preparation apparatus is now just the yellow thing, which creates my state phi, and I have an eyeball, I have an observer that is watching whether it goes through the top slit or the bottom slit. This is Halloween. I thought that was sort of a spooky eyeball. I hope you appreciate the topicality. All right. So I have my two, my two. Uh, so now I can think about this: is that I could have prepared my top state chi one or my bottom state chi two. If I do this, I lose my interference pattern, and I just get a single wave pattern for the top slit and a single wave pattern, a single distribution for as though it had passed through the double. So my total distribution looks like that. And I calculate the probability that I've looked to see which slit it goes through. It is now a sum of the probabilities that it went the upper path uh, and, and plus, the sum, plus the probabilities that it went through the lower path. But of course, the, the remarkable thing 
that you all may know about, right, is that somehow if I occlude this eye and I redo the experiment, I get the, I get the interference pattern. And in fact, I don't calculate the probability this way. I calculate the probabilities. I don't, uh, I take the sum and square it instead of summing the squares of these amplitudes to get my probability. And this experiment is wonderful, right? Because you can literally, for example, measure it with a photon, and then you can store that photon in some long beam of your interferometer. So in other words, that eyeball can be turned into a, a piece of apparatus itself, and you can literally see that whether you check to see whether there is a photon in that arm of the interferometer, if you look at that beam of the interferometer, the interference disappears, you lose the coherence, but if you somehow erase that photon without detecting it, then you come back and you find that it, you get the interference back. So right, you, you really can do this as a physical experiment. Okay, so clearly this is going to raise some questions about what is the role of the observer in this experiment, and therefore, does, does the physics depend on whether we are watching it? Does the tree, in fact, not make a sound if we're not listening to it, so to speak? Okay. So, we can ask the question, do then, this, this formalism of quantum states and quantum observables, does it tell us about what is real, about the, the are, are, are quantum states ontic objects, or are they epistemic objects? They only tell us about what we can know. So that's one whole set of questions. Um, so then again, I brought up this one before, is the uncertainty of quantum mechanics true non-determinism, or is it just ignorance of some deeper underlying structure? People still ask this question. And what is observation? Is the role, it, do we have to have a non-quantum observer to make the whole formalism make sense? The, and then finally we can ask, are these questions actually scientific questions? At, or are they philosophical questions, right? I mean no disrespect by the term, right? But in other words, can I make falsifiable statements? Can I make falsifiable statements uh, that where I can have deductive consequence falsified by empirical uh, activity, okay? And the answer is yes, right? And there's a famous history of this. Bell's inequalities, token set theory. Most recently, last year, I think it was 2012, 2013, most recently, is the PBR, Pabst Blue Ribbon Theorem. No. The Pussy, uh, Pussy, Barrett Rudolph theorem, uh, where they actually make specifically these are really good theorems for constraining that second question, which really does say that all of these support the fact that it is non determinism and that there's not some deeper level. On the other hand, we don't really have the critical experiments for all these questions yet. They, they really don't exist, and so there really is a matter of interpretation. And sort of another thing that happened in 2013 that I'd like to report, and I wrote a, a short little uh, meta-analysis of this phenomenon. Uh, Zeiliger, who is an Austrian quantum physicist, wrote a survey that he gave then to quantum, to practicing quantum mechanics on what their attitudes were about interpretational issues of quantum mechanics. This was one of the questions. These are the main 14, or 12, or depending whether you count other or not, uh, these are the main 12 or 13 interpretations of quantum mechanics. And so the first uh, column is the Zeiliger. Is Zeiliger gave it to a group of people that he works with. Uh, that's a group of people who really believe in information-based interpretations of quantum mechanics. And so we get a 24% for E, for information-based or information-theoretical uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The second, then, right, and so they published that survey result. Somebody else took the survey, gave it to a group, of, a mixed group of young physicists and philosophers. Uh, we find that they have much more, their youth gives them M. I have no preferred interpretation. I think we can interpret that data, and that the youth, the, the callow indifference of youth. Uh, also, this particular one made a slight distinction between the Copenhagen interpretation and the shut up and calculate interpretation. So, so there's a little bit of statistical, or uh, contra uh, the surveys weren't exactly identical, so not perfectly able to be compared. Then the last one was a, a conference of, 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 of psi, a hard, of, of the recalcitrant determinist quantum mechanics people, the de Broly bone crowd. And you can see 63% in the de Broly bone, which are the people who really believe that there's a fundamentally a deterministic underlying theory of quantum mechanics, and that we're going to figure out, and that it's going to, we're going to reconcile with classical mechanics. Uh, poor old things like 
modal interpretation didn't even show up there. Some people would love quantum Bayesianism in with information base. Good old Everett, that every single time a quantum measurement is made, the universe branches into a multiverse. And we're just coasting through this multiverse as minds. Okay, so we have the, so these are some of the main interpretations, and there are other ones. Uh, if I was going to try to organize this for you, and I'm going to try to actually connect this to my research a little bit. I'm actually a, a serious researcher. This may not look like it. Um, so is I'm going to break into four categories, into the psi epistemic crowd, and then the psi-ontic, or sometimes called the psi-ontologists. Uh, see what I did? Okay. Um, on, the up part, on the upper half is going to be the people who believe that our quantum theory can provide, a, a quantum theory can provide a complete description of reality. And the other ones think that the quantum description is inherently incomplete, that there is something missing. So, for example, the sort of standard interpretation, which I would really say is a combination of Copenhagen, which says, shut up and calculate. Everything is, uh, the, the, the quantum mechanics is a physical thing that is non-deterministic, and that we don't need uh, some sort of outside observer. We can sort of explain that by dynamic decoupling through decoherence. So that's sort of a very standard interpretation of quantum mechanics. I would call that psi-ontic, meaning quantum mechanics is talking about real objects and that it is a complete theory. Another popular theory, and growing in popularity, quantum Bayesianism, and more generally other inter <coughs> uh, information interpretations, are that it is a complete theory, but it is purely an epistemic theory. The quantum mechanics is not a theory about what is, but is a theory about what we can know. And in fact, of course, Wheeler's the one who famously said it for a bit, and tried to argue that, in fact, we should think of the ontic reality emerging from the information perspective. Um, the other ones, de Broglie Bohm, they're psi epistemic, it, psi epistemic incomplete. Again, they think that there is some fundamental underlying theory that is deterministic that we don't know about. How much time do I got left? Uh, about 10, 12, 13. Oh, good. No, all right. 10 minutes. Uh, and then finally, psi ontic incomplete means there's some other things outside of quantum mechanics that are necessary for the interpretation. So many worlds, of uh, Penrose's objective class. So in other words, there are different interpretations, and I don't think this is a, a foolproof dual dichotomy of all interpretations, but it's at least uh, uh, some place to start explaining it. Uh, okay, so then where, uh, what am I selling? What, where, where did what I'm putting fit into all of this? Well, so I am very interested in the information perspective, but again, what I'm really interested in is can I use the methods of information theory to solve quantum mechanics problems. So what kinds of problems do I mean about them? So for example, are there information theoretic quantities that are intrinsic to a quantum system that are maybe not necessarily, like I, I don't want to, I want to know not about my choice as the experimenter, but are there any information theoretic quantities that I can say are intrinsic to the setup, external from myself? If I can do this, how can this information, which I might use words like correlation or coherence or entanglement, depending on the context I'm talking about, be shifted between the states and observables? In other words, if I'm studying anything from a hydrogen atom to a complex particle experiment, can I, uh, how can I choose my states and observables so I can uh, describe the system most efficiently and therefore characterize its information and content most efficiently? And then, to sort of, that's sort of the passive version then sort of an active version, of course, is can I then use this information to control these systems, to actually, uh, for example, extract the entanglement uh, to do quantum encryption with, or can I use it in the next generation of quantum information processing devices, which are still 20 years in the future and always will be. No, that's not fair, right? But that's the old joke. Um, right, so, so this is the information perspective that I am investigating. In particular, uh, yeah, so uh, my training as part of a physicist makes me consider symmetry methods, right? So, uh, and these could be literally physical symmetries, like parity inversion. In other words, are the laws of physics the same in the mirror world as they are in this world? Or it could be more abstract. Uh, are, are the, what are the symmetries of exchanging identical particles? Are, are the symmetries of, in phase space, of the, of the equipotentials in phase space, right? So it could be more abstract or it could be very concrete. 
of, just to sort of give you just the slightest taste of what I mean in the formalism, and this I would attribute to Eugene Wigner. Right, so I, I gave you the scattering paradigm before, and it is a fundamental assumption that I could either rotate my coordinate system or equivalently actively rotate my experiment. And as long as it's sufficiently isolated, well, so I'll, I'll have a new description for my state and my observable, which I should be able to think about as though I've acted some operator on my Hilbert space to transform my system, but that the probabilities in this alternate description or in this rotated system should be the same. Well, this constraint on the probabilities being symmetry invariant, that is a strong mathematical constraint, right? That is a very strong constraint. Prove it in the 60s, not enough to get all particle physics, right? There was a hope in the 60s for a while that we thought we'd be able to get everything from symmetry, but it doesn't work. There's no go theorems there, but we can get a lot from it. Uh, so, and here's sort of the relation to maybe, right, to, a, uh, to the talks we've heard today in particular, so I'll talk, but uh, more generally, many of you are, or, or even, uh, we just heard the talk, you know, n goes to infinity, t goes to infinity. I want n to go to three, <laughs> right? Two solvable problems. If you have two interacting systems, that is a solvable problem classically. Newton solved it basically, and, and if not Newton, then soon after it was solved. Um, it was proven that, oh, and so then of course when you go n to infinity, well then the math resimplifies again. Right? And so there are some solvable integral problems with n goes to infinity. But three, four, five, that's hard, right? And that's where this sort of cascade goes from the simple system to the complex system. That's where it starts. It starts at three, and then it goes to four, and then it goes to five. And so that's what I'm interested in seeing, is looking, and we can do the experiments now. Right now we can literally put, deterministically, three atoms in a well, or four atoms in a well, and five. Deter a magnetic field and change how strongly they interact. Right? So we can really, we can get down to a few systems and precise control, repeatable, deterministic control of a few systems. There's, the, the, the big sort of hot topic right now is universality of these systems. If I make some assumptions of what, what kind of phenomena can exist that is independent of the details of the few body interactions or the traps or the nature of the particles themselves. One of the famous ones are Borromean states. States which are uh, where the interactions between two particles are too weak to bind them together. But if somehow you have three of them, they can bind together like those three rings. You cut any one ring, they all fall apart. The two body interactions don't hold them together but some combination of the two bodies holds them together. Um, and so and these systems are possible, the possible working material for new quantum information processing applications. If we ever could harness this richer probability structure to do analysis, these are the kinds of systems we might be able to do it on. Um, but again, few body physics is solvable. Even classically, Bruns and Poincaré at the end of the 19th century said not solvable. In, a t in some technical sense, obviously not solvable, um, but maybe quantum information, and in particular what I study is something called entanglement spectroscopy, a kind of way that information can be carried in clusters of particles uh, where there's more information in the cluster than if you break it into the parts. Uh, yeah, so that's what I'm studying and looking for the connections among symmetry, solvability, and information. <laughs> What are the few body observables most useful controlling and extracting coherence or entanglement? And how does university re universality retreat, or a certain kind of universality retreat and complexity, which maybe is a different kind of, has a different kind of universality, emerge as the number of particles increases? So, thanks. That's my time. actually a point of personal curiosity. You, you said, were there any information um, theory quantities that could be applied to quantum systems? But you didn't actually
actually answer that question. Right. In particular, I was curious about the uh, concept of entropy. And I, I think, as I know, there are at least two different ways of thinking about the entropy of quantum systems. So the main way that I use in my research is I, I use entropy to quantify how much information is lost when I compare the description of the subsystems to the whole, right? And I, I, you can either use, I mean, any of the Rangi entropies are the ones that I'm familiar with for using that. I mean, I actually usually use the, um, um, uh, the linear entropy, not the, the, the Shannon entropy, just because the math is easier. But um, yeah, so, so that, is, that is one of the, the most common ways. There's also, of course, you can use the ent the, any of these entropies to also characterize for mixed states where you may have your ignorance on top of your intrinsic uncertainty. And so at least those are two examples that I, I, I use all the time in my research. I think that there are um, deeper things to say here. One of the things that I'm fascinated by, though, is that neither of those are invariant or generally are not invariant if you choose different subsystems. In other words, I can look at one system, and if I break it into subsystems this way, I have a lot of entanglement, or in other words, a lot of information lost by that division. But I'm interested in the, um, uh, the optimization process. When I'm looking for good observables, I'm trying to find the observables that partition my system into subsystems for which there is no information, or as little information lost as possible. And the thing is, is, you can do that with two particles like that. With three particles, it ends up becoming not, a, you can't make generic statements anymore. It ends up being very specific statements you have to make. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I can say that if I were a student of Gates, I would really appreciate it. Maybe I'll try to, at my old age, take a course uh, from him because he's a wonderful presenter. And happy to say that uh, equally yeah. uh, first acknowledgement this particular piece of work is done, done with two collaborators Daniel Bartolomeo and Marcel Ginato but of course I owe a whole lot of gratitude to every single student that's contributed to previous versions of this work and then, of course, all the people who have taught me a whole lot about how to use entropy and how not to use it. Uh, that's just as equally important. Anyway, to, to set up the stage for what it is I'm trying to do here, uh, I'll quote uh, from Wheeler, a uh, really famous physicist, uh, who said in 1993, uh, his slogan is law without law. The only thing harder to understand than a law of a statistical origin would be a law that is not of a statistical origin, but then there would be no way for it or its progenitor principles to come into being. And there are two tests for this. No test of these views looks like being someday doable, nor more interesting and more instructive than a derivation of the structure of quantum theory. No prediction lends itself to a more critical test than this, that every law of physics pushed to the extreme, will be found statistical and approximate, not mathematically perfect and precise. So, if these views ever come to, to be accepted, physics will look way, way more like economics. <laughs> okay? uh, my talk will differ from Nate's in one, one uh, important respect. For me, the end point is to derive the laws of quantum mechanics, not from classical mechanics or anything. And my theory is going to be completely statistical. There is no underlying determinism or anything of the sort, right? But my talk will end with quantum mechanics, while Ned's talk started with quantum mechanics and then trying to figure out what you can do with it to process information. So both of these views are completely consistent and compatible with each other, which is addressing different problems. Very good. So here is how we start. Whenever you're doing inference, you have to be particularly careful about what it is that you're talking about. So uh, here I'm going to make the first assumption. The goal is to predict the positions of particles. Of course, we can generalize this kind of theory to predict other variables, such as, for example, fields. This is crucial if you want to do particle physics. But let's start with particles. Uh, in this approach, 
the positions of particles are going to have definite but unknown values. Now, these are, these are clever words that come with a, a, a lot of meaning there. For example, the positions have definite values. Uh, this is completely in disagreement with the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics in which values become definite only when you measure them. However, there is, of course, uncertainty. I, I do not know if the particle went through this one slit or the other in a double slit experiment, but the particle definitely did go through one or the other. This is in disagreement with the usual way we're talking about the mechanics. The experimental consequences of this theory would be in complete agreement with quantum mechanics, the standard versions, and the experiment. Very good. Uh, how does the dynamics here, how, how is the dynamics introduced? Well, first we have to think about the set of possibilities. This is what we normally call the configuration space. And so the state of a system of several particles is going to be represented in this space by a point. So for example, if you're talking about a single particle, this space here, uh, this space is three-dimensional. I, I only draw two dimensions for, for obvious reasons. It's difficult to represent more than two. Uh, if this were two particles, then this space here would actually be six-dimensional, right? For n particles, it's 3n-dimensional. So this, is, this can be a pretty large and complicated space. The, the system is described by a single point. Very good. Here comes the main dynamical law. The main dynamical law is that change happens. The system will move. Now, I do not explain how these changes arise. I just say that they do happen, and my goal is to try to predict what the changes are. In, in physics, for example, we're already familiar with things like this. If you have a free particle and it keeps moving at constant speed, we do not ask why the particle keeps moving at constant speed. We just refrain from asking that dumb question and try to figure out what happens if you deflect it and all of that. But we do not ask that question, what keeps the particle moving with its own inertia, right? We do not ask why this change happens. But what we want to do is we want to find the probability that a transition happens from the point x to another point x prime. And so what we're going to do now is we want to figure out the probability. We're going to impose certain constraints. We're going to invoke certain pieces of information to constrain these probabilities so as to be able to make our predictions. And here come, it is at this point that I'm going to put in pieces of information that are very physical in nature. If you want to do this tech stock market, you might actually be able to do similar things like this. But of course, the constraints the pieces of information you're going to invoke are going to be slightly different, right? So the first goal is uh, to find that probability. And so, oh yes, 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 for experts in quantum mechanics in the audience, the fact that I am expressing my theory in configuration space and not in space, and the fact that this is going to be very, very probabilistic from the very start, means that the theory is going to be highly, highly non-local, in which case uh, Bell's theorem and all of those uh, co important considerations are fine. They will be satisfied in the usual, in the usual way. And so this is smelling like more like quantum mechanics than you may think at this point. Very good. So here's how this entropic dynamics comes about. We're going to figure out this uh, probability distribution by uh, maximizing an entropy subject to certain constraints. Uh, the way I'm thinking about this is that I'm going to update from a prior to the posterior imposes certain constraints. First thing, what's the prior? What is that underlying measure that I have here? Before the, part, the, the system is going to jump. Before I know absolutely anything about the system, I'm going to say that I have no idea where the system is going to jump, and I'm going to make this uniform. So as far as I'm concerned, before I know anything, and remember, it's actually very difficult to think, what is it that you know when you actually don't know anything? But I'm making that statement here. It could go here all the way from here to Andromeda. It's real ignorance that I'm talking about here, or, or real uncertainty. Uh, but let's now start putting 
the constraints that codify information about what's going on here. The first and most crucial constraint I'm going to impose is that motion in physics happens continuously. It is actually possible to go all the way from here to Andromeda. But in order to do that, you have to go through intermediate steps. You have to fill in intermediate steps. So what this means in physics is that it is possible to analyze large changes as the accumulation of many, many short steps. This saves a lot because that means that in order to do real physics, I only need to know about what happens when you move just by a little bit. Uh, by the way, this is why the equations in physics, the equations of change in physics, like say, Newton's equation, F equals MA, are differential equations because you really do this step by step. And here then is where I'm going to impose that my, my motion is gonna happen in short steps. I'm going to impose that the square of the displacements uh, are some, on the average, or an expected value, are some small number. Eventually I'm gonna take that kappa to zero to really implement a continuous motion. Uh, I'm going to do something like pedagogically reasonable, but which is most of the time I'm talking about n particles, but I don't want to complicate the notation, so every now and then I'm going to revert to thinking about a single particle. It doesn't make any difference, but the notation is easy. Very good, that's my first constraint. Now, if this were my only constraint, you can see that jumping in any direction, because that's a square, uh, is the same probability. Such, such a motion would actually be some very, very isotropic, same in all directions. So we know that that doesn't happen in physics. When things are moving, they keep moving. So what I'm going to do to reflect that part of our physics understanding is I'm going to impose some additional constraint that involves some uh, directionality. <laughs> the expected value of the displacement along some, some direction is also some small number. Uh, now, what I'm introducing here is going to be important is I'm introducing a, a, a potential phi. And uh, there is some, going to be some preference in moving, oops, moving in the direction of the gradient of that potential. Very good. The result of this, when you maximize entropy subject to constraints, is you're gonna get your regular uh, ex exponential uh, distributions. There is one constraint, there is the other constraint, and there is a couple of Lagrange multipliers, alpha and alpha prime. Uh, the first simplification in all of this is I didn't tell you what that potential was. I also do not know what that alpha, the kappa prime was. Uh, so what I'm going to do to simplify matters, I don't really have to do this, but it makes life easy for now, is I'm going to absorb that alpha prime in there and effectively make it disappear. Just re redefining what that phi was. Very good. Now, now we have the first part of this, of this uh, entropic dynamics is already under control here. Uh, we have the transition probability to go from uh, initial position to some final position. When the alpha is very large, you see there's a minus there, when the alpha is large, this, is, this accounts for very, very short steps. Now this is a very simple probability distribution, it's Gaussian. And so we can do all sorts of things with it. Uh, a genetic displacement, is going to be the sum of a drift and expected value plus a fluctuation. The expected drift, when you compute it, is going to be one of the alpha the times the gradient of that potential. The fluctuations, of course, by the definition of the fluctuation, have zero average. And the correlations are going to be something like one over alpha with um, a chronicle delta. Uh, being a physicist and being kind of picky about these things, we prefer to put some indices upstairs. So this is the x, y, z component, the x, y, z component of these things, and we put them upstairs for reasons that will become clear later. There is something already, since I'm not going to have time to finish this talk, and, 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 and I feel very envious of all the previous speakers who have succeeded in keeping it within the limits of time. I'm going to give you the conclusions as I go along, right? So that if I get chopped at the end, which is obviously what's going to happen, at least some of the conclusions will be in place. Uh, one of the things that we see here is that the expected drift is of the order of one over alpha, while the expected fluctuations are of the order 
here you have square, right? Out of the order of one over alpha square root. What this means is that in the limit of alpha going to zero, alpha going to infinity, which is infinitely short steps, the fluctuations are dominating the motion completely. So this motion is going to be a motion that's indeed continuous, but it is non-differentiable. If this looks like a Brownian motion to you, it's that it's precisely what it is, okay? From the point of view of quantum mechanics, this is sort of interesting because it tells you that if I know the position of the particle, I have absolutely no idea of the tangent to the trajectory. In other words, I have no idea what the velocity is. This is where, in this, in this approach to quantum mechanics, the uncertainty principle comes along. If you know the position, momenta are all over the place. You don't know anything about it. So we see a little features of quantum mechanics that appear. Second. We have done a single little step. Now we have to iterate this procedure a whole lot. And then we have a serious bookkeeping device in keeping track of the accumulation of all of these probability distributions, of all of these little changes into a big change. So we have to take a complicated convolution of all of these things. And in order to do that, we need to introduce a bookkeeping device. Anyway, there you go. Time. This is how time enters into the picture. Inference has no reference to time. We have to explicitly introduce what we mean by time here. Time is a bookkeeping device to keep track of the accumulation of changes. And so here it's what I'm going to introduce as the notion of an entropic time, a time that is useful for describing the evolution of uh, entropic changes or changes due to entropy. If you want to introduce time, you need three ingredients. First, you have to define a notion of an instant. What do you mean by an instant? In relativity, people would say an instant is the set of all simultaneous events. Everything that's happening at the same time, that's an instant. So we need a notion of an instant. We also need to be sure that these instants are ordered. Otherwise, you run into real trouble with past and future and things like that. And finally, Given two instants that are very close together, we need to tell you how far apart they are. Is there a lot of time, a lot of interval between the two, or just a little bit? You have to come up with a criterion for that as well. So let's start. Uh, let us introduce the notion of an instant. If I know the probability to jump by a small step and I am giving the probability distribution at a certain instant in time, then I can figure out the probability distribution at the next instant in time. So in this approach, an instant is a probability distribution. It's the set of possibilities as to what the position would be at any one instant. Uh, with this approach, as you can see, given one instant in time, I can construct the next. Then I repeat. Given the next instant, I construct yet again. In this way, I can manage to construct a sequence of instants and thereby generate time. Okay, this is a single slide to explain the notion of time. Give me a break. Of course you can't understand it. It's an advertising for study more, okay? You can't. Time is too complicated for a single slide. Anyway, these instants are ordered. Now, this is interesting because this transition probability here was obtained by maximizing an entropy. If you're going to obtain the next transition probability by maximizing an entropy, maximize, you're always maximizing. There is no way to go back. The question of maximizing entropy for the purposes of prediction are very different from retrodiction. So this has an arrow of time implicit in it. So this is a presumably fundamental physical theory that does something that other theories of physics don't do. Other theories of physics, they treat the future and the past in exactly the same way. Uh, very good. Three, we have to define the interval, the duration between one instant and the next. This is something that in physics is done by convention. 
we define time, we define duration so that motion looks simple. In standard classical mechanics, you define time so that motion of a free particle is very simple. The particle moves equal distances in equal times, right? Right? You, 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 make the, you make time, you invent time so that motion looks actually very simple. It flows equally. We're going to do exactly the same thing. But if you remember from the previous slide, for small uh, intervals, short steps, the dynamics is completely dominated by the fluctuations. There they are. Uh, here I introduce another index n because I want to talk about the possibility of different particles here. So in this little Lagrange multiplier, I have to, to figure out how this Lagrange multiplier is going to be related to the interval between t and t prime. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to invent a notion of time that makes the fluctuations look as simple as possible. I'm going to say, look, whatever that Lagrange multiplier was, it's completely independent of the initial position. So that means that time flows over here at the same rate as time flows over there. Time flows at the same rate everywhere. It's also completely independent of when you're making these predictions. It only depends on the difference between t and t prime. So that time flows equally whoa, everywhere and everywhere. Very good, thank you. I'm also doing here something. I'm saying, look, different particles could have different uh, alphas, different Lagrange multipliers. And I'm going to say, when this constant here, Cn, that could be different for different particles, I'm going to write it in terms of a constant that depends on which particle you're talking about. I call that m. It's going to be mass at some point. Uh, and I'm going to say I need also another constant that is the same for everybody that sort of makes sure that my time is measured in seconds. So if I do next, this is what the fluctuations are going to look like. Very good. There are two consequences of this that are sort of interesting here. One is for the nature of clocks. Just like in classical mechanics, the clock is a free particle, equal times, equal distances. Here, the clock is the fluctuations. Equal times, equal delta t's give rise to equal increases in the correlations, in the fluctuations. So the fluctuations are the clock, the natural clock for quantum phenomena. The other thing that's sort of interesting is this ends that eventually will be identified with mass. Now that's interesting too. Quantum mechanics has two, two sort of mysteries. Why are there fluctuations there? And what on earth is mass? What is mass? Well, in this approach, we sort of make progress in this question. I see that it's not like you have two mysteries. You only have one. Mass is an inverse measure of the fluctuations. Heavy particles fluctuate very little. Light particles fluctuate a whole lot. So this gives you an indication of what mass smells like. Very good. So here we have entropic dynamics. That's the basic equation. We can always write it as a differential equation. That's the Fokker-Planck equation. Just translates a different way of writing. Where the probabilities flow with a certain velocity. When you compute precisely, you get that uh, the V that appears there, the velocity of the probabilities, is the gradient of a certain function. And uh, if you do the calculations, you see that this function phi, capital phi, which will end up being the phase of the wave function in quantum mechanics, depends on that original potential and depends on log rho. So, we're done. <laughs> Except that now we see we have a problem. This is a standard diffusion. It's not quantum mechanics. So now I have to say, when you do your inferences and you get something that's obviously wrong, you can blame arithmetic, nah. You can blame calculus, differential and integral, nah, 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 you don't, do it. you don't want to do that. You can blame your rules of inference, nah, probability theory, entropy. you don't blame that. What do you blame? You pick the wrong constraints. You put the wrong information into the picture. So, the solution we're going to look is we're going to change that potential, and instead of being something externally prescribed, fixed, we're going to allow it to be dynamic. So, for each point in, in the configuration space, where there's going to be this potential here that was given, provided the directionality of the motion, and we're going to allow that potential to be dynamic. We're going to allow it to change. And now you have something interesting, because when you allow it to change, you're trying to diffuse under a potential that's sort of waving around. It's like trying to diffuse a diffusion on a waterbed. 
instead of having a diffusion that's sort of nice and, 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 and well, sort of nice and smooth, you're going to develop all sorts of maxima and minima that you typically associate with constructive and destructive interferences. So what you see here then is that you have aspects of all of these that really refer to particles. Yeah, there are particles. But you start seeing that there are aspects of the whole thing that have to do with waves. The two are there. Very good. So that what kind of dynamics are we going to use? Well, let me rewrite my theory in yet another way. I'm going to define an H, which should eventually be a the idea of Hamiltonian. I'm going to define an H so that the H is the derivative of the probability distribution which, of course, by the Fokker-Planck equation, is given by something like that. Here you see the velocity. This is, this is an equation for an H. I can always integrate this equation and find out what this H is going to look like. Uh, it's some, uh, some functional of rho and, and the phase. And this is what it looks like. It's starting to look very much like the chemical Jacobi formulations in mechanics, where this guy here is an integration constant. If I differentiate with respect to phi, this piece drops out, and this piece gives me that. So we're going to have to come back to that f, because that f is actually very, very important, an integration constant. Very good. Here we have one equation. Uh, and this is just a reformulation of the Fokker-Planck equation. There is nothing new there. But now I'm going, to, I'm going to change the constraint. I'm going to say that this h, whatever it is, is conserved. This is a new constraint, because it means that rho can change, and phi is going to change, but they're going to change in such a way that the overall time dependence of this h is going to be zero. This guy was defined to be the time derivative of rho. So now we can factor out this dvp rho. And what we have for the time derivative, which is supposed to be zero, is something messy. If, if I want this guy here, to, this to be valid for all choices of initial conditions, then this integrand has to vanish. And then we get a second equation here, like so. Now, for those of you who have done physics, you may end up realizing that this looks very much like Hamilton's equations. Hamilton's equations obtained purely from in, in, in loss of inference with appropriate constraints. That is the Fabry-Perry equation, and that's the other one is very much like a hamilton jacobi equation. Choosing F. Remember that integration constant that enters this Hamiltonian? How do we pick that? It comes from information geometry. Even more inference in this whole picture. Remember the Fisher uh, the information metric? Uh, whenever you have a parametric family of probability distributions, you can figure out a metric tensor by uh, figuring out this messy equation. Here we have two probability distributions. And therefore, we can come up with two two tensors. One of them is a transition probability distribution. And when I do that, I obtain a metric for the configuration space. It coincides with the mass tensor. Really interesting. Jacobi did this in the, in the 18th century, in the 19th century. From rho, from the probability distribution, oops, oops. From rho, uh, we can also do the same thing. And what we get is the Fisher information. Ma ma uh, matrix. Now, it's very natural to take the trace of the Fisher information by uh, contracting these two tensors. Whoops. And then I would claim that the natural object to include from the point of view of information geometry is something that, except for a proportionality constant, is the trace. If I also include the simplest possible thing I could have, a linear term in rho, where v is going to end up being a potential, I'm done. This is quantum mechanics. So it is absolutely crucial from the point of view of quantum mechanics that not only I have the standard potentials of classical physics, but also I include this quantum potential that comes purely from information geometry properties. Very nice. Now, it is not obvious at this point that this is quantum mechanics. It's not obvious to you. To me it is now because I've been looking at these things like forever. Uh, but you can always take that probability distribution and that row and really combine them into an exponential, into a complex exponential. Uh, you can see here, uh, I, I allowed myself a little bit of freedom by including 
at constant k. So I can always combine these two into some complex wave function. And if I use the equations of motion I had before, I can rewrite those equations in this awful mess. This is exactly the same theory I had before. This looks very much like a linear term, a linear term, a linear term. This starts looking very much like the Schrodinger equation. And then I have this awful nonlinear term. Thank you, Am. Half a second. If, now all of these, with k is completely arbitrary, right? So these are all completely equivalent descriptions of exactly the same theory. Now, whenever you have equivalent descriptions of the same theory, it'd be pretty silly not to pick the simplest one, right? Pick the easier one. And what does easy mean here? Easy means this k, this k here, that was arbitrary, right? Pick the k that simplifies life a whole lot the most. Pick the k that makes these things vanish. The natural choice is to pick the k that makes the nonlinear terms disappear. We set then eta over k over that preferred k equal to h bar, and we have one. I never mentioned any underlying determinism or any classical physics. It's just pure inference, just like economics. <laughs> the wave function has the magnitude is rho to the one half, and then the phase, the, the old field there was phase. And the particular C that appears as a proportionality constant is really what sets the scale for quantum phenomena. So here are my conclusions. In entropic dynamics, it's actually possible to derive laws of physics as examples of inference. The entropic dynamics of non-dissipative diffusion, which is like a very weird concept, in configuration space, which is really weird. This is not classical physics. This is Hamiltonian to quantum theory. Information theory is crucial. We needed to explain the quantum potential. OK. Position is real, the T in the laws of physics, the entropic time that appear there. It's time. The Schrodinger equation and F equals MA are what you use to calibrate clocks. Right? We so now do that. I'm done. I finished. <laughs> <laughs> Regular. One of them is a kind of trivial one. The Schrodinger equation is invariant under inversion of time by taking simultaneously the complex conjugate. Yes, 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 you're correct. You're but, correct. but yours is not. No, no, the Schrodinger equation is invariant. No, it, is, it is, but yes. the your... The time the is it's very interesting. Time itself only goes forward. However, the Schrodinger equation does show this, this, this invariance. So now, that what doesn't we have to bother be, you? No, 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 not at all, not at all. Okay, let's do the classical physics thing. In classical physics, uh, we can definitely say time only goes forward. What the time reversal invariance of classical physics says is that if you have the planet going one way around, then another solution, a different, time is going forward, the planet is going like this. Another solution is the particle, the planet going the other way around, while time is also going forward. So these are two different statements, the time reversibility of the equations of physics and the actual entropic nature of time. You are totally correct. We have to worry about it. But I think it's totally clean. Time only goes forward, even though there may be a symmetry that says, given one solution, you can find another solution. Uh, my second uh, point is also kind of trivial. Of course, you did uh, all the deduction using uh, Shannon entropy. If you were to use SQ entropy, you would have Q Gaussians, you would have a nonlinear focus like equation, and uh, the rest of your uh, arguments would still be essentially the same. So why should you use Q equal one entropy? I, I, have, I have worried about that question a whole lot. Let me rephrase it. I can't answer your question, but that's mine. Uh, can we do this kind of 
inference with other types of entropies, Salis entropies, Fenny entropies, what would we get, get then? I have not worked it out, but it is a really interesting question. One possibility is that, for example, when you're trying to do geometry, whether you use the, the, the kumpak leibler or you use Salis entropies, you get exactly the same underlying geometry for the, the, uh, the information metric. It's, you get exactly the same results independent of the, of the, metric, of the, of the entropy. Question. Uh, would we get exactly the same quantum mechanics or not? That's, I think, an interesting question. Uh, well, I would be inclined to think, no, we don't. Which means that this is the one that agrees with experiment. Well, I, no, I'm curious, though. You also set the constant so that you eliminate the nonlinear term. And, uh, you know, Constantino's work is really about the nonlinear term. So I'm curious whether there might be a connection this is between... Linear, linearities in the entropy and linearities well, in the evolution of the wave function are very different they, things. They certainly could be. And, but but you're, you're but nevertheless, correct. it might be interesting to explore, you know, that if uh, the nonlinearities that Constantino imposes on the entropy function are related to that nonlinear term that you're... But what uh, is end, ending up happening with these nonlinear terms is that the nonlinear terms uh, are, 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 are defined. The, these theories are all equivalent, right? But there is a reformulation of the theory, choosing that constant k appropriately. There is a reformulation of the theory that makes the whole thing uh, simple. So here we're not looking at, when I change that k, we're not looking at different theories. We're looking at mm, different choices of coordinates, if you will. Wow. Different formulations. It's almost like a gauge symmetry or something like that. Now, I wonder, OK, uh, if we were to use some of these non other non-additive entropies to do this kind of, of, of inference, there is a possibility that, well, we might have the same freedom to choose among equivalent theories. We might have, I don't know, I doubt it. Th this is really complicated algebra that goes beyond, and, and lots of interesting constellations that happen. Uh, so it is not obvious to me that if I were to, to, to do it any different, then, then, then miracles would happen. I do not know, for example, if you, you would get, if the, if the Q exponentials that would arise in the, in the transition probability uh, would make any, 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 any sense. So this is, if anything, if that is correct, then this is evidence that a whole lot of chunk of physics uh, follows from the logarithmic entropies and not from the generalized entropies. But of course, that part of the argument needs to be sorted. Any other questions? Clarification. Uh, so, in the the particles in your uh, account move in configuration space, which is more general, uh, and uh, you assume continuity in that movement uh, to be able to get the conception of time. But of course, uh, some quantum uh, observables are discrete, uh, like spin. Oh, right. oh, so, yeah, okay. how does it connect to? Uh, okay. It's very interesting. How does discrete, the discreteness of quantum mechanics arise in, in this case? Good question. Well, even classical mechanics has an incredible amount of discreteness. If you take the string of a musical instrument, <coughs> the motion of the string is completely continuous. And yet, the, the modes of, of resonance are very discrete, right? You can have a wavelength, two halves of a wavelength, right? They're discrete. The, in, in this picture, all the discreteness of quantum mechanics arises because when you solve the Schrodinger equation with appropriate boundary conditions, there is going to be many problems for which you have quantization. Right? Now, it's, it's also very interesting that people put so much, so much emphasis on the discrete aspect of quantum mechanics. When quantum mechanics typically predicts that you're going to have discrete states when, when the electrons are bound to an atom, but also you're going to have the continuous states when they are in the, in, in, you know, the atom is ionized. So we shouldn't pay, put too much emphasis on the discreteness of quantum mechanics because that's, that's a consequence of the Schrodinger equation. It's not something that was put into the Schrodinger equation from the beginning. So all of those consequences of quantum mechanics follow here naturally. Well, I'm tempted to ask, uh, is it really a good thing for 
physics to move more toward economics. Uh, but <laughs> I think that would take us a little beyond the uh, talent of the coffee. But, uh, it's a matter of intellectual honesty. <laughs> so it's thank you very much. Very 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 We're about to start session five. It's my pleasure to introduce Mike Dunn. Uh, risk and the value of information. First, I want to uh, thank our organizers, Aman and uh, Amos, who I think is not officially the organizer, but in, in practicality, I'm sure, serves that role. And uh, want to uh, congratulate him on his fifth birthday. Uh, I think the uh, Infometrics Institute uh, is, is, is set uh, this morning. Uh, clearly a very great success. Uh, I also want to point out that the talk I'll be giving grows out of joint conversations that Amos and I have had on the value of information as part of a larger project. He's given me some comments on this, but uh, I mean by that to give him credit, not blame. Uh, this is, a, I would admit, a somewhat uh, adventuresome, adventuresome uh, did I say amateurish, uh, project of mine. I'm a, a logician by training. I tend to uh, do things that are highly rigorous and very technical. And here I think uh, I will might get the record almost uh, for the fewest equations. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, combination of risk and the value of information. Uh, so let's start with uh, this scenario. You're walking in the woods. Which of these two signs would you rather see? The one on the left or the one on the right? Well, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands in this highly educated audience. Uh, it's clear you should prefer the second sign because it conveys more definite information. Uh, for example, that you might fall into the nearby lake. Uh, it's very intuitive that there's a relationship between information and risk. In general, the more relevant information, the lower the risk. I say in general because you're somehow finding out that the Earth will fall into the sun hardly lowers the risk. Uh, but uh, I have to interrupt with a story. Uh, I have a grandchild who, when he was four, he asked his father, a computer scientist like myself, uh, Daddy, what would happen if the uh, sun stopped working? My son, wanting to reassure him, you know, that wasn't going to happen, you know, he's safe, et cetera, et cetera, that won't happen. He said, Daddy, I said, if. So I think I have a grandson who might turn out to be a logician as well. Uh, so information and risk both involve probability. One value that information has is to inform a decision maker of the risk that's under consideration Information is standardly quantified, and that's what I'll be taking at, by, by Shannon as some, using some formula that involves the inverse of probability. The idea is that the more unexpected a message is, the more information it contains. Assuming the price of something is affected positively by its quantity, the value or the price of a quantity of information is the product of the quantity times the price. But risk is also the probability of an event times its price for value. Does this mean that the value of a piece of information can be taken to be the inverse of the risk? We'll explore this issue from some of its subtleties, but with more precise definitions. I should say that given the time constraints, I cut out, I think, five slides at the end. And they, of course, made sense of all that I'm going to say. <laughs> I just wanted to, as it were, give you food for thought, right? And the, part of the fun really is uh, working out some of the assumptions uh, and what, exactly what they entail. Early writings on the value of information by Strat, I don't know how to pronounce this, Strat, Stratnanovich, Russian, uh, 1965, and independently Howard in 1966, focused on the value of information for decision making and how much a decision maker would be willing to pay for such information. We will, in this talk, focus on the context of decision making. But I want to state for the record, and this relates to things Amos and I are going to be saying in the paper, there are many other purposes of information, curiosity, 
gossip, history, aesthetics, theoretical science, etc. The focus on decision making leads to an interesting and unanticipated connection between the value of information and risk, at least unanticipated for me. Not all kinds of information gives values that depend on the quantity, at least for a fixed quantity. Well, let's assume some context where the quantity of some certain kind of information can be priced, at least within some reasonable range. There might be a discount for large quantities, to mention just one exception outside the range. And as uh, Luciano said, too much information, you may not want to pay for that at all. The kind is important. In pricing materials, certainly mere kilograms or liters are not enough. It depends on whether the material is, say, gold or charcoal, or oil versus wine. But once we fix on this kind of information, its pricing might be based on such things as general usefulness of the source, scarcity of the information, e.g., let us suppose that the source is a well-placed and trustworthy spy. Such information might be useful for certain kinds of decisions, say foreign policy, military decisions, which way to walk. Uh, a further assumption, again restricting ourselves to certain kinds of information, perhaps a certain range of quantity, is that a price P can be established for each unit of quantity of information. The samples might include minerals such as coal and oil. And I see I have that P here. That P is going to turn into a C for cost, because P is also for probability, right? And I don't want to get those two confused. Uh, and uh, one person's uh, price is another person's cost, unfortunately, right? Because of buyers and sellers anyway. Uh, sellers and buyers, I guess. Uh, so the value of a piece of information, iota, uh, is the cost, that is the price, times the quantity of information. That's the assumption I'm making. Where C is the cost, the price per quantitative unit. For concreteness, we might suppose the price is to be paid in US dollars and quantity is measured in bits. Then C is the number of dollars per bit. It's very common to measure the quantity of information in terms of its improbability, surprise value, as I indicated before. More precisely, Shannon defined information as a kind of inverse of probability, describing it as not just one over the probability, but then taking that log to the base two, right? Which gives you the familiar bits in computer science coded information. Zero, one, 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 zero, whatever. The one over the probability part has the effect of reversing probability to improbability. And the log two part has the effect of converting this binary digits, standardly known as bits, I'm repeating myself. For the sake of simplicity, we shall write this as the bits of iota. There are various proposals how to mathematize the concept of risk. One of the best catalogs and critiques of such proposals is that of Kaplan and Garrick, 1981. They say a risk analysis consists of an answer to the following three questions. One, what can happen, e.g., what can go wrong? Two, how likely is it that this will happen? Three, if it does happen, what are the consequences? To answer these questions, we would make a list of outcomes, I'm still quoting them, or scenarios. S sub i, P sub i, X sub i. S sub i is a scenario description, for example, the sun will stop working. P i is the probability of that scenario. Uh, the sun says extremely low. And X i is a consequent evaluation measure of that scenario. I think my grandson already knows that that would be pretty bad, uh, i.e. the measure of damage. It's standard to define risk as the probability of something happening multiplied by the resulting cost or benefit if it does. Those ingredients are in those scenarios. You've got the probability and the cost or the benefit. We'll look at that. Uh, risk normally means cost, but I'm going to use it in a more general sense sometimes to mean benefit as well. And here I say it. Uh, I'm always getting ahead of myself. Risk is normally thought of in terms of the cost, the negative benefit, but clearly there are two sides to placing a bet. The positive or negative value is more commonly known as the expectation value, and is used to compare levels of risk. Shannon, of course, was dealing with the quantitative sense of information, so a comparison between risk and information in the quantitative forms is entirely appropriate. Risk typically talks of events or outcomes. This is appropriate in the context of decision making, we shall not distinguish between events, outcomes, pieces of information, and propositions, all of which philosophers can uh, finally divide even more. 
And we can thus write the risk of iota is the probability of iota times the utility of iota. And we will uh, <coughs> talk about that in a moment. Now, John Maynard Keynes, in his famous treatise on probability, defined mathematical expectation, saying it's a technical expression originally derived from the scientific study of gambling and games of chance. It stands for the product of the possible game, gain with the probability of attaining it. So that uh, has to do with mathematical expectation. And uh, it has to do with possible gain. Uh, the risk may be defined in some such way as follows. This is still Keynes. If A is the amount of good which may result, P its probability. P plus Q, of course, is 1. We're both pro uh, uh, where Q is the uh, what happens if A doesn't happen. And uh, the probability there. E is the value of the mathematical expectation. So that E equals the probability times A. And notice I've inserted some red here to make things easier to follow. Keynes just wrote PA. And I naturally read that as the probability of A. Uh, so that this is the probability of P times A. Then the risk is R, where R is P times A minus E. And, and that is P times A minus P times A. I'm just inserting P times A uh, where E had occurred. And that, of course, uh, is the same as P times 1 minus P. I'm just taking the A out. Uh, that's there's something missing there. P times 1 minus P times A. That's P times 1 minus P times A. There's an X there. And then that, of course, is just P, Q times P times A. And then the thing of P times A is E, that's just Q times E. And so what Keynes said was E measures the net immediate sacrifice should, which should be made in the hope of obtaining A. Q is the probability that the sacrifice will be made in vain. So Q times E is the risk. And I think that's the first place I know where risk was technically defined uh, using probability and some uh, mathematical uh, Marshall in 1920 described utility as follows. Utility is taken to be a correlative to desire or want. It has been already argued that desires cannot be measured directly, but only indirectly. I didn't argue that, he did. By the outward phenomenon to which they give rise, and that in those cases with which economics is chiefly concerned, the measure is found in the price which a person is willing to pay for the fulfillment or satisfaction of his desire. So notice utility is more general than C or cost. But they become very much the same if we assume that utility behaves like a linear pricing function, i.e., if we assume that the utility of I, for example, when we're talking about information, is uh, to take the uh, price times the quantity of information, and that's the yen dollars, right, times the amount of bits. And so then risk is the probability uh, times the utility, uh, uh, which can be positive or negative, as it were. Uh, and probability uh, t times the dollar sign times the bits is what that equals then. And this is, can be compared to the value of information is the cost times the quantity of information, I, ODA. And again, that's dollar signs, sorry, n dollars times bits. And so we can divide out and get that the risk of iota is the probability of iota times the value of the information iota. That's a very simple relationship. Thank you. So we get to the last slide. Thank you, Teddy. Uh, I'm just repeating in the first part what we just kind of established, given a very strong assumption, I should iterate, one that we would explore a lot if we had more time, which is in that, at least within a certain range, that you can actually price the information according to the number of bits in it, right? It's a huge assumption. But given that assumption, uh, the risk can be thought of to be the probability times the value of the information. Or you can then rearrange things and get the probability is the risk divided by the value of the information. Or you can get, and of course this is what's important to many of us, the value of the information, right, 
is the risk divided by the probability, QED. So with that, I'll say thank you. And there are some references. And I did not cite Knight, uh, except in, I guess, the uh, slide I hid. But he's the one who made the point that risk uh, involves insert uncertainty, but only can be really dealt with if you deal with it in a certain sense, which is the uncertainty is probability, has a probability attached to it, not the kind of uncertainty that uh, I think uh, Luciano was alluding to at some point. And I have two in my work. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, so that's Paul Syverson from NRL. Uh, I agree with that, Paul. And in a larger part, uh, place, uh, time, I would have skipped, said more about that. And that's one of the interesting things this really leads to, is a discussion of pricing, right? And you know how things do get priced, and how quantities enter in, and so on. But no, uh, it, it, that is a very strong assumption. <laughs> I'll just say that. Time for one more, if there is. If not, join me again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Amos and uh, Aman, for organizing and inviting me to be here. Well, thank you, Amos, second time actually for introducing me to this problem and this wonderful community. It's great to be here and discover so many, uh, I guess, ideas and people coming from discussing problems in metrics. Uh, today I'd like to report um, a few results uh, on this joint uh, project uh, Amos and I, which we've been working on for quite some time now, on intrinsic value of information. Firstly, thanks to the sponsor, well, I mean, beside the, well, I guess, the official uh, uh, Office of uh, Currency Controller, I'll uh, also to send NSF. Now, in terms of, uh, of this talk, first of all, I'd like to say what the talk is not about and then to get to the actual uh, problem. So the problem is not to discuss about information or complexity. So information, and you know, I can choose your preferred definition of information. I'd love to hear a few of them, Shannon, Hubbard, or Enis, but there are also the Q deformations that we've seen earlier. Uh, it's not, we're not gonna discuss about form of complexity, also that came up in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, information as a way of measuring information. Instead, what we'd like to talk about is a value of information. Now, what is this, right? Well, let me tell you about the approach, what we try to do. We start with a set of axioms about this value of information, and we like to construct a set of functions that satisfy those axioms. So we're going to investigate the existent uniqueness of those functions. Technically,
basically, if you have, well, if at least one and it's unique, then that one would be the intrinsic value of information. And we would show that there exists an intrinsic value of information. On the other hand, if we show that we have two or more, that's not unique, technically there is no intrinsic value because you have, you have to make a choice at some point to choose one of those sets. Nevertheless, we're going to investigate the set of those. So we're going to show that there exists, first of all. And it turns out that it's not unique. However, we're going to try to parameterize and to find interesting points of this set of uh, value of information, what we call value of information functions. Okay? Ingredients that may be added, added at a later time, so are not now here, we're not going to discuss about partial information or contradictory information. I, I, perhaps I'm going to make some comments about what, uh, what influence these two hypotheses uh, would have would bear on our uh, set of axioms. Okay, um, good. In terms of the axiomatic, so let me start discussing the axiomatic part. We're going to concentrate on finite sets, <laughs> finite information sets. Capital X, uh, we, call it, uh, we call it an information set, and let's say it's elements x1 to xn, we have capital N elements. You can think of it, for instance, as chapter is in a book, it's in a library, or we're going to discuss later on an example which involves a list of candidates in an election, for instance. So you have, uh, in that case, X is basically the set of candidates, and we're going to discuss various values you know, assigned to the sets of these candidates, which are these. Okay, so we have this finite information set. Now, a, uh, a value information function, what it likes to do is to assign a number, a value, to a subset of x. Okay, so take a subset, capital A, and have to get a, a number. So more general, V is a real value function defined, defined over the power set of x. Okay, so now I, I guess it would be a good time to actually describe what are the actual axioms, right? What we want out of this. Well, we're going to have two type of uh, value of information functions. So I start with what we call the type A value of information function. It's a function that satisfies the following. First is the normalization, so like the value of empty set to be zero. And the value of the uh, entire set to be, uh, to be one. Okay, we want positivity. So any subset would have to have a non-negative value. And then there's a third property, which is E, which we call concavity of type A, or a some form of super additive for this kind of measure. It says the following, that if you take a union of two sets, the value of the union has to be bounded below, that has to be larger, greater than or equal to the sum of the values minus the value of intersection. Okay, square root, two sets. Okay, uh, just in terms of notation, the uh, script F sub A of X is not the set of this type A value of information functions, minus over the set X. And if you look a little bit careful, uh, you'll notice that the set itself an element of this uh, two to power n dimensional space, uh, unit q. But specifically what the function is, is basically it's an assignment of numbers, right, all subsets. And you have two to power n subsets, that's the power set. The empty set goes to zero, the total set goes into one, and all the other numbers are actually in between zero and one. The uh, non-negative, the positivity plus concavity, which is additivity implies monopolism. And therefore it gets us to zero and one. Okay. Let me comment a little bit why we want this. So the first two properties, non-negativity and normalization, seems to be relatively reasonable. Like you can buy them. So negative, you can put the information of zero, maybe. Normalize to zero, one, you have to study some scale. Now, these actually two are not only reasonable, but actually are in some sense consistent with what we said earlier, that we don't take into account contradictory information. And you assume that X provides full information. So in some sense you can think of, or at least I can think of that X, the fact that X provides full information, that's how I normalize the value of X to be one, right? And contradictory information, well, maybe, you may think that contradictory information may decrease the value, maybe, maybe not, it depends on how, you know, your point of view in terms of how you give contradictory information. But in case you do so, well, we don't take that into account. The value doesn't decrease when you increase a set, right? It's monotonicity. So that's why we are not dealing with contradictory, so at least, if you have an interpretation of contradictory information decrease the value of your set, well, this is not captured here. Therefore, we are not discussing the problem. If you don't have that one, that's fine. No problem. Still, uh, I don't make any claim about that. All right, now what about the third problem? Well, the third problem is super So, okay, this is. 
is actually the interesting uh, part. Actually, that's uh, the thing that uh, got me going on for this problem. We wanted to formalize the statement that the value of a system is larger than the sum of the values of its parts. Right? So how do you formalize that? Well, if you say if you have two D joint sets A and B, you like the value of the unit to be greater than or equal to the sum of the two values, right? This is actually known as uh, super additivity. In terms of the measure theory, it turns out that that's a super additivity. Additivity would be equality, but we want here greater than or equal to a super additivity. Right? Now, this is clear how it works for these joint sets. But more or less. If you don't have these joint sets, what do you do? Well, in the type A, the form of concavity we discussed earlier, uh, we basically, we subtract, on the right-hand side, we subtract the value of the intersection. If you don't, so if you try to naively extend this uh, inequality star to all sets, well, you get an easy contradiction. If you get exactly the same set twice, take the union, well, so you obtain exactly the same set, so the value of A is the value of A union is A, and you get that the lower bound twice the value of A, because the value of A is less than or equal to zero, and you don't get basically anything, right? You get a contradiction. Maybe of X would be one, so you get the other contradiction. So exactly in order to avoid this problem, if you subtract the intersection, in this case you don't get any contradiction. Now I'm making this comment now because there is a different way of extending star, and that would be the type B value information function that I'm going to describe shortly. Right, now, so the type B, what we look at, it's something similar. Uh, it's a function also real value defined over the power set. You get the normalization and positivity as before. But now what's different is that the concavity, we want this value of union to be bounded below by the sum of the values to hold for all sets except these two cases, when A is included in B or B is included in B. Because basically those are the two cases when you get contradiction. And those are the only two cases. What are missing? Those are the only two cases, right? And well, that's interesting, and I'm going to show you shortly that, in fact, uh, it's possible to construct such a thing, therefore, you know, don't get a contradiction. But the existence here maybe is not trivial. And the previous case may not be so hard to think about it, but here may not be so trivial, but it is actually true that it's possible to construct. Okay, now, just as a consequence, the immediate consequences of this, or maybe not so immediate, but it's true that, uh, okay, so notation F B this type B, uh, the information functions of X, and again, it's including zero one because of common policy. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a different generalization of inequality. The uh, value of the system is larger than the sum of the value of its parts. But in general, the type A concavity, superadditivity, implies that in general, the uh, value of information grows linearly with the set size. The constant C is essentially the minimum of value of individual elements because of the superadditivity you can get there. Now for the type B, it's interestingly enough, it turns out that in general you get actually an exponential growth. If you work out the details, it is not, doesn't grow in general linearly, it has to grow exponentially. I'll, I'll come into that in actually why that is the case. And um, uh, I think I'll have to check the slide right back. Okay, now. So, so far we just give a set of definitions, right? And you obtain these two types, type A, type B, based on how you generalize the uh, concavity and equality for the joint sets. Now, what do we want next? Okay, so there are such functions. I'm gonna show you some. There are more than one, two or more, right? There are two, 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 two. But uh, in that case, if you have so many, you, have, you want to know, okay, more about the structure. It's not that hard to see that in fact the definitions are invariant to, com uh, to convex combinations. If you have two such functions that satisfy either property A or property B, normalization positivity, for instance, any convex combination will satisfy again those properties as well as the concavity type A or type B. Therefore, the set of possible value uh, of information functions, either type A or type B, is going to be. Uh, a convex set. If you have a convex set, this finite dimension is easy to show that it's closed, it's bonded because it's a unit cube. Well, uh, we have the crane milman theorem that tells you that the convex set in itself has to be a convex combination of its extreme points, the vertices. So it's interesting in that case to identify the extreme points. Uh, by way of example, or just as a 
practice is if instead of super additivity, if you had additivity, so equality, you uh, turn the machine, if you had to crank the machine, and you discover that in that case, the vertices, the extreme points, are exactly the Dirac measures. And we build exactly the probability measure functions. PMF are exactly this value of information function in that case. And the extreme points are exactly the Dirac measures. For every point, you get the uh, measure of any set to be, well, one if it contains a point, zero otherwise. And those are exactly the extreme points. The, and those are in one to one correspondence to the set X itself. The question is, what happened in this case? These are for type A, type B. What are the extreme points? How many there are? Are they in correspondence to the point or something else? Well, let me show you. So, how, what, what, you know, give you a feeling about what happens. Let's take, well, let's have this type A. And we're looking at the, uh, we see the extreme point, the vertices of this kind of set. Well, I identify, I'm going to describe two such constructions, two such sets, two such uh, uh, extreme points. Uh, one we call dictatorial, in some sense, our generalization of the uh, Dirac's. Because what you do, you choose a subset, an empty subset A of X, and you find the value of the information function as being one on any set that includes A and zero otherwise. So the difference to Dirac is that A is not just a one point set, but it's a, a subset. It turns out that each such function is an extreme point. Okay. Exactly what that means. So it means that if you want to write it as a complex combination of two such other functions, v1 and v2, you see between 0 and 1. So it turns out that v1 must be equal to v2, must be equal to v2, equal to v2. Yeah, that's what it's in point. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is one kind of, well, it's dictatorial because, you know, it's like a winner take all with respect to that set. Either you include or don't include. There is, however, a different class, and let's call it democratic or equalitarian, same point, where actually if you fix a D, an integer between 2 and n minus 1, not 1, no, it can't for the matter, and your function depends on the cardinal of your set. Maybe if the cardinal is below D is 0, if it's above, well, it grows linearly, and here is more or less how it grows with the side. It turns out that this is again an extreme point. You have to work a little bit, but it's not too hard to show that it's actually an extreme point. For the type B, for the type B, uh, the question is a little bit more complicated. Let me just give you two examples. So the equivalent to what we had earlier, like the dictatorial, this case actually is not zero, one. It has to grow powers of two. It's related to my exponential growth comment that there. There are actually two variants of this one. I don't spend much time. For the other one, the democratic, again, it's, uh, you fix a B, and depending on the corner of your set, to be zero is below, above as you grow by a factor of two, so it looks like this exponential growth. Now, uh, <coughs> so I think I'm running, well, running out of time. So I was having an application here. Uh, okay, let me just briefly describe that one. It's a discontinuous function here? Yeah, yeah, well, this is on a discrete set anyway. <coughs> so you have discrete, uh, the domain is a finite uh, set of things from zero to capital. Yeah, it has a geometry. Um, so, um, okay, so just as a, as a quick, the, uh, the application I mind was the following, so list right things. Imagine that you have a couple of candidates, captain and candidates, and you like to assign values to subsets of these candidates. And I'm gonna use the uh, type D uh, information function, which is, I call here, suitable for a game changer. So it turns out that uh, if you go into the details, uh, when you do the comparison, I mean, for that kind of growth, exponential that I mentioned, it's due to the fact that the value of a set has to be greater than or equal to the maximum sum of two, the value of two subsets, one by removing one point or another by removing another point. And in this case, I'm exactly at the limit. So it has to be equal to maximum, there's a minimum growth of this function. And exactly this kind of equality or inequality would imply exponential growth. But let's assume that by value is exactly the maximum of the sum, maximize over a pair of points. And we generate the individual preferences, value of individual elements, randomly, let's say uniform, 0, 1, and we normalize so that the value of the total set is 1. And we'd like to see how many distinct rankings can you achieve using this thing. And basically, at the end, you, you list, you order the subsets according to this value. Right? Now, it turns out that the number of cheap rankings, possible rankings, grows very fast. So, with you know, just four elements, 
you have 16 elements in the power set, but if you think about possible rankings, at least a priori, if you remove the empty set and the whole set, which should be first and the last element, you get a huge number already that's power set. But actually, when you turn the machine and you see what you get, you get a much smaller number. But uh, you know, there's some, some uh, well, there's a huge number of possible rankings that you might potentially obtain, but actually you obtain kind of now, what's interesting about that, so for the elements, maybe it's not that, but starting with 40, it gets even slightly clearer. So, you actually get a, a distribution of probabilities for various rankings. So, this is the potential ranking index from 0 to 10 to the power 31. Only some of them, this almost 200,000, are achieved. And here it gives you the frequency by which those rankings actually are achieved. I think uh, my time's up, so I would just conclude by saying that we studied this uh, class of concave, what we call the uh, value of information functions. We showed the form of convex set, we studied some of the extreme points, the vertices, we identified, so we have more than two, so technically there's no intrinsic, but interesting enough, we might discover later on that maybe additional axiom to increase the set. We heard of that, and we looked at the application of these rankings. Thank you. The mathematical formalism is interesting, but I'm, I'm a little puzzled as to how you apply it to the information um, application. So if I uh, have the set of n alternatives, like the candidates, one, one way I might think of it is um, I take a subset of that, and what I'm going to find out is just whether that subset occurred or the complementary subset occurred. But that doesn't seem to be the way you're thinking about the uh, the assignment of these uh, uh, real valued indexes to it. Um, so I'm just I'm just a little if you, I just like a little more about how is it information as opposed to valuing subsets. Right. So maybe here is just some sort of an intuition or some some sort of a that I have about this problem. So the type B, which is an extremely fast growth of this value of information, like almost exponential. The question that I was you know, thinking about is that is it possible to achieve all possible rankings, which would be natural or normal respect to inclusion? Or because of the growth is so fast, actually some of the rankings may not appear, may not show up. So in some sense, that, that was a question that I was you know, particularly, you know, maybe interested in or, or trying to, to answer for, for, for that uh, for the problem. Now, uh, keep in mind that all this, in all this construction, all these value of information functions, there are some uh, number of parameters, those uh, weights A1 to AN, like atomic weights in describing these functions, which were generated randomly. From one perspective, I mean, even having those weights means some subjective choice. Therefore, it's not an objective function, right, in a natural way. I mean, it's objective one condition on those numbers, but you know, those numbers in themselves are not objective or subjective. Or maybe randomly here chosen, but in general would be you have to choose somehow. Right, so, so that was maybe one problem was, was that if there exists an intrinsic value and you know, we have that kind of negative result. Uh, I'm not saying that this is the only way you can maybe use a value of information or whether, as you mentioned, maybe it's, there is a ranking and maybe the complement, whether that's possible or not, if I understand correctly the question. I, so I think, uh, well, thank Rado again. We are out of time and I'll ask you. Thanks to uh, Amos and Amant for the uh, invitation to come here today and organizing the whole conference and for all the work that we put in over the last five years. Uh, it's been very enjoyable and very stimulating to be a part of this uh, project. Uh, I owe uh, Sasha a little bit of great debt to them for taking the lead in organizing this. Um, the paper I'm going to talk about today is uh, 
joined with a colleague at Manchester, Martin Andrews, and two PhD students. So one just finished, one uh, in progress. Okay, to, uh, to start the uh, uh, so talk about what we mean by group data, give the example that sort of got us kind of thinking about these issues. It involves uh, a type of data called pseudo panel data that we encounter in economics. And it refers to a methodology that was proposed by Angus Deaton back in 1985. So the kind of situation is fleshed out when, suppose we're interested in the returns to education of individuals. So the uh, variable we're explaining is log uh, hourly wages in terms of the number of years of education. And we've got observations on individuals, I over, over time, T. Uh, or, or the, should say, observations on individuals uh, uh, over different time periods. Um, but uh, there's a, uh, the error has a kind of, the UI has a component structure that involves something that's E that's just the usual white noise unrelated uh, uh, kind of uh, error structure, and something else that, uh, something else that uh, um, uh, relates to the individual and to the birth cohort um, that they're a member of. So we're thinking here that then, in a way, the relationship between somebody's uh, wages and education does depend in part on um, when they were born, which of course seems very natural. Now this, uh, this uh, eta term that's uh, present in the, uh, uh, the era um, is uh, unobservable and may be related with the x's, and its presence there causes problems for just standard uh, estimation. Now, if we had observations on the same individuals over time, in other words, we had a panel data structure, we could finesse that presence of that unobservable to get consistent estimates of the, the parameters of the model. Uh, but the situation that Dieter was thinking about is where we don't have panel data structure, what we have what's called repeated cross sections. In other words, we have samples from the same populations taken, the same population taken over time, but the same individuals aren't getting picked. Okay, so we've got. We know they've come from the, they're samples from the same population, but it's a different sample of individuals over time. So his idea was to uh, um, kind of create a pseudo or synthetic panel data structure by taking averages of the observations. And the averages are taken uh, for cohort, to, for people from a particular boat cohort, and then the particular time in which the observation is taken. So then what we end up doing is running a regression on these sample averages. And then you can uh, uh, start estimating the parameters so we start from a model of individuals, and because of this uh, structure to the data, we then end up focusing on uh, running a regression with group data involving uh, averages of observations across groups. So, well, generally, that, that's one example, but if we have a situation where there's, uh, uh, we have observations on indivi uh, in this, by individuals and by uh, groups, if we find ourselves uh, wanting to run a regression of these group averages on each other using least squares, then another way we can think about that is that it's just an instrumental variables estimation done on the original uh, individual group level data, the, the top equation, where the instruments are just the dummies or indicator variables that indicate which group you were in. Okay? And this observation is, goes back to uh, Mr. Durbin uh, back in the 50s, but was reiterated uh, in the context of the pseudo panel literature by uh, Angus. Uh, this structure. Now, in this uh, lecture, there's concern about the estimation of these parameters. Deaton was focusing on a case where you've got uh, uh, fixed uh, numbers in a particular group, but the number of groups is uh, expanding. And then you get uh, shows sort of the standard least squares of all those uh, average data would be inconsistent, but it comes up with a way that you can uh, retrieve consistent estimation using an errors and variables type approach. Angus, the uh, Building from the uh, IV instrumental variable structure shows that if the number of groups are fixed and the number of individuals in the groups is, is going off to infinity, then you're going to get consistency, of course. And there's two kind of strands were linked uh, uh, in a paper by Devro showing that, in fact, uh, Deaton's approach can be thought of as a type of instrumental variables estimation called jackknife instrumental variables. And he also proposed a, uh, a method of, sort of second order bias correction for the methods. So, how are we going to contribute to this literature? Well, our starting point was from this interpretation as I, of the group to average uh, estimation as an instrumental variable estimation, as a moment-based approach. 
because uh, um, then the idea is that we're going to uh, uh, hook in and use that interpretation to, to try and estimate these models using some more recently developed um, methods of moment-based estimation. Because inherent in Andres' uh, interpretation of that, uh, uh, that IV estimation was it's kind of like a two-stage least squares estimation, which is the simplest uh, kind of approach. But um, there are a number of ways that uh, we might hope to do better than that, one of which uh, uh, will be to use a generalized empirical likelihood framework that uh, Richard uh, introduced into his relationship. And that's going to be the one that we're going to explore here. An advantage of taking that approach over um, in this setting and thinking about uh, this as a moment-based estimation is it provides also a framework in which you could introduce additional group-level moments beyond just uh, group membership uh, dummies, and also a, a framework that could handle uh, non-linear moment conditions, which the previous one, uh, uh, previous approach wouldn't so well. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about the model of the Optimant uh, then uh, briefly properties of the estimators, and it's just a short simulation study to illustrate that it works, and then some concluding remarks. Um, it's still very much a uh, work in progress, and we haven't uh, been able to finish the uh, application to the returns to earning uh, uh, example uh, to, to a degree to which we're satisfied yet, so I'd rather not talk about that. Okay, so the basics of the, the model, we're imagining that you've got uh, the random variables that said indexed by individuals uh, i, and uh, in group G, uh, there's NG in uh, groups, there's going to be capital G groups, because the sample size is which would be capital N, and the sum of all the uh, uh, group uh, samples. The basic structure we're assuming here is that the, the observations are, are IID within the group. Observations are independent across groups, but they don't, what it's leaving open is the possibility that the distribution is different across groups. Okay, so you're not imposing a homogeneity across the whole sample. And we're going to assume that all the uh, group sample sizes will become asymptotically large. You can imagine that a situation where there will be certain parameters that uh, uh, are present in the moments for all of the groups, and we may also have a situation where there are some parameters that are specific to the particular group uh, moments. So beta are the common ones, we might imagine the primary focus, then alpha will contain the group specific uh, moments. So you can Generic form for the moment condition will be just to take, we have the information that some function of the data of those parameters is equal to zero for, for each group. Okay, which provides us with uh, potentially a lot of moments with which we have potentially a lot of uh, parameters. To estimate of course, we've got to have more moments than uh, parameters for this to be uh, at least feasible. Uh, to make things uh, simpler for the presentation, we'll just focus on a uh, simplest of cases with a linear model um, where uh, have this error component structure that we we're talking about at the beginning because of the pseudo panel data. I assume the expectation of that eta is equal to zero. And so the moment condition that we know holds for uh, uh, each group is just that the expectation of uh, UIG is, uh, uh, is equal to zero, the true parameter value. This does leave open the possibility that the uh, X and the U may be correlated. Okay? Because this, uh, since we're not going to, uh, we're going to use this, just this simple moment across. Uh, all groups. Um, it doesn't matter whether the, uh, the U and the X are correlated. Okay, so the, the estimation we're going to talk about using this GL approach, but for those not, for, not familiar with it, it's perhaps easiest to see the kind of structure of things by going to empirical likelihood. And so if we imagine that PIG is just a uh, probability that there are the IT observation uh, in the G group takes that particular sample value, then the structure of the adapting the, the traditional structure of EL, we're going to be looking at a problem like this, where we're going to uh, uh, maximize the functions for a lot of these probabilities, and these probabilities are constrained such that the moment condition is satisfied within each group, and that the probability sets uh, sum to one within uh, each group. And if you follow through the uh, familiar analysis, what you'll get is that the, the probability takes a form that uh, can be obtained in a form that depends on this. Lambdas, which is the Lagrange multiplier on the moment constraint and the uh, uh, function that appears in the moment condition. Okay, this is, uh, if you change the uh, if you change the uh, uh, function <coughs> top, because you didn't want to do empirical likelihood, so it wants to do expansion, exponential tilting, same constraints would be there. You get a different answer here, but it would be driven by this there still be a different function of this uh, term that's here involving the lambda times the, the moment. 
And so bearing that in mind, we could then turn to the GL way of uh, uh, developing these estimates, which is a generic uh, uh, framework that nests all these different cases we might be interested in to one. There again is that same function we were talking about that drove the probabilities before. Now their appearance are a function that we call rho, okay, which has to satisfy certain restrictions. But importantly, for different choices of rho, you can get different kind of estimators that we're interested in uh, in parametrics, empirical likelihood, exponential tilting, or this CUE continuously updated estimator, uh, which is a variance on the GMF. Okay, so that provides a way we can get our, our estimates. In terms of asymptotic properties, to show that in certain conditions the estimate will be persistent, which shows that it's going to be asymptotically uh, normal. And uh, uh, we can also uh, uh, look at the second order of properties in terms of the bias, following work led by Newey and Smith, um, who looked at this for a GL uh, with uh, IID data. We can derive an expression for the second order bias. Well, this, this estimation looks qualitatively uh, very similar to, to what they had in terms of the, the structure of the estimator. Um, one thing to notice about it, as, as they have found, is that there's a term here that the pen has a row, so three, which is actually specific to the particular choice of row that you used in the uh, uh, estimation, meaning that the bias is potentially different for those the different members of the class. In the particular case, we get empirical likelihood, and that uh, term in parentheses, the one plus row three over two, that turns out to be zero. So that second uh, term drops out, so that there are fewer sources of bias in empirical likelihood than there would be. But in this specific example that we're looking at, it kind of has what would be intuitively reasonable since it's a linear model, what's been found for uh, um, linear regression models, is what's driving the bias to whether the errors are uh, uh, skewed or, or not, and whether there's a correlation between the uh, uh, u and the x in the regression. So if the errors are symmetric and there is no correlation, then there's no second. An actual uh, comparator to the uh, to GL would be uh, a generalized method of moments. So then we take the same moment condition, but just process that information in, in, a, in a different way. This time, by constructing a quadratic form in the uh, sample, then out of the sample moments, and then minimizing that with respect to the parameters. And if you do that, you can uh, show that we'll have the same uh, first order asymptotic distribution as we had up there. But then the bias, the second order bias, again, echoing the uh, results that Maria Smith had found, uh, turns out to be more complicated and there are more sources of uh, bias for GMM uh, than there are for the GL class, which is uh, a <coughs> potential reason for using the, the GL estimators. Well, the, uh, so we, just to uh, finish up, we're uh, uh, um, doing uh, Reports the results from the simulation, simulation study to see if it actually kind of works. And uh, the, the design is kind of loosely based on a, the returns to education example we want to, uh, uh, to look at, um, uh, particularly in the context of the, of the UK using the um, uh, Eight Force uh, survey. Because okay, uh, if we're interested in doing, um, looking at the returns to education, we might talking about birth cohorts of from something like 1950 through to the uh, into the uh, 70s okay. and um, there was an expansion of uh, educational opportunity in the UK in the uh, late 70s and the late the late 80s uh, the late 80s to uh, uh, early 90s uh, which came about because of changes in higher education and also a change in the examination uh, system of uh, teenage, teenagers. Um, so that uh, there was a period there where the, uh, uh, the number of years of education did go up, um, uh, did rise, so it had been fairly flat, the number of years that people typically uh, left education, and then it suddenly rose up as a result of these changes in, in the educational system. And so then clearly uh, uh, the year in which you're born will affect where, you, where you're hitting this, this increase. So if you were born before these changes came out, then you probably had uh, 12 years of uh, education. 
uh, but if you were born later, so that you hit these late reforms, then you would find you were like having more years of uh, education. So that gives us the structure here where we have that 12 uh, at the intercept and the relationship, if you like, with the regressor, which we think of as years of education. And then it's being driven by dummies that reflect the, the uh, you know, we think of as being reflected the birth cohorts here. So that, uh, and so there's a steady increase. And we're going to allow for uh, three, four, six, and eight groups. Uh, you should note that because of this, the way the thing is defined, as the properties of the data change as the number of groups increase, because then, then as the group goes up, then there's an extra two in the regressor, sorry, in the equation for x, so that the properties of the data change, so it's not spreading the same, same data generation process out of board. <coughs> and the groups is actually changing. And uh, there is a correlation between the two errors there, the u's and the, the v's. Uh, the moments we're going to look at are uh, three cases. So here, just using this uh, estimation, the first case is called case A, where the uh, instrument is just a vector of group dummies. In the second case, we're going to also concatenate that with a, uh, so there's uh, each of the dummies that can bring them back. And then there's also a redundant uh, instrument, so uh, something that's actually not related to X in any way, to see what the effect of including that would be. And here there are two of those. That's a polar case. Um, whether the, the, you're including an instrument that's unrelated to the, uh, uh, the variable in question x, but it's kind of proxying the case that you do sometimes find in these studies where you're including instruments that they're related, but they're not very strongly related at all, they're very weakly related. So they're probably providing very little to the estimation. And uh, previous work uh, has shown that, uh, uh, as we will in the simulation, if we compare uh, GEL with uh, GMM, then uh, the presence of those kind of variables can force a difference between the estimates. Okay. So the first case was uh, um, looking at uh, um, where there's just the, the dummies, okay. uh, just group memberships in. This is EL, ET, and GM, GMM down here. Um, and we can only, as I said, because of the properties of the data change, you can only really compare down the, the, the columns. You can see that apart from the uh, First case, G equals 3, G equals, uh, G equals 4. Uh, but as the number of moments, uh, then GMM is doing better or comparably. But then as the uh, number of moments, the number of groups increases, uh, EL is performing better. And we can actually, by going back to that bias formula, we can see what's happening. Because it's quite a tight structure. You get something that mirrors what's been shown for the, for the linear model. But in this particular case, the bias is an uh, important feature of the bias GL, is that it's just a constant amount, irrespective of the number of moments, assuming that these other parameters are constant, but bias with GMM is, depends on the degree of over-identification, G being the number of groups, and K minus uh, uh, K being the number of parameters, which is two in this case. That also explains why we do so well here, because if we're, if we're over-identified by one, then there's no second order bias with GMM, which is what we have. But then as the number of groups goes up, the bias is increasing. And as the redundant uh, instruments are in, uh, included, you find, if you look at the last case, um, then you find that the, the properties of EL uh, and ET are holding up pretty well, but the GMM estimator is uh, uh, starting to exhibit more bias, as we uh, might expect to be going less reliable. Okay, so that just, uh, because there are some issues, that the trade-off, of course, of GMM and EL can be to do with convergence problems, GMM usually works fine, sometimes you get from the L, we did have some problems. So those assume that the, the moments exist for the bias calculations, but if we looked at the medians, GL are possibly the median are biased, and GM are upward bias. And we found to do second, if you're looking at confidence intervals, we found we had to resort to the bootstrap to get uh, reliable uh, coverage probabilities in this case. Uh, so the last slide, just to finish up there, so uh, to summarize the idea was to, to, uh, to go back to this uh, economics will often each find ourselves working with these kind of group average data. This could be interpreted as a moment-based moment estimation on the individual observations. Uh, we were taking that idea and trying to exploit it using GLO framework um, to see uh, whether we could get improved esti estimation. And uh, initial results uh, are encouraging them to do that. Other advantages of the program is get of that approach is you've got additional information beyond group membership that you want to include in the estimation. Provide a natural way to do that. Other things that could be done could be 
things to model specification tests. I haven't talked about that, but um, that's something, of course, that naturally comes out of the GEL framework. And we're also going to go on to apply that to, um, uh, to apply these ideas to the example I was talking about before. And some other ones. Okay, thank you. One quick question. Otherwise, yeah, I got I... one. Oh, okay. Just a comment. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but Yuichi Kitamura and I put a paper in the Journal of Econometrics 2002. Okay, we did a simulation as well, the exponential tilting estimator. It was something drawn from the labor economics literature okay. where they were critiquing uh, the biases of the GML. And in that particular simulation, we also showed the biases. That's okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll take a look at that. So your I've... results are, are consistent with what we Okay, thank you. I'll take a look at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Amos, for building this wonderful institute. Thank you, Aman, for putting me in the program. And even more than that, just between Alistair and uh, Richard, which is probably to see is quite optimal for me. <laughs> uh, and uh, okay, so it is not for with uh, Sarah Shoudhury, who used to be my colleague at UC Chateau, as is now in Maggie Montreal. So in, in this talk, what we this work we want to do is to use in time practice for multiple optimization to improve the final sample performance of score test. Uh, and I'm going to explain why. Okay, so after a short introduction, I will define the entire practice for vectors, define an asymptotic theory for this entire practice, sketch very briefly Monte Carlo result, and hopefully conclude if I have. Okay, so uh, as in the uh, from our paper, we are in the context of uh, GMN, so we basically have a bunch of normal conditions which identify some parameters. And we are interested in testing some particular value of these parameters, either on the complete vector or on the subvector. And I'm going to see that it makes an important difference. Um, it has been well known now since you were aware that if you are in this context, the natural idea which would be just to say whether this given value, you know, you want to test that it's not, you could just say, let us say whether it not fulfills the moment condition. If you just do that directly, you have not much power, and you have more power if you focus on the first order condition of uh, efficient GM. Um, moreover, it has been known since mid 97 in 2004 that uh, general sample of likelihood, as it has been defined by Alistair just before me, so I don't know why it's lucky to be just after Alistair, because Alistair has done the work of uh, introducing the topic. Uh, we know that it provides final sample improvement uh, of the first order condition through something we can interpret as implied for it is, and we can come back, come back, come back. And uh, it has been shown, and you can see that in this literature, the yeah, is, uh, one of the most important things is Richard Schmitz, which is coming just after me, so <laughs> another, another thing good for me. Uh, it has been shown that this kind of uh, approach is even more important in case of what we call weak identification. So I'm going to elaborate on that. Okay, so what are first the implied qualities we have in mind? So basically, we are going to use uh, preceded distances. Uh, where typically we have in particular for uh, uh, gamma equal zero the uh, activization of entropy and for gamma equal minus one the empirical likelihood. And the idea is to fish for qualities. So first for given value of unknown parameters theta, as I said we don't try to know what goods they are. So we should just say for this value of parameter theta, this moment condition should be fulfilled. And you are fishing for the Distribution the closest to the empirical distribution, right? If you are not the constraint, the optimal would be the uniform distribution one over n at each point of the data. And okay. the closest but fulfilling the normal condition. Uh, as it has been explained by Alistair, so it's Alistair, uh, it's convenient to think about that in terms of the dual program. And uh, uh, this is typically the kind of thing which has been defined this morning as something like Q log and Q exponential. Basically, the thing you find when, you know, when gamma equal minus one, you're back to log, okay? And uh, uh, otherwise, you are, you are, you are, you are generalization of that. 
And so the Lagrange multiplier are find a solution of this program. And so I'm going to play a key role in my, in my talk. You have this guy, which are basically the Lagrange multiplier associated to these restrictions that, that you find by, by, by this one whole program. So they tell you to what extent this restriction are binding for this particular value of theta. Is this particular value of theta far from, from fulfilling the moment condition or not? Um, and so, um, I will do, you, you may know that for efficient GNM, so Jimmy Patton is a long term variance matrix. I will do basically as if the data were independent, so I have no serial correlation. Um, uh, and then the first thing I'm going to realize is that the Lagrange multipliers I've just defined before, <coughs> you remember I said to some extent they tell me how much are binding as this moment restriction are. Likely they are or not. So it is not surprising that they should be tightly related to the sample moment, standardized in some way. Uh, it, it is actually true, this proportionality relationship is actually true only in two cases. And I think it may explain why these two cases are to some extent uh, benchmark for this family of uh, estimation techniques and inference techniques. It is true in two cases, either for gamma equal one, gamma equal minus one. So it is gamma equal one, if you come back, gamma equal one gives you a quadratic optimization on the quality, so it basically you square distance. And it can be shown that uh, in terms of estimation of theta, you are going to go after that to, to GMM. Uh, gamma equal minus one, you have zero, so basically you have the limit case of log Okay, so empirical data. So basically this is two polar cases and once more there is, it seems to be some important reason to, to set the focus on these two ones in particular because you have this nice uh, interpretation of the Lagrange multipliers. Then if you elaborate on that, when you go uh, to the estimation of the variance matrix, uh, basically uh, in the first case, gamma equal one, you are just going to say that the Lagrange multipliers are like that with the naive estimation of the, of the variance metric of the moment condition. If you go to the second case, it is the first way to understand why <coughs> the is that in this case, you can show that the Lagrange multipliers are two, still on this way. But now to estimate the variance matrix, you take advantage. You don't take the weight for the logarithm one over n. You take advantage of the, of the so-called implied qualities. Okay. What is the informational contract of this implied quality? Actually, uh, this is something we have studied a lot with uh, my former student, Gertrude Antoine and Julian Bonal, in the case, uh, in the case, uh, Gamma equal one, that says a quadratic case. But uh, we realize it is also true in the, in the empirical lecture case, and it may be something which has not been pointed out in the literature yet. The point I want to make is that one way to, un to understand the benefit of using this implied point is to think, how does it, be, does it allow me to improve the estimator of some, of some, of some, of some, of some variable, the of expectation of some variable? And the way I am improving the estimator of the expectation of some variable is that I don't take the sample mean anymore. I take something which takes into account my information on the moments. Uh, I could call that a control variable ID because it's like a control variable in, in, in Monte Carlo studies, right? Basically, you reduce the variance by subtracting, making the residual of the regression on this function on the moment conditions that you are assumed to be fulfilled. And so once more, we had elaborated a lot on that in the quadratic case with Antoine and Bonal, but it is actually true also in the empirical latitude case, and I think this result has, an exact result has not been pointed out yet. Uh, that is to say, we still have this interpretation, but now you take gamma equal minus one. That is to say that to estimate these covariances and variances, you use a better estimator because you use the implied parties themselves. So there is a, a cost and a benefit to that. The benefit is that you have a better, if you find an example, a better estimation. The cost of that is that to some extent this does not give you a close form formula for the implied parties because the implied parties in the second case, gamma equal minus one, which equal a cube, they are on both sides because they are hidden in these covariances and variances. So it's one way, one way to understand why computation are more complicated with the empirical data. Okay. So I'm going to set the focus on these two, these two things. 
Now going to the score vectors I'm going to use for testing. Um, another thing which is not often said in the literature is that, after all, you know, I have defined this implied quantities for a given value of theta. For each given value of theta, I have defined this implied quantities that was the shot gamma of my information criteria. Now, after all, if I want to estimate theta, maybe I'm not forced to use the same gamma. Maybe I can use another gamma star. This has been done, actually, in the literature a couple of times, up to the best of my knowledge. This has been done by Julian Schenak, where she showed that using gamma star equal minus one, so at the estimation stage, you come back to the empirical latitude, so you take advantage of the higher order properties of empirical latitude. But still, you compute the properties with gamma equals zero in your case, which is feedback at the distance, to get advantage of the robustness of that. Uh, we have done something also in the kind of similar spirit with uh, Nagami and Boyeru, where we took gamma star equal one at the estimation stage to be back to GMN, but keep gamma equals zero the click for getting exponential fitting of the point. What I mean is that, generally speaking, you may have several reasons to think that the two exponent here may be different. Okay. If you do that, basically, after a minor twist, I'm not going to go back to the details, but basically, you can raise the first order condition in this way. The first order condition of estimation of theta, the unknown parameters. And so the funny thing is that you have, you, you have two different gamma showing up for the implied properties and for the Lagrange multipliers. And I remind you that we like gamma equal plus or minus one to get this proportional equation. So this will be the basis for our studies of different score vectors. What we mean by score vectors in geometry or statistics is that to test the null hypothesis, you look at how the, how the null hypothesis is far from the first order condition of the estimation, that's to say from this, from this condition. So thinking about that suggests at least five score vectors. Uh, because typically, for score vectors, you can take, you can wait in some way the Jacobian. You know, if you remember the way the score vector was written. Basically, you have quite easier to wait the Jacobian. And then, you have quite easier to define the estimation of the variance in the multiplayer. So, if you use these two things, you realize that you end up with a score vector where you can wait the property with the Jacobian with some property, G and Jacobian. You can, weight the variance term with some other properties, V like variance, and you can fix these three, these two weight system, either the naive one, one over n for everybody, or for gamma equal one, which is Euclidean empirical latitude, quadratic, or gamma equal minus one, which is uh, empirical, uh, genuine empirical latitude. So you end up with five score vectors that you may want to consider, as you consider in this paper, basically depending the way to take for the Jacobian and the way to take for the, for the variance. Um, the, the standard GMM, as pointed out uh, by Alastair, has not very good final sample properties because basically it does not take advantage of this information. It just takes one, one over L as weight in the way. Empirical latitude takes weight of empirical latitude. Euclidean empirical latitude that says the quadratic stuff. Actually, it's not so well behaved because is put the weight, the right weight on the on the on the, the geographical part, but not on the variance part, as we have seen actually in some formula. Uh, this is the reason why with Bertie Antoine we propose the we propose the three step of the latitude where in the third step we plug in the right weight on both sides. And Gerbaj and Richard have proposed also another hybrid case where we put the the E L weight on the on this side and the nice weight on the other side. So basically, this is the five case to consider. Uh, just to mention, uh, we don't play with the weights on the Jacobian side because we have a compact paper just, just issued in econometric reviews where we do that, where in the case where the variance is known. So it's not, it's already done. Okay. When you want to test for a sub vector, the RF is a bit more complicated for the following reason is that. We say that as I want to test for the subvector, I have just to focus on the first part of the score corresponding to the first set of components of theta that are on the test. The question is now the null does not define completely theta, but only a subvector. 
So what theta do you plug in in the star of this uh, When you want to do the conventional plugging, you have basically to, to solve the second set of equations to say, taking into account my constant of theta y, what is my estimator of theta 2? And for that, I have to solve the second set of further functions. And uh, realize that in this case, your life is really, really complicated because theta shows up at much more occurrences than usual due to this implied practice. Uh, and even, you know, with empirical likelihood, just don't think about it. But even actually with Euclidean empirical likelihood, which is we have close form formula and so on, but still, this equation are quite nasty. Okay? Uh, so this does not work. That is to say, with conventional plug-in, there is no way to exploit the functional content of, of the L implied practice without doing in the, the nasty stuff of the numerical stuff. Which is very different of the case with the complete vector because complete vector, the null gives you the value. So you have nothing to compute. The value is a parameter. OK, so since the man it is well known that there is a solution for that, which is the C alpha test, where basically you correct the first part of the score vector by the second part because you give up efficient estimation of theta 2 and you just take a root and consistent estimator of theta 2 that you have in your hands. And in this case, you have one because you have GMM, you have whatever you want. Okay, so basically, you can play like that, that for defining the score vector. I'm not going to go too, too, too. I'm not going to go too much to the details. Okay. What are the weak identification issues you meet in this case? Is that, okay, uh, since Clever uh, 2005, even though I did not mention this point explicitly. The control variable interpretation. In Monte Carlo, we know that which is nice with control variable, it is variance reduction. But there is here another advantage. There is here another advantage, which is you orthogonalize respect to the moment condition. So there is this way of some uh, uh, perverse behavior of the world, especially in the case of good weed identification. And this is kind of so why it works with empirical attitude because we have the same interpretation. So <coughs> By contrast, it is known that when the second part theta 2 is not well identified, you have some trouble and you have to go to the so-called projection C alpha test of my quarter with the result. I will have no time to go on that today. So let me just, uh, to use my few minutes left, stress that it seems to me that there was something missing in the literature to understand the behavior of this, uh, the scientific behavior of this implied way. Because, you know, the point is, you want to replace a naive sample mean to estimate something by something we take within the implied practice. Since we can play with different implied practices, because you know we have explained that you know quadratic is simpler, typically, do we lose something at first order? And actually, we don't lose if we can show this kind of asymptotic equivalence. Okay? And for getting this kind of asymptotic equivalence. It seems to me that you need more than what is available in the literature because <coughs> typically this kind of product is not sufficient. For sure, asymptotically, you get the same thing, but when you compute a sample mean with that over n observation, it does not tell you anything. <coughs> Actually, in the simplest case of, of quadratic, you do a correction with respect to the 1 over n, which is of order 1 over n to the power of 3 half. So if you want to show that your improvement is a real improvement, you have to do better than that. Okay. Uh, this is actually what we show. We show that the, the difference between the two is a little O of that and not a big O of that. Fortunately, otherwise, otherwise we, we have lost the same performance. Uh, and with the identification issues, it has to be true not only at the true value of the parameters, but also wherever the parameters are, are fully identified, because typically the moment condition of order, whatever, it's called the fact, maybe it's even though it's not as a true Okay, so I will have no time to go into detail of that. Let me just say that the Monte Carlo results show that it works. No, we will be surprised if I tell you that the Monte Carlo studies this it works, but uh, okay. So you will see that I'm honest because I will tell you that what we proposed with Antoine and Bonal does not work that, that well, okay? Uh, Alistair has pointed out the importance of skewness. So say beyond we have identification, there is also the importance of skewness which makes that you want to, to weigh the Jacobian, but also the variance matrix. So this works. 
Uh, when it is on a subvector, it could be a threat to have some power loss uh, due to the projection you do not have that much. Okay, thank you. So I guess I'll jump to the, add to the conclusion. Okay. You know, we are uh, at Infometrics, so I'm glad to say that using information theory to deliver a guide practice seems to be something relevant to do. Uh, I must say that it seems to me, uh, I, I talk under the control of Richard, maybe, but that this has been a bit of a look into literature. So literature has something GMM, has replaced GMM by GEM, and taking advantage of many of the benefits of GEM, but not so much using this implied practice. They, of course, they are, they are coming with the, with the game, but uh, here we don't we use them explicitly, we show them explicitly their interpretation, and we have the feeling that it delivers some, some benefit. Uh, this is what's going to be today. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we have time for a question. In the back there, yeah. Oh, you're going to have to. Eric, perhaps you could share uh, some insight uh, about how the simulated uh, moments methods compare to the implied probabilities technique that you have. So, so we know that we could implement uh, testing and estimation with simulated moments, but that would be like using uh, distributions minus the as a simulation. Here, you solve the inverse problem, so your probabilities for simulation are important, more important. Yes, uh, this is of course an, uh, an important question. Uh, in the same way, I criticize what I've done with Antoine and Bonal. I will criticize what I did, what I call indirect inference of years ago, because it is an extension of simulated method of moments. And we pretend it is like GMM, but as you say, it is, it is not fair because we knew the fully parametric model to run the simulation. So, by the way, your question is how to use this implied practice, even possibly for simulation, for the staff or whatever. It has been done by some, some people, and it has been shown to have some, uh, some, some good properties. So surely it is another, you are absolutely right to point this out. I would say that, in my opinion, the simple properties are not sufficiently used. <laughs> of course, to be, to, as she said, should be used also for some simulation based method. I completely agree with that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. One more quick question. Uh, you know, I, I didn't really capture how you're defining the applied probability. Uh, and what Do you want to summarize? Yeah, in the nutshell, right. in the nutshell, there's a party the closest to one over n, but such that the moment conditions are fulfilled at the value of two times. Right. Okay, so that minimization of, uh, or maximization of entropy, if you want, subject to the constraint of the moment conditions. Okay, thank you. Anyway, I was going to thank Ammon for uh, organizing the conference and. Uh, through this uh, presentation on the program, I know how difficult it is to organize uh, uh, conferences uh, and get them to run well from personal experience. And I think this conference is, is achieving that, that objective. But I'd also like to express uh, personal congratulations to Aman on the fifth anniversary of the Informatics uh, Institute I, and my personal appreciation to uh, Aman because uh, to I'm sorry, uh, because uh, without him, none of this would have been possible. So, uh, thanks very much indeed. Okay, um, so this, uh, this, this works. Okay, good. So, this is uh, joint work with uh, uh, an ex student of mine, uh, Paolo Parenti, and uh, uh, let me say a little bit about. Uh, so this is, the, this is what we're going to do here. Um, we're in the IID framework, so it's a cross-section, short panel kind of environment. And we're interested in conditional moment models, so we'll provide an explicit uh, definition of what we mean by that uh, in, in a moment. We're interested in tests for additional conditional moment constraints. We'll show the asymptotic null distribution for the, uh, the statistics that underpin those tests. And likewise, there are asymptotic local alternative distribution. And uh, I may just present the uh, summary of the uh, simulation experiment. 
Okay, so we know what to do in uh, uh, the classical likelihood uh, context when we have uh, maintained information. For example, if we look at the likelihood ratio test for uh, a, a particular uh, constraint, in, uh, then we just subtract off the likelihood or the log likelihood rather for the uh, maintained uh, information from the log likelihood that corresponds to the null hypothesis. So the question is, is what can we do in the uh, conditional moment uh, context? And uh, what we're going to do is something similar to uh, the, uh, the classical case, so where we define a restricted test that incorporates the, uh, uh, the maintained information as opposed to an unrestricted test that doesn't uh, impose that uh, information. So the question is, is how, how do we go about this? And uh, so maybe move on to the, the next slide. So we know that tests are just, we can construct unconditional moment tests straightforwardly by just correlating the condition, uh, functions of the conditioning information with the, uh, uh, the, the, the objects that underpin the uh, conditional moment. But we know that in general those uh, types of tests or test based on those unconditional moment uh, uh, restrictions are going to be inconsistent because they won't span the whole, uh, uh, if you like, the space of uh, possibilities for uh, the conditional moment restrictions that we wish to test. So what we're going to make use of is uh, this equivalence uh, result that uh, is in, uh, exploited in a paper by uh, Donald Edwards and Newey, where there's an equivalence between an infinite number of uh, unconditional moment restrictions and the uh, conditional moment restrictions that we we're actually interested in. So that immediately tells us then the type of test that we can write down is going to be of the kind of likelihood, this kind of classical type of test, because we could just write down, say, uh, a GMM type form of test or a GL type of form of test for the, uh, the null hypothesis uh, restrictions, that's including the maintained restrictions alongside the uh, additional moment restrictions, and then subtract off the statistic that corresponds to the maintained uh, uh, restrictions. Okay, but what we have to do is to be aware here that uh, we've got the sample size going off to infinity and also the number of, uh, of unconditional moment restrictions going off to infinity. So we need to provide an analysis to, uh, uh, to, to arrive at what the large sample distribution is of that, uh, of that of such statistics. Well, intuitively we know what we've got to do because we know that we've got something that can with, with fixed number of unconditional moment restrictions, we'll have a chi-squared distribution but with, with a certain number of degrees of freedom, but that degrees of freedom is going to go off to infinity. So the usual way of dealing with that is to location and scale correct location by uh, subtracting off the degrees of freedom and then dividing by the square root of twice the degrees of freedom fixes the scale. And then we know intuitively, at least from standard statistics, that that's going to go off to a standard normal distribution. So that's basically the way that we uh, tackle the problem, uh, problem here. But there's a difficulty about what to do with the maintained information because remember what we're doing is not only correlating the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the additional conditional moment uh, object with uh, the conditioning information but we're going to also have to do, that, do the similar thing with the, uh, the maintained conditional uh, information object. And what to, so if we're going to actually incorporate in an asymptotic sense the information from the, uh, the maintained hypothesis, we need to make sure that when we're allowing the number of conditional moments to increase for the null uh, conditional mo uh, unconditional moments to increase, we need to make sure that the maintained unconditional um, moments increase at the same rate. Otherwise, that uh, statistic, well, if we allow it to, for example, to increase at a slower rate, then that maintained information essentially is going to get lost asymptotically. Okay, so what this slide does is it essentially tells you uh, exactly what uh, we're doing. And one thing we might note is that when we look at the large sample analysis, we don't need to uh, uh, estimate parameters uh, efficiently. All we need is a, a root n, n being the sample size, consistent estimator for the parameters uh, of, of interest. But what we find in the simulations is that efficient estimation is actually the best thing to, 
to do if we can do it. But uh, the asymptotics doesn't give us any guide uh, as far as that's concerned. Okay, so some uh, notation. So as I said, we're in the cross-section, small panel, short panel uh, circumstance, so we're in an IID framework. We're going to think of uh, having a, a moment vector U here, which is going to depend on the data observation Z and the parameter beta. Now, I use the subscript N here to indicate that this is the maintained, uh, if you like, error vector in, uh, in this setup. So I'm going to use M as generic subscript, superscript, whatever, to indicate something that corresponds to the maintained hypothesis. I'm going to use A, likewise lowercase a, to uh, correspond to the additional uh, error, error vector that we're going to uh, examine. That will become clearer on the next slide. So J here is going to be the dimension of U. So JM is the dimension of UM. Beta here has dimension P, M, for the maintained hypothesis. We're going to have some parameter space, B, M. And we're going to have a set of, set of instruments, so this is a conditioning information. And we're going to use the generic uh, notation S for a vector of instruments. And so S, M are the uh, instruments for the maintained hypothesis, which is given at the uh, bottom of this uh, slide. Okay, so um, next page. Okay, so what's the test problem? So we've got IV's uh, SA, instruments, of, this is essentially a correspond to the additional moments. So SM could be included or excluded in SA. We're not uh, going to say anything about that. So, and our additional error vector is this U sub A, and we can have this uh, parameter beta A. So we're allowing the instruments to differ between null and main, uh, sorry, the additional uh, uh, moments between the additional moments and the maintained moments. And we're also going to allow the uh, parameters maybe to differ as well. So this is the null hypothesis down the bottom here that we want to test. And uh, that's our maintained information there. And this is the alternative hypothesis against which we want to uh, uh, test. So we could use the Donald Inman's new the DIN framework to just write down a test directly of uh, the null hypothesis here that pulls the information under the null hypothesis, this additional information, and views alongside that the maintained information on an equal basis. So that, as I said in the introductory remarks, our purpose is to uh, try and uh, essentially design a statistic that incorporates this uh, maintained information and uh, just allows us to concentrate on the uh, uh, additional information that's uh, under test. Okay, so a couple of examples, hopefully, to kind of fix ideas. So uh, what we might want to do, for example, is to test uh, conditional homoscedasticity in this uh, world. And so the way that we would do this is our UA would be just the UN squared uh, minus, say, some constant parameter sigma squared. So Beta A consists of both beta M and sigma squared here, and our additional moment uh, uh, vector is that it's just G, that is just of dimension one. Similarly, we could think of uh, an instrument validity example. So let's say our additional instrument is uh, is X. So in this case, U A and U uh, M, the uh, additional and uh, maintained moment vectors are identical, likewise the parameters. And uh, essentially SA is just going to consist of uh, possibly X. It could consist of uh, SM, the maintained instruments, and X. So uh, both of these might be of, uh, of, of interest. Okay, so... Um, this uh, uh, slide starts to introduce the, this equivalence between uh, an infinite number of unconditional moments and uh, the conditional uh, moment that we wish to uh, test. So let's think of a vector QK, which is going to be a function of our uh, vector of instruments S. We're going to have our generic uh, uh, notation. And that's going to be of dimension uh, capital K. So this is supposed to be a K vector of approximating functions in the sense that uh, for any 
function a s, function of s, we can approximate that as close as we like by increasing k by just a linear uh, function of this vector q k. And there's uh, various admissible approximating functions like splines, power series, Fourier series that uh, we can uh, examine. So our unconditional moment vector then is just going to correlate the u uh, with the qk in the way that uh, I've, I've written here. So our unconditional moment condition is, at the least under the null hypothesis, is that the expectation of g is uh, equal to zero. So g is our generic uh, notation for the correlation of this uh, error vector u with this vector of approximating functions qk. And uh, as I said, we're going to need to allow the number of uh, elements of qk to go up to uh, infinity. So we can write down our maintained hypothesis by just co correlating um with uh, qm. So we're going to have to choose a vector qm that corresponds to the, uh, uh, the maintained hypothesis. And that's going to be a function of our maintained instruments, uh, uh, sm. Okay, so we're going to do, have to do something likewise then for the, uh, the null hypothesis. So again, for our additional moments, uh, the UAs, we're going to have to set up a QA uh, uh, vector of functions. And we're going to, for, purpose, for our purposes, assume that this is just a, an integer multiple, capital M, times that K that we've used for uh, the, uh, the maintained uh, uh, moments on the previous slide. And this will be a function of now our additional, uh, 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 or the instruments that are relevant to our additional uh, moments uh, SA. So again, our G, if you like, corresponding to the additional moments is uh, constructed in exactly the same way by correlating UA with QA MK. And then these are the null hypothesis approximating functions written down the bottom uh, here. Okay, so I said again in my uh, introductory remarks that we were going to have to control the growth of now QK uh, in the same way as we control the growth of uh, now QAMK. In fact, what we require is that the dimension of QA here, <coughs> MK, the dimension of the uh, approximating functions for the additional moments, needs to be of order capital K. This is because when we do the asymptotics, the uh, statistics look like the difference of two statistics. Namely, one that uh, uh, employs both QA here and QM from the previous slide. And the second statistic, which just consists of the, the QM uh, quantity. Now, if we want both components to uh, play a role, and the local power analysis says that we ought to uh, allow the maintained uh, part of that statistic to uh, play, the, play an equivalent role to the uh, additional component, then we need to choose the, uh, uh, the, the rates at which QA and QM grow to be, the, uh, to be the same. Otherwise, the one which grows the fastest is going to dominate the, uh, the property of the life cycle property of the statistic. In particular, if we allow the dimension of QM to grow too slowly, then the uh, maintained information essentially is going to be lost. So five minutes. Okay, thank you. <coughs> now, there's a lot of notation here, but uh, uh, essentially the statistics that we're going to look at are going to be GMM type, type statistics. So that's going to be uh, a GMM type statistic uh, uh, constructed to... Uh, uh, test the null hypothesis, and then subtract off from that the uh, GMM statistic uh, relevant for testing the maintained hypothesis in exactly the same way as we would set up a classical log likelihood ratio statistic. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to let this miss out that. So this is essentially the, uh, uh, the GMM statistic for testing the maintained hypothesis. So GM here is, remember, correlating UM with uh, uh, QM. Similarly, uh, G here essentially correlates Q, uh, UA with, uh, with uh, QA, but also includes UM correlated with uh, Q, uh, QM. 
So g just g hat is then just the sample average. So this is just a standard formulation of an unconditional uh, moment uh, uh, GMM statistic. Okay, so the important thing, as I say, I've been emphasizing throughout is how do we uh, 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 incorporate and maintain the hypothesis. Well, we know what to do with the unconditional uh, framework. We look down at the top, bottom of the slide here. We subtract off the uh, 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 GMM statistic contained to the, the maintained hypothesis. So if we we're in the unconditional framework, we would just look at the uh, uh, difference TG minus TGM. That would have a chi-squared distribution with uh, uh, appropriate degrees of freedom, and that would, uh, that would be our asymptotics. But as I said, what we're involved with here is not only the sample size increasing, but also the dimension of QA and Q, QM increasing. So we need to uh, location uh, correct and scale correct as is done here. So P here is essentially the, the number of additional uh, parameters in the additional moments. Um, that, uh, so, that's, so that would be the kind of uh, parameter correction or dimension of the parameter correction necessary if we were in the uh, unconditional frame. Okay, so we can do with uh, GL type statistics as uh, 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 Alistair and Eric kindly described in their uh, uh, presentation. So I, I will just uh, go on to just show you the, uh, the standard kind of likelihood ratio. So this could be the empirical likelihood version of a GL statistic. Again, we look at the difference between thank you, uh, the, the two statistics, one for the overall null hypothesis, one for the maintained hypothesis, and then just scale correct, uh, location and scale correct. So, so we can show that this statistic is uh, last sample a standard normal and uh, show that various other GL type statistics are asymptotically equivalent to uh, such a statistic, to our GMM type statistics. Now it turns out when we look at the simulations that these, uh, uh, that basing our uh, tests on the uh, uh, standard normal distribution using these standard type tests, they don't work too well. That is, their empirical size doesn't correspond very well to the nominal size. So we can also go back to the, uh, you know, this is quite valid to do this, to go back to the, uh, the uh, unconditional uh, uh, critical regions that we might have uh, we would have used in such circumstances, and these critical regions tend to uh, uh, to be uh, uh, to work work better. So there's a asymptotically equivalence, but asymptotic equivalence between both uh, uh, approaches. Then there's unrestricted tests that, as you can see, neglect the uh, uh, the maintained uh, information. So we look at those as well. So. Uh, Given the time that remains, just let me just talk about the, uh, the local alternatives. So we need to kind of formulate a local set of local alternatives that depend both on the uh, dimension of our Q vectors and the, uh, the sample size. <coughs> if we go through an analysis based on that, then we end up again with a, uh, uh, a non-central standard normal uh, distribution with a non-central parameter that I call mu r here. Now, it turns out that, uh, uh, and I won't say, I'll just describe what happens here. If we look at the uh, unrestricted test, those are, or any other test that doesn't uh, incorporate the maintained information, then this non-centrality parameter here is at least as great as the non-centrality parameter that we get out of the non-central normal distributions that correspond to the local, alternative dis local alternatives that uh, we've got here. So, Essentially, what this uh, the, this uh, kind of section shows is the uh, uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, the deficiency of tests that do not incorporate the uh, 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 maintained information fully. So let me just go to the uh, the last slide. So uh, if we can find Control End, where is that uh, on this? Uh, oh, we get there. So let so we in the simulations we've looked at a whole host of uh, statistics. And uh, what I've done here is just summarize uh, 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 some results. So as I said, the non-standardized test that's based on the unconditional uh, uh, critical regions seem to do better in terms of empirical size corresponding to nominal size. We look at 1%, uh, 5%, and 10%. The restricted tests dominate the unrestricted tests in terms of power. Uh, 
power declines with increases of K and M. In particular, our local alternative analysis indicates that you should choose that multiple M in designing the QA uh, vector of, in, of functions of, uh, of instruments as, uh, as, uh, as small as possible. So that's validated by these simulations. And then we look at, uh, this is a regression context, so we look at uh, a certain type of uh, instrument validity. Uh, statistic X is the regressor in our IV regression. These are the types of statistics that seem to do quite well. A GMM type test. Uh, continuous updating test seems to do quite well. And, ver and two types of adjusted uh, uh, of score type tests based on empirical likelihood and uh, exponential tilting. Their, their size looks both pretty good. And it's small and moderate sample sizes. Uh, in fact, a whole host of statistics seem to do uh, 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 pretty similarly. And then we also look at another type of, uh, of, uh, of instrument validity where we both not only have uh, uh, our uh, SA consisting of our maintained instruments but also this regressor X and then we kind of get some similar types of uh, information on the uh, empirical size of tests. Um, these are uh, again GMM, CUE type likelihood ratio and these score type tests for empirical likelihood and exponential tilting seem to be best. Uh, that's the small sample size. The, uh, uh, some, of these, some of these other statistics don't do very well. A more moderate sample size, that's when n equals 500. These EEL and uh, ET types of likelihood ratio statistics seem to do uh, uh, best in terms of power for this uh, setup. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Maybe due to time restriction, maybe we may leave the questions at the end of the session and then you may have an opportunity to talk to the speaker in a reception. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Professor Peter Robinson, London School of Economics, and uh, we talk about panel non parametric regressions. Well, let me start by uh, um, thanking Anna Lola for uh, organizing this conference. Uh, it's incredibly um, heterogeneous um, conference. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and it must be a real uh, challenge. So, of course, to uh, congratulate uh, the Internetrics uh, Institute, in particular, uh, Amos here, and uh, looking for this five, 55 year anniversary. This seems like it's longer, really. I think it's become very uh, well established. And uh, so, you know, I want to thank um, Amos and all the people who've helped him you know, for this. Uh, oh, sorry, I don't know if it's working. Oh, sorry, okay, okay, all right. I haven't said anything in four minutes. Anyway, thanks uh, to Amos. And I think I, I've only been to a couple of these conferences, but there have been a, a number of them and uh, incredibly uh, um, diverse topics. And I think, well, I think the con today's conference really, I think, illustrates uh, this very uh, well. Um, also, it's very nice to stay at a hotel with as much character as the Churchill Hotel. So I think. Uh, Amos shows great uh, you know, good taste in hotels as well as being very <laughs> successful. But I must apologize uh, because I'm a, a last minute addition to the program. Although I'm replacing uh, a cancellation, obviously if I wasn't uh, speaking now, you, you know, we could all be off at the, uh, the reception. So I, I do apologize <laughs> for that. It's been a very long day. Also, uh, because there you know, was a last minute uh, addition, I only got the invitation to give a talk on uh, Wednesday. I uh, wasn't able to prepare some slides what I'd like to have talked about. It was, you know, it was too short notice. So the talk I'm giving is not, not ideally what I'd like to give. But it does uh, illustrate, um, uh, I suppose, it's, uh, <coughs> um, you know, another way in which uh, it, certain information can be used to improve estimation, uh, in particular efficient, statistical efficiency of estimation, and it captures on a couple of the themes we've come across today with the uh, cross-sectional uh, uh, data and uh, panel data and uh, uh, mean squared error as a measure of uncertainty. 
n-dimensional vector form in you know, respect to the cross-section, and uh, just indexing that over time. So these are n by 1 vectors, essentially, vector of 1, so the vector of lambdas, and so on. Um, now, we can only identify the lambdas and m up to a location shift, of course. And um, so we pose an arbitrary restriction here, and uh, that, uh, if you cross-sectionally average, then you eliminate the lambdas. And you're really back to a simple non-parametric regression problem, and we know how to deal with that. And one possible estimate is the Navarro watson kernel estimate, uh, uh, where we're regressing the cross-sectional averages, uh, essentially, on Z. And um, so if we look at the, consider the, the cross-sectional covariances, and actually we're allowed to conditional, these to, to um, uh, you know, the, the, the conditional Petrovsky elasticity and dependence uh, given uh, Z, although that's not, um, if we um, didn't allow for that, there'd still be, uh, uh, it wouldn't make a lot of difference, there'd still be uh, similar work to do, it just uh, makes it a bit uh, more complicated. Uh, if you look at the mean squared error, I won't go through all the uh, details here, but this is a pretty familiar kind of um, situation here. We've got the what's a bias term, which doesn't is really uh, affected by the uh, particular panel situation here. But um, f is the density function of the regressor. This is the bandwidth used. Q is the dimension of the disease. T, of course, is the time dimension. This term is the, is the more interesting part. This is the, essentially the main contribution of the variance. And the uh, omega was the cross-sectional covariance matrix or conditional, uh, if you like. One of the, uh, so essentially, because of these are just vectors of ones, this is the sum of all the elements, uh, all the n-squared elements divided by n-squared. And uh, you can also, of course, get a minimum mean squared error a, a you know, optimal bandwidth in that, in that sense. Uh, it's, it's all quite familiar. Anyway, you get a central limit theorem too, where essentially this variance term enters then as the, in the asymptotic variance. So this allows for quite general, the RC means regularity conditions. Are, they're quite general uh, in the sense that you can have mixing dependence over time and um, uh, you know, quite general cross-sectional dependence. Uh, of course, this is, um, you notice we've got a norming with respect to n over here, so uh, we do allow n to increase. Uh, the the right hand side doesn't depend on n, however. And uh, then um, the, this, um, this variance contribution reflects the strength of the error cross-sectional dependence. And uh, you know, for, if you think about increasing n, this kind of Situation where it's of order n minus one is like a weak dependence in time series, but we don't require that necessarily. So the rate could vary actually. Um, improving the estimation essentially is GLS, and um, to do this we uh, adopt a different um, identify, uh, identification condition. That was arbitrary, but we could uh, impose a different one uh, for general n by one vector uh, uh, w. Um, we can rewrite the model like this, allowing for you know, an arbitrary shift. Uh, in other words, you, know, you could add anything you want to the lambda and then subtract it from the end, you get the same outcome. And then we, we, we transform using the, uh, the W, and um, we, you know, there's a vertical shift then in the, the regression uh, function, but it doesn't really matter too much because it's more the shape that one's interested in it rather than the uh, so the variance of the kernel estimate then is really proportional to this quantity. And we can um, minimize um, the minimum variance estimate then is obtained by a particular W. This is really just GLS essentially. And this is the GLS estimate really, which is a, involves a different kind of combination of the elements of the uh, of the vector of uh, uh, cross-sectional vector at time t of the, of the uh, dependent variable. Um, and uh, so we get a um, <coughs> kind of analogous results to before for this improved estimate with, with a different kind of uh, uh, formula for the variance.
difference. To, and um, this is, um, you know, we can compare it with the previous one. Essentially, the, um, you know, the simple estimate, this was, this was the, uh, the variance. And uh, of course, we have this inequality, um, except uh, when uh, omega has an eigenvector consisting of the, the vector of ones. And actually, that can occasionally arise. In, for example, in a simple spatial auto, spatial um, autoregressive models with a particular kind of weight matrix, and also under some uh, very specialized factor model. But typically, the, the inequality of models, you do get an improvement, in other words, from the, the GLS uh, estimate. Um, so, well, we'd like a feasible estimate because omega is going to be unknown whether or not you've got um, conditional heteroscopy elasticity in even the simple case where you've got, uh, uh, you know, where the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the, the use could be independent of disease completely. Uh, this is still a, a, a challenge. Um, now, if you, it, it could be an easy problem, actually, at this point, if you wanted to impose a parametric structure on the uh, the cross-sectional covariance matrix. And if you had the information on uh, spatial distances, for example, or you had a, wanted to impose a factor structure, because for the SAR model, that's a very uh, parsimonious model, uh, parametric model, and really would then be very easy, um, quite standard to, um, uh, you know, to then uh, show that you could replace the parametric estimate by the, uh, um, sorry, the, the, the estimate of, of omega by the, uh, by the true one in the asymptotic theory. Uh, especially as actually it would be, it would, it would converge faster than the uh, non-parametric um, focus you know, target, which is uh, M. Uh, so that'd be a very easy problem, but uh, we don't want to do that necessarily. And of course, we could also have a factor structure which would not be parametric entirely because it would uh, there would be some dimensionality reduction, but still, um, you know, essentially, um, I thought it was interesting to perhaps allow the you know a completely non-parametric um, setting and not impose any conditions at all on the uh, on the, the covariance matrix. And it's possible to do this. You, know, you need some residuals um, using the simple estimate and the various. Um, uh, cross-sectional and temporal averages, and um, uh, well, we, it's an estimate of the cross-sectional covariance matrix, and uh, just to get very quickly to the punchline here, really, um, the uh, feasible optimal estimate of the of the um, uh, non-parametric regression function is this, essentially using plugging these things in, and. It's possible to show that the regularity conditions are, of course, unfortunately, they require n to, you know, we want n to increase. It has to increase much slower than t. This is inevitable because we're trying to estimate uh, essentially an n by n covariance rate. So it's got to be estimated at a reasonable, reasonable rate, not a fast rate because of the non parametric focus. But uh, the, um, essentially, we can show that this difference between the, uh, the um, infeasible and the feasible uh, improved estimate is a smaller order than the uh, root mean squared error. And uh, so therefore, we do have uh, an improvement. And in the, I have not time to look at Monte Carlo, but uh, you know, the, essentially, you know, the examples we've looked at, uh, you, know, you do get an improvement with the infeasible estimate. But predictably, it doesn't usually do as well as the Sorry, but you do get improved with a with the feasible estimate, but it doesn't do as well as the infeasible one in general. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Some questions? And if not, I think we can thank to all our speakers and go to our reception.